Scotland. How do you mean no more commissioning? Well, no one in Scotland can commission an idea. You know, if I went to BBC Scotland and I said, oh, I've got this great idea for a sitcom, I've got this brilliant idea for a drama, you know, no, no, there isn't one person in Scotland that can okay it unless it goes through London. Good morning and welcome to another edition of Full Scottish. Um, what's happening today? Hello and welcome to The Fool Scottish here on Broadcasting Scotland. Scotland is going to be an independent country. That need, that desire for independence is ever stronger than perhaps it was in 2014. So there's an obligation that we've got to give leadership to that campaign. That's what Nicola Sturgeon as our First Minister has been doing. My feeling about Boris Johnson is he can't be trusted uh, on, on anything. Is now and forever will be known as the Rape Clause. I'm old enough to remember going into Europe in '73, and I remember how much of a, a razor's edge that was a balance. Though. And I think we made it by 53%, if I remember correctly, for going in. And ever since that time, England particularly has been pretty much schizophrenic down the middle about whether it felt. British or whether it felt European, and that schism, that crack has remained throughout English society ever since. Scotland means business. Scotland's voice won't be stilled, it won't be silenced, it has to be heard. Look at the work that's been done by Broadcasting Scotland in giving community activists, yes activists, Scottish activists a platform other than the traditional media outlets. Well, it, it's lovely to be out on such a sunny evening in Edinburgh, but it's a shame that we have to be out tonight protesting against the two-child cap and the rape clause well more than a year since Alison Thulis, my colleague at Westminster, first spotted it in the small print of a Tory budget. I'm very glad to see such a huge demonstration today and so many people still coming along one year after the rape clause came into force um, to show their opposition to this vile and despicable policy. The UK government have never been able to justify this policy and we saw that this week with Esther McVeigh's pathetic attempts to say that the rape clause was somehow double support for women and that gives them some kind of chance to talk about the most um, appalling and disturbing experience of their life. As you can see behind me, we're at the very beginning of the All Under One Banner Rally. You can obviously hear the, drum, the pipers behind me as events are about to kick off. It's time to aim high, look resolutely outwards and never, ever accept second best. Above all, it's time to believe that we can. We can build that better country we know is possible. And friends, we will. Committee stage of terrorist offenders restriction of early release bill amendments can be tabled up to and until one o'clock today. We now come to question of Secretary of State for Scotland, Alex Cunningham. Number one, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government is committed to tackling poverty. 
The Government is committed to tackling poverty so that we can make a lasting difference to long-term outcomes. This Government has lifted 400,000 people out of absolute poverty since 2010, and income inequality has fallen. It is important that Scotland's two governments work together to address this critical issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In Scotland, it's estimated that one in four children, that's 230,000 of them, are living in poverty, and this is substantially higher than in many other European countries. And like poor children everywhere, these children are likely to achieve less in school than more likely to suffer chronic illness and poor mental health. And yet, the Institute for Fiscal Studies predicts that child poverty could rise to around 37 per cent by 2021. Does the Minister not agree that it is Tory government welfare policies, such as the two child benefit cap, zero hour? contracts and the dreaded universal credit that are contributing to the increasing rate of child poverty in Scotland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. He won't be surprised to know that I disagree with him. Since 2010, there are over 3.8 million more people in work and 730,000 fewer children growing up in workless households. Over three quarters of this employment growth, Mr. Speaker, has been in full time work, which can be proven to substantially reduce the risk of poverty. But I know how passionate the Honourable Gentleman is on this issue. I'd be very happy to meet with him to hear his concerns. Tony Lloyd. Mr Speaker, the, the, the Minister has got to reflect on his answer. Yes, of course he's right about the growth of employment, but the majority of children in Scotland, 230,000 of them, are living in families with parents in work. That's a, a disgrace. Now, what is the Minister, what is this Government going to do about it? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We don't want to see one individual, family, or child in poverty. And the honourable gentleman talks about in-work poverty, and we are taking action as a government to tackle in-work poverty. Real wages have risen for over a year, 22 months in a row. Total wages rose by 3.2%. The national living wage rises to 8.72 in April, and we want to go further, Mr. Speaker. And that's why the Chancellor has announced that the national living wage will rise to £10.50 by 2024. And we also have a focus through our network of job centres around in-work progression. Murray Black. We already know that children living in poverty experience poor physical and mental health, employment difficulties, stigma and chronic low self-esteem. And this creates problems not just for the individual but for government further down the line. So I wonder if the, if the Minister would uh, surprise us all and actually welcome the Scottish Government's introduction of the Scottish Child Payment yeah, later yeah, yeah. this year. Yeah, yeah. Well, Minister. I, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. and I am looking very closely at this measure and its impact. And I would gently suggest to the Honourable Lady that this is, in fact, evidence of devolution working. I would say, Mr. Speaker, there is no monopoly on good ideas. And where the evidence suggests that a measure works, then we should, of course, explore it. And I will. And I would just stress, Mr. Speaker, I am committed to working with the Scottish Government to improve the life chances of people across Scotland, as I am across our whole United Kingdom. Very like. I'd like to thank the Minister for that answer, and even more, if this is evidence of devolution working, eh, I would like to remind them that this is why we want devolved all of the welfare powers yeah. to the Scottish yeah. Parliament. Yeah. Um, but once rolled out, this eh, new payment will help roughly around 30,000 children out of poverty. So, if this is a good measure for the Scottish Government, can you tell us why his Government is not following suit? Here, here, here. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think I've already already answered that question. That I will look at it uh, very closely. But what I would say, Mr. Speaker, is if the Scottish Government is serious about addressing this issue of child poverty more broadly, then it should be making full use of the powers to reduce housing costs, improve earnings, and enhance social security. Now, Mr. Speaker, as I said, the Scottish Government has powers to tackle poverty through the devolution of skills, education, health, and employment programmes. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, the UK Government does welcome the Scottish Government's child poverty strategy, and we look forward, and I indeed look forward. To working very closely with my counterpart in the Scottish Government to ensure that we cover these devolved uh, areas. David Mundell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The child uh, poverty payment is welcome, but does the Minister not share my concerns that the vast uh, number of powers uh, in relation to welfare matters, which the SNP and Scottish Government argued for, which were transferred in the 2016 Act, have not been taken forward. And in fact, some of them are now delayed until 2024. And isn't welfare just another victim of the Scottish Government's obsession with the Constitution and not focusing on the day job? 
Minister. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. I thank my right honourable friend uh, and recognise his huge expertise in this area. All I would say, Mr. Speaker, is this, the Scottish Government and indeed uh, the, the, the Government um, do want to address these issues, and I am absolutely committed to working with my counterparts in the Scottish Government to tackle child poverty and, in fact, poverty in all its forms. Cut, Smith. Number yeah, two, Mr. Yeah, yeah. Speaker. With permission, Mr. Speaker, I will answer questions two and eight together. My department has regular engagement with the colleagues in Bays on a range of issues relevant to Scotland, including the renewable energy sector. Cat Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Scotland has a huge geographical advantage when it comes to wave and tidal energy, with reports suggesting that up to 40,000 jobs could be created in the sector if it had government support. Can I ask what work has been done in government to explore wave and tidal technology? Thank you. Yes, you're absolutely right, and we do have an advantage on that, as we do in, on wind and, and obviously wind speeds and, the, and, and our mountains, and also, and also uh, with hydro schemes. We have advantage on all those things, and the government is supporting technology at the universities. There's technology being invest, investigated into for wave and tidal, and we're completely behind that. Should it prove to work? Christian Matheson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My honourable friend from Lancaster is absolutely right about the geographical advantage. What work is the government undertaking <coughs> in terms of infrastructure, for example, interconnectors and storage, so that that clean green energy that Scotland is able to generate can be shared with the rest of the United Kingdom? So, you stay. Um, the, as you know, that's, the interconnectors are a devolved matter, but it, we absolutely are looking at up, as best we can to upgrading the, the schemes. Across, so that we can transfer our power across the United Kingdom and the advantage that we have in Scotland and renewables and our growing renewable industry can benefit the whole of the UK. Tony Lloyd. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The, the, the Secretary of State will recall that when the EDF were given the licence to, uh, to develop the wind farm at Niat Naguea, ten miles off the Fife coast, the, the commitment was that there would be created 1,000 jobs making the jackets for those wind turbines. Can the Secretary of State tell the House how many jobs have been created? No, because I don't know the answer. But what I can tell you, <laughs> and it's a perfectly, and it's a perfectly, that's a perfectly straight answer to a straight question. But what I can tell you is the sector deal aims aims to create 27,000 jobs by 2030. That's what the sector deal states. Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll tell the Secretary of State how many jobs. A thousand in Indonesia. Now, can the Secretary of State tell the House? Um, if the GMB union is right in saying that, that the transportation of these wind turbines from Indonesia to the Fife Coast will be the equivalent to 35 million cars on the road, how does that fit our commitment to greening this economy? But what confidence can people have in Scotland that jobs in a wind farm 10 miles off the Fife Coast will be created for people in Scotland and not people in Indonesia? Well, well that, that is the market economy, and we need to be better, we need to be better at pricing and better at producing our turbines. And that, and that's the straight answer. I mean, these and many other issues we'll discuss when we bring COP26 to Glasgow later this year and to discuss the climate emergency. But I don't dispute with him, bringing turbines from Indonesia is not the answer. We need to find a better way of efficiently delivering them in the UK. Cole McCartney. Thank you, Speaker. Yeah, 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 Thank yeah, you. Yeah. We are 13 minutes in, Mr Speaker, and I'm tempted to ask the Secretary of State, and it is to do with wind, because it was a windy day on Saturday, um, about the result when we won the Calcutta Cup. <laughs> oh, come on. You've got to be happy with that. But I... <laughs> the question was about wind, and, we, um, and we, we've had some balance of payments deficits in the fact that lots of wind farms in Scotland get paid not to produce any electricity. Is that likely to take place later on this year? Secretary um, Obviously, I disagree with him on the Calcutta Cup point. <laughs> it goes without saying it was, a, it was a wet and windy day and a miserable day at Murrayfield for me. Um, as regards, I mean, the, what we're trying to do is improve the way wind works for Scotland. Contracts for difference allow certainty to uh, the investors, it allows certainty over the longevity, it protects the consumers. And, Mr. Speaker, I'd further add that in October 2019, when we did the last round of contracts for difference, six of the 12 awarded went to projects in Scotland. Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can my right honourable friend update the House on what untapped capacity there is for using renewables in Scotland and how many jobs would be created as a result of uh, enhancing that cap capability? 
Well, Where's there is that? a there is a normal enormous capability, not just with more wind, offshore wind schemes, but also with more uh, schemes around hydro. And we do intend to create, as I said earlier, 27,000 more jobs through using that untapped capacity. Angus Brendan McNeil. Yeah. Much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, offshore wind and uh, contract for difference round three was cost free to both the government and the consumer as the strike price was below the typical wholesale price. But 240 megawatts of that remain stranded because Ofgem demands that the island of Lewis has at least three, uh, 349 megawatts to build an interconnector cable. There were another 180 megawatts that could have been consented to, would have been cost free, but they weren't consented to due to government caps. Can we have some joint up thinking in the government between the interconnector and the contracts for difference to ensure we're not bellowing out uh, fossil fuels and we could instead have 600 megawatts of wind being produced? Yeah. The Honourable Member for Nihilin and Yarm makes a very fair point, and, and one of the things that I think the UK should look with future infrastructure and shared prosperity is about building that interconnector. James Sunderland. Number three, please, Mr Speaker. <coughs> Secretary of State. Busy day. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Speaker, with permission, it appears I've woken a few people up, Mr Speaker. With permission, I will answer questions 3 and 12 together. Scottish exports to the rest of the UK increased in 2018 by 1.2 billion to 51.2 billion. As a result, the rest of the UK continues to be Scotland's largest market for exports, accounting for three times the value of exports to the European Union. Given the Minister's assessment, will he confirm that Scotland's trade with the rest of the UK is worth more than three times that with the EU? And this is only one of the benefits on offer of being part of the United Kingdom, not least for British firms. Secretary Mr Speaker, the Scottish Government's own figures show that Scotland's most important trading partner is the rest of the UK, and that is worth as my honourable friend said, more than three times the trade with the other 27 co EU countries combined. In other words, the Scottish Government's figures show that over 60% of Scotland's exports go to England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And indeed, I would argue, Mr Speaker, this is just one of the many benefits that Scotland has from being part of the United Kingdom. Vic Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will my right honourable friend, given the excellent figures he has just given, share my concern that the separatist agenda no. peddled by the SNP is a direct threat to Scottish jobs and it would inevitably end up if they got their dreams come true in a hard border. I would absolutely agree with my honourable friend, Mr Speaker, that Nicola Sturgeon's separatist agenda is a real threat, is a real threat to Scotland's jobs businesses and the economy. And that's why I'm against the First Minister's demand for another independence referendum, because we want 2020 to be a year of growth, stability and opportunity for Scotland and for the whole of the United Kingdom, whereas the SNP want 2020 to be a year of more political wrangling and wasteful debate. Dean Murray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Labour MSP Monica Lennon has introduced the Period Products Bill to the Scottish Parliament to give free provision to women in Scotland. It is being opposed by the SNP Government because of tampon raids from the English into Scotland to steal the products. If that is the case, what kind of border does the Secretary of State be required in the event of an independent Scotland with a separate currency, a different regulatory environment and different provisions on trade? Well, the honourable gentleman makes an exceptionally good point, and that is a border we need to avoid. And it makes no sense in having any sort of border between between Gretna and Berwick. And as to the SNP opposing that, and that opportunity to reduce VAT rates and other things that would would help people, I, uh, people on the poorest incomes, I simply don't understand what they're thinking. Mr. Carmichael. The Secretary of State truly values the trade between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. Why is he prepared to countenance a situation where we would lose frictionless trade between Scotland and Northern Ireland? Ah. Ah. As, as the Prime Minister said, there will be unfettered access between, between Scotland and Northern Ireland and indeed the rest of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Stuart Malcolm yeah, yeah. Question four. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Scottish Secretary and I regularly meet with the Secretary of State for Defence to discuss a range of issues of importance to Scotland, including maritime security. 
Do it, Malcolm MacDonald. Minister's own constituency, he will understand that there is an obvious breach point in the high north of Scotland for adversaries to come into, which has happened before. Can he assure the House that he will be engaging, the Scotland Office will be engaging fully with the upcoming integrated defence review? And will he agree to meet with me to discuss some of the issues that are important to him and to the rest of Scotland? I would be delighted to meet the Honourable Gentleman and we can continue this discussion about the great investment by the UK Government into Scotland, into Murray. Last week we welcomed the first P8 aircraft, the Pride of Murray, touchdown at Kinloss, the first of nine, huge investment by the UK Government and Boeing. And I have to put on record as well the outstanding work that local firm Robertsons have done in building the Poseidon facility. David Dewey. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can the Minister update the House on what discussions he's had with the Ministry of Defence in terms of fisheries protection, not just, not just an enforcement of fisheries, but uh, on monitoring as well? Well, obviously, that is a devolved issue, and I know DEFRA and other departments are in continued dialogue with the Scottish Government and others on this issue. But my honourable friend's uh, long standing commitment to the fishing industry has again uh, been raised in this House, and I know he continues to stand up for his constituents in Bamfenbuchan on that subject and many others. Ronald Jowell, what dinner? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Number five. Yeah. <coughs> Thank the UK Government ministers and officials have regular discussions with the Scottish Government on matters of importance, including the Scottish fiscal framework. Mr. Speaker. This historic arrangement delivers one of the most powerful and accountable devolved parliaments in the world, and it is up to the Scottish Government to use those powers wisely to further increase the economic prosperity of Scotland. Ronald um, uh, does my right honourable friend agree that uh, the Scottish Government's decision to make Scotland the highest tax part of the United Kingdom is not only regrettable, but yet another broken promise by the SNP? <laughs> Mr Speaker, it goes without saying that I agree with my honourable friend. It is disappointing that Scottish taxpayers earning more than £27,000 will pay more tax in Scotland than they do in the rest of the UK. And I'd further say, Mr Speaker, on earnings between £43,500 and £50,000, taxpayers in Scotland will pay 41% in income tax, compared to just 20% in the rest of the UK. And that means that a police, a police officer with 10 years' experience, mid-30s, bringing up a family, on earnings between 43,500 and 50,000, will pay 21% more tax in Scotland than the rest of the UK. Murray Bellows. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Secretary of State acknowledge that for the third consecutive year, more than half of Scottish income taxpayers will pay less tax yeah. than they live in the UK? Can he explain to these UK taxpayers why his government is ripping them off? Yeah. I would say to the Honourable Lady that that figure of less tax is correct, more than four, about 56%. Of Scots will pay less tax, and, bef and before, the, before the Scottish nationalists get over jubilant, I would point out that that's the grand amount of 40 pence per week. Rich Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now we've left the European Union, we are free to determine our own future and we want 2020 to be a year of economic and social growth for Scotland and the rest of the UK. Rich Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Secretary of State has already stated in the Chamber today that the UK internal market represents the majority of Scotland's total export market, which means it is vital that the Secretary of State makes provision to develop and strengthen it. So, can he confirm today that the Government will prioritise the UK internal market over any future US UK trade deal the Prime Minister wants with Donald Trump? Mr. I, I absolutely can because the UK internal market is so important for this country and Scotland. And not only the figures the Secretary of State has already mentioned today, but Scotland does 1.5 times more in trade to the rest of the UK than it does in the EU and the rest of the world combined. Vicky Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The financial services sector is a major employer in my Chelmsford constituency and a major employer in Scotland. Will my, my, will my honourable friend ensure that all parts of the Scottish economy 
are preserved and cared for in our future trade negotiations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mister. Uh, absolutely. The future of Scotland's economy and the UK economy will be buoyant as we have left the European Union. We want to ensure all our sectors continue to thrive, and I can assure the Honourable Lady that we in the Scotland office will do everything possible to facilitate those discussions. Peter Sharp. But the response you have heard from the front bench today might explain why he has lost half of his Scottish colleagues, why the SNP is at 51 per cent in the polls, and why the majority of the Scottish people now want independence. But in the real world, the Chancellor of the Duchy of, of Lancaster says border checks are now inevitable for almost everybody because of their disastrous Brexit. How will this help Scottish business? Minister. Well, the Honourable Gentleman speaks about the real world. Let's look at the real world in Scotland where the SNP are in power. We've got bridges that people can't get across. We've got hospitals that they can't open. We've got an education system failing. This is a record that the Scottish Government and the SNP will have to go to the people to in a little over 15 months' time. And I look forward to that election when the result of that will impact on what the Scottish Government and the SNP have done to Scotland since 20, 2007. Mr Speaker. Minister. Thank you very much. I'm busy today, Mr Speaker. Uh, at the end of uh, 2020, we automatically take control of our waters. This opens up a sea of opportunity for our fishing industry in Scotland and across the United Kingdom. As I've said before, this Government will work tirelessly uh, with our fishermen and coastal communities across Scotland. Speaker, can my honourable friend confirm that by becoming an independent uh, coastal state once again, we will be able to deliver a better deal for fishermen across yeah, the United yeah, Kingdom yeah, and yeah. ultimately we will control who fishes in our waters. Yeah. I, I can confirm that we will no longer be bound by the EU's outdated and unfair method for sharing fishing opportunities. We will set our own fishing quotas based on science and decide who can fish in our waters. And I have to say I share my honourable friend's optimism for the future of our industry, and that is an optimism I have heard time and time again from fishermen and fishing communities the length and breadth of Scotland. Stephen Bonner. Can the Secretary of State reveal of the UK Government's stated intention of agreeing a mechanism of cooperation within the EU on fishing will include an extended agreement of access to waters as part of an EU trade deal? Clearly, Mr Speaker, we are in discussions about this going forward, but I have to say we have a positive vision for our fishing industry in Scotland now we have left the European Union. And how does that reflect on the vision of the SNP for fishing in Scotland? to take us back into the European Union, to be shackled once again by the common fisheries policy, something many Scots and many fishermen voted comprehensively to leave, and the SNP wants to put us right back into it. John Stevenson. Uh, number nine, Mr Speaker. Secretary of State. I have regular discussions with all of my Cabinet colleagues on important issues uh, around Scotland's economy, including the forthcoming budget in March. The Government will deliver a budget for Scotland's businesses and Scotland's people, it will set out ambitious plans to unleash Britain's potential and level up across the nations and regions of the UK. John Stevenson. Uh, given the close economic relationship between the south of Scotland and the north of England, particularly within the Borderlands region, will the Minister give his support and make representation to the Chancellor in support of a free port at the Carlisle and Lake District Airport? Sir Day. So I welcome the recent free ports announcement, and I have no doubt that free ports will unleash the potential of our proud historic ports, boosting and regenerating communities across the UK. And, my, and myself and other ministers on the front bench, and the Chancellor is here, have heard his early representations on behalf of his airport and, and his area. And not only is the honourable gentleman, my honourable friend, a great champion for the borderlands. He's also a great champion for Carlisle and the Lake District Airport. Hello, Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Page 64 of the 2015 Statement of Funding Policy document confirms that HS2 should have 100 per cent market consequences for Scotland. Will he uh, ask for these market consequences delivered in this budget, which is roughly £750 million of which we've spent to date in high speed two? So I'd say to the honourable gentleman that the, but there already has been a barnet consequential around HS2 spending, 
and the next round in the spending round we will see what money is allocated to the Department for Transport and that money will have an, a Barnet consequential. Wendy Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over the weekend, Kings Barnes Distillery in my constituency won the best Lowland Scotch 12 years and under at the World Whisky Awards. However, the impact of US tariffs continues to impede growth of the Scotch whisky industry in my constituency and across Scotland. Will the forthcoming budget include provisions to help our distilleries compete internationally despite these stifling tariffs? Well, I know the Honourable Lady has a lot of experience in this, having formerly worked for Diageo, and I would say to her that these tariffs, these, these ta- 25% tariffs on malt whisky, are a consequence of the Boeing Airbus dispute between the EU and the USA. And in the next carousel, we hope to get, by having useful negotiations on US, a on US trade deal, we want to get those tariffs removed. We now come to Prime Minister's questions. Dr. Julian Lewis. Will my right honourable friend kindly list his engagements for today? Mr. And Mr. Speaker, the whole House will want to join me in sending our deepest sympathies to all those affected by the weekend's flooding. My right honourable friend, the Local Government Secretary, has announced the activation of the Government's emergency bellwind scheme to provide financial support for qualifying affected areas in the north of England and we continue to work closely with our partners to help those affected and above all to keep people safe. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall further such meetings later today. Did you leave the list? Close question one, Mr Speaker, on the Defence and Security Review. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we will continue to transform the UK economy through the budget in March and the comprehensive spending review later this year. The timing of that integrated review will be announced shortly. To Julian Lewis. I'm grateful for that reply, Mr Speaker. May I (coughs) urge the Prime Minister to recall what happened to the last combined security and defence review, which was done within a straitjacket of fiscal neutrality? It meant that every extra pound spent on cyber or security was a pound to be cut from the conventional armed forces. Therefore, will he try to ensure that the next attempt at a combined security and defence review will not face such a straitjacket and will be concluded before rather than after the comprehensive spending review? Hey, Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I understand very well the point my right honourable friend makes, and I can uh, assure him that the integrated review will be the deepest review of Britain's security, defence and foreign policy since the Cold War. And I can also assure him that by uh, transforming this country's economy and by raising productivity, we will ensure that both defence and security are amply provided for. Leader of the Opposition, Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. I join with the Prime Minister in uh, expressing sympathy and support to those that are victims of flooding and thank you to the Environment Agency and all the emergency services that are doing their best to help people. Mr Speaker, our thoughts are also with those who suffer from the coronavirus and also with the Chinese community in this country who are, I'm sorry to say, facing increasingly alarming levels of racism within our country. And as this virus spreads, I also want to thank public health workers who are helping those affected and raising awareness about the danger of this virus. Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister think that someone who came to this country at the age of five and was in and was the victim of county lines grooming and compelled to carry drugs, released five years ago and never reoffended, deserves to be deported? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I think the whole country uh, would agree that while I cannot comment on individual cases, it is entirely right that foreign national offenders should be deported from this country in accordance with the law. Jeremy Corbyn. The government has learned absolutely nothing from the Windrush scandal. This cruel and callous government is trying to mislead the British people into thinking it's solely deporting foreign nationals who are guilty of murder, rape and other very serious offences. This is clearly not the case. Take the example of a young black boy who came to the UK aged five 
and is now being deported after serving time for a drugs offence. If there was a case of a young white boy with blonde hair who later dabbled in Class A drugs and conspired with a friend to beat up a journalist, would he deport that boy or is it, or Mr Speaker, is it one rule for young black boys from the Caribbean and another for white boys from the United States? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I think quite frankly that the right honourable gentleman demeans himself and by the way besmirches, besmirches the reputation besmirches the reputation of the Windrush generation who came to this country to work in our public services, to teach our children in this country, to make lives better for the people of this country. He has no right to conflate them with those foreign national offenders that we are deporting today. Jeremy Corbyn. The Windrush generation have been disgracefully treated by a government that deliberately created a hostile environment. And whilst, whilst the government was fighting to deport people who legally came to this country as children, the Foreign Secretary refused to tell the family of Harry Dunn the reason why the US is blocking the extradition of a woman who is alleged to have killed him. I now ask the Prime Minister straight this question. Is Anna Sekoulis being shielded from justice because she's a former CIA officer? Mr Speaker, I think the whole House will know that uh, not only the Foreign Secretary but I and at every level of government we have tirelessly sought the extradition of Anne Sekoulas for justice in this country and we will continue to do so. It is widely reported that Anna Sekoulis is in fact a CIA operative. Now we know that the Foreign Secretary misled the Dunn family who are being denied justice by the US government. Will the Prime Minister commit to his removal from office tomorrow in his reshuffle? Prime Minister! A stupid man. Uh, Mr Speaker, the right honourable gentleman knows very well that the Foreign Office have uh, been told that Anne Sekoulas was notified to the UK Government as a spouse with no official role. And we will continue without fear or favour to seek justice for Harry Dunn and for his family. And we will continue to seek uh, the extradition of Anne Sekoulas from the United States. Jeremy Corbyn. This morning... Charlotte Charles, Harry's mum, said, we thought we'd bridged the gap with the government, but they've not been honest with us. Mr Speaker, this is only the latest case of our country's one-sided extradition treaty with the USA. This lopsided treaty means the US can request extradition in circumstances that Britain cannot. While the US continues to deny justice to Harry Dunn, will the Prime Minister commit today to seek an equal and balanced extradition relationship with the United States? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, to be frank, I think the Honourable Gentleman has a point in his uh, characterisation of our extradition arrangements with the United States, and I do think uh, that there there are elements of that uh, relationship that are unbalanced, and I, cert- uh, imbalanced, I certainly think that it is worth looking at. But he, it is totally different uh, from the case of Harry Dunn and Anne Sekoulas, and we continue to seek the extradition of Anne Sekoulas to face justice in this country. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, it's everything to do with the relationship with the USA that Anna Sekoulas has not been extradited back to Britain because the US refuses to do it because of this lopsided treaty. I'm glad the Prime Minister at least acknowledges that. This deep disparity with the US is about to be laid bare when the courts decide whether the WikiLeaks publisher Julian Assange will be extradited to the US on charges of espionage for exposing war crimes, the murder of civilians and large-scale corruption. Will the Prime Minister agree with the parliamentary report that's going to the Council of Europe that this extradition should be opposed and the rights of journalists and whistleblowers upheld for the good of all of us? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I'm not going to comment on any individual case, but it is obvious that the rights of journalists and whistleblowers should be upheld, and this government will clearly continue to do that. Paul Holt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
My wife is a volunteer with local Samaritans, and my right honourable friend will know what good work they do in helping keep people safe in Sedgefield and the rest of the UK online. Would my right honourable friend agree that today's announcement that we are putting Ofcom at the helm of a strong regulatory regime shows we are delivering on our commitment to make the UK the safest place in the world to be online? Well, Mr Speaker, I I thank uh, my my honourable friend for raising that point. And as we deliver gigabit broadband to every part of this country, uh, including uh, to the people of Sedgefield, uh, Mr Speaker, we will also ensure that the UK is the safest place to be online. In Blackfoot. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In northern Syria, displaced women and their children are literally freezing to death. There are reports of babies dying due to the extreme conditions, and 45,000 people remain stranded with nowhere to go. Mr Speaker, the Syrian war is considered to have caused the biggest wave of displacement since the Second World War. Can the Prime Minister tell the House what responsibility his government has taken for this humanitarian crisis? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I think that the whole House will know what, what I think I've said several times in this House, that the UK leads the world in supporting uh, the crisis and supporting uh, humanitarian relief efforts in Syria. £3.2 billion this country has committed to that cause. Yeah. In Blackford. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the question was about the children that are literally freezing to death. That wasn't an answer from the Prime Minister. And, of course, in 2017... As Foreign Secretary, this Prime Minister enacted a policy of accepting the Syrian dictator Assad's rule over the country. Assad has delivered death and destruction on his people, a man who has gassed his own civilians. The humanitarian situation has reached crisis point and there are now concerns of all-out war. Is the message the Prime Minister wants to send out from this House today that this UK government is washing its hands of the Syrian people and that he is content for Assad's regime to continue enacting these atrocities. I I really think that the right honourable gentleman needs to consult uh, his memory better because uh, he will find that this country and this government has persistently called uh, for the end of the Assad regime and indeed has has led the world world in denouncing the cruelty of the Assad regime towards uh, towards his own people. That has been continuously the policy of the British government. Dean Russell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Will the Prime Minister um, join me in supporting a new initiative that I'm launching in my constituency of Watford uh, to train mental health first aiders across schools, workplaces and the community across the whole constituency to tackle loneliness and challenge mental health stigma? And perhaps, if I may, may I ask if he could find time in his diary to join me at the launch? Thank you. (laughs) Prime Minister. Uh, well, I, I thank my honourable friend for what he's doing to champion mental health services in, 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 in Watford, and we are massively increasing support for good mental health in schools. And if I can, uh, I will do my best uh, to come to the launch of his, of his event. Vicky Foxcroft. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. After three years of extensive evidence gathering and research, on the 26th of March, the Youth Violence Commission will publish its final recommendations. The overwhelming verdict from victims, youth workers, community leaders and other stakeholders is that short-term solutions do not work. Violence reduction units are a welcome first step, but they need long-term funding and leadership from the top. Will the Prime Minister commit to this funding and will he attend our report launch and to hear direct from victims and experts about how we get to grips with this crisis? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I do think that she's right that you've got to do both and that's why we're also putting £200 million into the Youth Endowment Fund uh, as well as uh, supporting violence reduction units. But we're also, Mr Speaker, putting 20,000 police on the streets of this country yeah. and... Giving them the powers which that gentleman opposes to take knives off the streets with stop and search. Yeah. 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 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister has made transport connectivity a main priority for this Government. Would he agree with me that connecting my constituent in Southport with Preston through the Bursco curve link would not only give my constituents greater access to the rail network, but would help us to unleash our economic potential? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, well, I, look, I, I congratulate my honourable friend on what he's done and to campaign for the restoration of the Bursco curves. And uh, I, it sounds to me like a great idea. Uh, um, I will make sure, if he, what he needs to do is put forward a, uh, a costed business plan, and I'm sure my right hon. Friend, the Transport Secretary, will be looking at it very carefully. Sean Hodge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the Prime Minister agree with me and 10,800 of my constituents who signed petitions that the building of a gasification plant in Washington would be terrible for the people of Sunderland due to the public health concerns, air quality and would indeed be a blot on the landscape of Sunderland? That now was a frequent visitor to Sunderland. I'm sure he shares my concerns on this matter and will he therefore support me and my constituents who oppose the building of this plant? Prime Minister. Um, uh, well, Mr Speaker, I will certainly look into the matter that, uh, that she raises uh, and we will make sure, of course, that uh, if there is a problem with the gasification plant that, that she described, uh, that Sunderland continues to prosper and uh, to lead the UK economy. It may be. Clyde has the potential to become one of the most strategically important ports in the UK for the export of renewable technology as well as wind turbines. Will my right honourable friend uh, consider visiting Blythe, where I'm sure he'll get a warm northern welcome, yeah. and see for himself the strength of Blythe to become free port? <laughs> Thank you. I think he had the answer ready. I'm sorry, uh, the, the answer was in the question, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, he, he makes, he makes an excellent point about uh, the potential of Blythe, though I must, I must uh, r remind him that the allocation of free ports will uh, be decided in an entirely fair and, uh, and transparent way. Storage. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Every day, an estimated 280 shop workers will be victims of violence at work. At my local co-op, a staff member was hit with a glass bottle. Now, the co-op's a good employer and want that to stop, so they and other local retailers engaged with the government's call for evidence around violence towards shop staff. Seven and a half months later, they are awaiting a response. Prime Minister, will you commit today to publish your response to the call to evidence, and will you meet with me and a group of, of shop workers who have experienced violence at work to hear about what happened to them? Yeah. Prime Minister. I, I certainly will make that undertaking to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm glad he raised it. Uh, we should not tolerate crimes of violence against shop workers or indeed anybody else. And therefore, I find it paradoxical that the leader of his party uh, is soft on the deportation of serious violent offenders. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This year we mark the 75th anniversaries of VE Day and VJ Day. As we honour those who have served our country, can my right honourable friend outline how his new Office of Veterans Affairs is giving our veterans and, our fa and their families the support they deserve? Prime yeah. Minister. Yeah. Uh, I thank my honourable friend and I can tell him uh, that our new Office of Veterans Affairs is helping veterans to transition to new jobs, uh, to secure a home. A discount rail card will be rolled out by Armistice Day and veterans will get guaranteed interviews for civil service jobs so we have more veterans bringing their talents to government. Yeah. Thank you, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. His junior Scotland Office Minister told the National Farmers Union last week that substandard food will be allowed into the UK under a US uh -huh. trade deal, yeah. but it will have to be labelled as such. Now, the Prime Minister has denied that in the past. So who's telling the truth, and which of them doesn't know what's coming? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I can assure the Honourable Lady that the UK has and will continue to have the highest standards in the world, in the world uh, for our food. Grace Green. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In Greater Manchester, frontline police officers are increasingly having to resort to using a pen and paper because of the failing IOPS computer system. This is putting the police at risk and also undermining their ability to protect residents and vulnerable children. Will my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister, intervene to solve this problem? Mm. Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, my hon. Friend is, I'm afraid, entirely right. And uh, we know there are concerns about this system. That's why I've asked my our, our right hon. Friend, the Police and Crime Minister, uh, to ask Her Majesty's Chief 
Inspector Constabulary for an independent review of the operation of the system and will make sure uh, that my honourable friend is kept informed. Gareth yeah. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Northwick Park Hospital, which serves my constituents, has not met its four hour AE target since August 2014. It has been starved of capital investment, is short of ITU beds, and is expected to have close to a £100 million deficit by the end of the financial year, one of the highest in the NHS. When can the Prime Minister expect Northwick Park to receive a little government love and attention? The Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, as, he, as uh, the Honourable Gentleman raises an important point, as you will know, uh, the highest number of people ever attended A&E in this country uh, last month, two million people. The demand is, is exceptional. I pay, tribute, I pay tribute to the work of, of NHS staff, and we are responding in this Government, as he knows, uh, with a record investment in the NHS, £34 billion, and we are recruiting the nurses, 50,000 more of them, that will help to deal with that crisis. Imran Nabad Khan. In the last week, Storm Kira has wreaked havoc along the whole of West Yorkshire's Calder Valley, affecting the constituencies of members across the House. Would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, seek to find time to visit my constituency, where Horbury Bridge, the place at which onward Christian soldiers are spent, has been acutely affected, and see for himself the terrible damage done to people's homes, lives, and businesses? Will he tread where the saints of our communities and emergency services have trod? And continue to toil undivided towards recovery. Prime Minister. Yes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I obviously uh, pay tribute to the emergency services for what they are doing in my honourable friend's constituency and indeed in all the flood affected areas. As he knows, we have activated the Bellwin scheme to protect uh, homeowners. We're putting £4 billion into flood defences, and I certainly will do what I can to take up his offer uh, to visit his constituency and see the scene for myself. Kirsten Oswald. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The new daily allowance for the unelected and unaccountable peers being stuffed into the House of Lords by the Prime Minister is set to rise to £323. The monthly allowance for a single person over 25 on universal credit is £317.82. Is that the levelling up the Prime Minister keeps talking about? Prime Minister! Uh, well, actually, I, I, I hate agreeing with these people. Actually, I, 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 I do find, I do find, I do find, I do find, I do find that it is it, it, it is odd that the House of Lords has chosen to do that, but it is a decision uh, for them. Only let them. Instrumental in getting the ban on trade in ivory in this country, would he be as equally uh, decisive in getting rid of the? Trophy hunt, trophies coming into this country, imported particularly of endangered animals. Prime Minister. Uh, yes, I thank my honourable friend for what she's doing to campaign against uh, illegal wildlife trading and trophy hunting, and we mean to end uh, the import of trophies uh, hunted uh, elsewhere into this country. Richard Thompson. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2018, uh, Lubov Chernyukin. The wife of Vladimir Putin's uh, former Deputy Finance Minister paid £20,000 for lunch with the then Scottish Conservative leader Ruth Davidson, who we believe is soon to be ennobled. Could the Prime Minister remind the House once more why his government is yet to publish the Intelligence and Security Committee's report into alleged Russian interference in UK politics? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, well, as, as, I think he, as I think he knows very well, the a report will be published as soon as the Intelligence and Security Committee is reconvened. Uh, and I think, as I've told the House several times before, those of a conspiratorial cast of mind will be disappointed by its findings. Adam Frey. Mr Speaker, can I commend the Prime Minister for the belief he has in Britain and the massive boost to inve investment in infrastructure yeah. around the country? But with um, the landing visa £25 per passenger at Heathrow Airport, and with a third runway, those fees will rise, Heathrow Airport will become the least competitive airport yeah, yeah. on the entire planet. So, can I, um, given the delays and the escalating costs, can I ask the Prime Minister, does he agree that it may, it may well be time 
to review progress and to perhaps deploy those bulldozers elsewhere in the country. Prime Minister. Uh, well, well, Mr Speaker, the House of Commons uh, voted uh, to give an outline planning consent effectively uh, to the third runway. Uh, I know a measure that is supported by uh, people across this chamber, not by me, as it happens. Uh, I, wait, I wait to see the outcome of the various legal processes that are currently underway to see whether the promoters of the third runway can satisfy their legal obligations under air quality and indeed noise pollution. Bridget Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since 2015, the number of GPs working in Sunderland has fallen by 16%, much higher than the national average. After almost a decade of Tory control, our GP services are inadequate and getting worse. Yeah. Who does the Prime Minister hold responsible for that? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, we're, of course, responsible as the, uh, and, and we take full responsibility, but overall numbers are up of GPs, and we are now recruiting six thousand more and we're able to do that because we're running a sound economy and investing investing massively in our NHS across the whole country. Robert Court. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you Mr Speaker. Uh, as coronavirus hits the headlines every day, would the Prime Minister join me in thanking and paying tribute to the supreme professionalism of those at Public Health England and in my area at RAF Bryce Norton for bringing home people who have been affected? Their work is often unremarked, but is the admiration of all of us. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I think my honourable friend puts it absolutely beautifully, and uh, I salute everybody who is involved in uh, bringing home uh, victims and potential victims of coronavirus the difficulties and the risks that they face, and indeed our NHS, who I think have so far done an outstanding job in preparing and informing the country. Thanks. Sir Edward David. When Kevin Simpson's partner of over 12 years died and his two children lost their mother, the family received no bereavement support payments at all. Because the parents were unmarried, the law denied that support to the two grieving children. Last Friday, the High Court ruled that this breached the children's human rights. So when will the government obey the rule of law and legislate to respond both to that ruling and the similar ruling by the Supreme Court in the McLaughlin case in 2018? Will there be no further delay so we can start supporting the thousands of similar children across our country who lose their mother and father every year. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, the Right Honourable Gentleman has raised this uh, with me uh, before and I have undertaken to meet him on that matter. We will certainly look at the, the case he mentions and, and see what exactly our, our response should be. But he is right to draw attention to this injustice and we will do what we can to remedy it. Jacob Young. On Thursday last week, two people were stabbed in Redcar in broad daylight. Another person was injured in a horrific knife crime on Saturday evening outside a busy nightclub. Figures released by the Ministry of Justice in January show that Cleveland Force area has the highest number of knife and offensive weapon offences per head of population in all of England and Wales. What additional support can my right honourable friend give to Cleveland Police to tackle this problem and when will we start to see more police on the streets of Teesside? Right Minister. Oh, Mr Speaker, as, as, uh, I thank my, my honourable friend for, for raising it, because knife crime is intolerable and its recent rise must be combated. That's why we brought in knife prevention orders which give the police the powers uh, where they uh, suspect a knife crime is about to be committed to take uh, the interventions that they need. That's why we're putting 20,000 more police on our streets uh, with the encouragement and the political support that they need to carry out stop and search. The Oxford Cambridge so-called expressway was a 20th century road building solution to a 21st century challenge and at the election Labour rightly pledged to scrap it. I wonder if the Prime Minister's caught up with us and could he announce today whether that has finally been put to rest and scrapped? Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I must ask the Honourable Gentleman to wait to contain his impatience until uh, the budget and he will learn more about the National Infrastructure Plan. Martin Vickers. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I support the uh, Prime Minister's decision yesterday uh, to go ahead with HS2, though I have to tell him that it, there is little enthusiasm among my uh, constituents for it because it does nothing to imp improve connectivity to uh, Cleethorpes. To build up enthusiasm amongst the people of Cleethorpes, could I urge the Prime Minister to instruct LNER to reintroduce the direct train service from Cleethorpes through to King's Cross, to make the Gainsborough Brig to Cleethorpes service, which is at present one day a week, into a seven-day service, to manufacture the rails at Scunthorpe, and of course, and of course to reopen Suggets Lane level crossing. Mr. Speaker, the voice of Cleethorpes has been heard. And we, 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 I, I, he, he's, made a, he's made a vivid and compelling case. Uh, and uh, I, I, as I stood up to answer, the Chancellor whispered in my ear uh, that we would certainly be looking at it in the infrastructure review. Seema <laughs> Bolhotra. Speaker, the prosperous future of our young people all too often depends on their family well being and school readiness. That requires investment in early years. Does the Prime Minister regret the Conservative cuts to around 1,000 Sure Start centres, including in my constituency? And will he commit to greater funding and support for early years development, particularly in our most deprived communities? Prime Minister. Well, she raises an important point. That's why we're putting record sums now into early years funding, uh, £14 billion going into education. And uh, it is under this government that you will see the biggest improvements. It's under this government. It's under this government that we have a robust, strong, dynamic economy, the third fastest growing in the G7. And we are able to make those investments in early years precisely because of our sensible management of the economy. The Anderson. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that the PFI deal signed by the last Labour government to build hospitals like Kings Mill in Ashfield at a cost of £1 million a week is nothing short of a national scandal? Yeah. Yeah. And can he please ensure that this never happens again? Yeah. Prime Minister! Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, it is one of the many scandals of the last uh, Labour government uh, that the PFI deals, from memory, the PFI deals uh, that they did, the PFI deals that they did, saddled the taxpayer with £80 billion worth of debt in exchange for £12 billion worth of hospital assets. That's how Labour run government. That's how Labour run the economy. Let's not let it happen again. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Will the Prime Minister bring to an end the sickening outrage? of a witch hunt against former police officers who served Ulster through the heat of the Troubles and are now going to face the most odious prosecutions for non-criminal misconduct. Okay. That wouldn't be tolerated in this part of the United Kingdom. It shouldn't be tolerated in my part of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, we will make sure that we give uh, encourage, support for all those uh, who face unnecessary prosecution and I'm well aware of the issue that he raises. Point of order, Barbara Keery. Mr Speaker, today the Equality and Human Rights Commission has started legal action against the Department of Health and Social Care for their failure to move 2,200 autistic people and people with learning disabilities out of inappropriate inpatient units. Separately, we have the Government's response to the Learning Disabilities Mortality Review a review that has shockingly found that people with learning disabilities are dying on average 25 years earlier than the rest of the population. It seems that improving care for people with learning disabilities and autistic people is not a priority for this government, as we've had no statement in the House on these important issues from the government so far. Mr Speaker, have you had an indication that a minister plans to make a statement on these important issues? Can I thank the Honourable Lady for giving me notice on this important matter, but I would say it's not a point of order for the Chair. It is for government departments to make statements, and I'm sure that people will have listened to what the Honourable Members have to say, but it is certainly not for me, but for others to come forward with a statement. Right. If not, we now go to 
Business of the day is the tourist offenders restriction of the early release bill, business of the House motion. I should inform the House that I have selected a manuscript amendment to the motion in the name of Alistair Carmichael to insert after the paragraph bracket 6, brackets B and additional sub paragraph as follows. The question on any amendment, new clause or new schedule selected by Chair Speaker for separate decision. I now call the Minister to move. Move formally. The question is that the terrorist restriction. Oh, do you want to really Shut it. Put the question. Yep. The question is that the terrorist restriction early bill, the business house motion is ordered on the paper. The debate now may take place. Alistair Carmichael. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I beg to move the manuscript amendment standing in my name. Uh, the Minister will be aware that the business motion that he has just moved without any explanation whatsoever replicates the provision of Standing Order 83D faithfully in every respect bar one. That is, it omits the uh, contents of paragraph 80, 83D uh, subparagraph 2C. That provides that at the conclusion of proceedings, the question may be put on any amendment, new clause or new schedule selected by Chair for separate decision. The effect of the omission of that provision from the business motion before the House is that if debate continues until the conclusion of the time allowed in this business motion, then there will be no division on any amendments moved in the course of that committee stage. And I think, at the very least, the House is entitled to hear an explanation from the Treasury bench as to why we should see your power restricted in this way, Mr Speaker. Now, it may be that, ultimately, this is all academic. It may be that we will conclude proceedings before the expiry of time, or it may be that there will be simply no amendment that anybody is wanting to put at the conclusion of proceedings. But there remains, however, a very important point of principle at stake here, and the point is that surely we should hear the debate first before we make decisions of that sort. And if it is the will of the House at the conclusion of the time allowed, then you, Mr Speaker, should have the power from the Chair so to put any question. I think it is entirely regrettable that the Minister in moving this did not offer any explanation to the House as to why the Government, through us, seek to fetter your power in this way. I also think it is worth bearing in mind that what the Government is doing today in bringing a bill forward going through all stages in one day is, while it is not by any means unusual, still something that is quite extraordinary. The Government relies on cooperation from all parts of the House in order to do that. They have had that cooperation, so why now do they seek to restrict the power that you have to call divisions at the end of the committee stage? The original question was that the tourist offenders brackets restriction of early release brackets bill business of the House motion as on the order paper since when an amendment has been moved as follows after paragraph, paragraph bracket six brackets B insert brackets B A the question on the amendment the new clause or new schedule selected by the Chairman of Speaker for a separate decision. The question is that the amendment be made. Robert Butler. Well, well, I'm very grateful, Mr Speaker. I've listened very carefully to the Right Honourable Gentleman, who I know speaks with years of experience, shall we say, as uh, somebody who had direct responsibility, at least in part, for this during his time in coalition. Um, I would say simply this to him. Um, whilst I'm not accusing uh, his approach of being an unreasonable one, we do view this as meeting the test of reasonableness, bearing in mind that these are exceptional circumstances. This is some, not something that we would depart from lightly. We want to make sure that the time that we have for actual debate is maximised. I think that's important, bearing in mind we know, you know the, 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 the 
the, 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 the issue with regard to divisions. Uh, and for those reasons, we would judge it appropriate on this occasion to depart. Uh, I know he's not going to uh, probably accept the explanation I give to him, but at least the, the very fact he's made this uh, manuscript amendment, although I do note that uh, from other parts of the House we've not met the same objection, the fact that he's put that amendment down has uh, made the government explain its position. These are exceptional circumstances, and for those reasons, I would beg him respectfully to withdraw the amendment that stands in his name. I've got to put the question now. Okay. The question is that the amendment be made. As many of that opinion say aye. Aye! Country, no. No! The measure, clear the lobby. The question is the amendment be made. As, as many of that opinion say aye. Aye. The country no. No. Tell us for the ayes, Jamie Stone and Christine Jardine. For the noes, Nigel Hudderston and James Morris.
Order! Order. The eyes to the right, 51. The nose to the left, 316. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The eyes to the right, 51. The nose to the left, 316. The nose have it, the nose have it. Unlock! Thank you. The question is the tourist offenders, brackets restriction of early release, close brackets bill, business the house motion, as on the order paper, as many of that opinion say aye. 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 The country no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Tourist offenders, restriction of early release bill, second reading. No. 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 Order, order. Minister to move, second reading. Mr. Robert yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the terrorist offenders' restriction of early release bill be now read a second time. Twice in the last few months, we have seen appalling and senseless attacks on members of the public by terrorist offenders. At Fishmongers Hall on the 30th of November of last year, two bright, promising young lives were cut heartbreakingly short. The perpetrator, Usman Khan, was released automatically halfway through a 16-year sentence for preparing terrorist acts. That tragedy was made so much more poignant by the fact that these victims were dedicated to the rehabilitation of offenders, helping people to get their lives back on track. The attack in Streatham on the 2nd of February of this year came as a stark reminder of the risks when these sort of offenders are let out automatically before they've served their full sentence in prison. Would my right honourable friend give way on that point? I'll give way. I'm so grateful for my right honourable friend for giving way. There are, of course, a number of people who may question why we are rushing through this business in one day today. So may I ask my right honourable friend if the business were not to be completed today and the bill enabled as an act, would it result in terrorists being released early in the immediate future? Minister. The simple answer, Mr Speaker, is yes. And I'm grateful to my honourable friend for his intervention. I was telling the House about the events of Streatham. <clears throat> Sudesh Aman had been released just one week before the attack, halfway through a three-year and four-month sentence for offences related to distributing or promoting material intended to stir up religious hatred. The automatic nature of his release meant that there was no parole oversight and no decision as to whether or not he posed a risk to the public. No one could prevent his release. It is purely thanks to the swift intervention of our incredible police officers that he did not go on to commit even more harm before he was stopped with necessary force. The reality is that we face an unprecedented threat from terrorist offenders who are willing, Mr Speaker, to commit random violence without any fear of the consequences. And I'll give way to my right honourable friend. Mr Speaker, can I welcome the work that he has done in this area over the last few weeks and also presenting this bill here today. But would he also concede uh, that this form of jihadi extremism and the threat that it has posed is now here, has been around us for almost 20 years since the horrible attacks in 9-11 and, of course, Bali in 2002? I absolutely welcome the extra funding for our counter-terrorism police, rehabilitation and the probation services. This is all very good news. But ultimately, we have to ask ourselves why these people indoctrinated in the first place. Would he agree with me that we need to do more to remove that harmful online content, which is used so much to attract people to this dark place that they go to? But, well, my right honourable friend speaks with particular personal experience of the Bali atrocity, and he is right to talk about the long-term nature of the threat. But it is a threat that changes, and a threat that evolves. And this government will be as fleet of foot as possible in responding 
to those changes. And he'll be glad to note that when it comes to online content, we are working at pace in order to remove inappropriate and hateful content and to deal with it. I'm, the Home Secretary is in her place by my side today to emphasise in the most eloquent possible way the joint approach that both she and I and our respective departments, together with the security services and the police, take with regard to what is the first duty of government, protecting the public. It is a grave responsibility from which we will not shirk, and we say that enough is enough, Mr (coughs) Speaker, and I think I'm being... Yes, and I'll take the right honourable gentleman's intervention. I'm, I'm very glad at the tone he's taking. Were this measure to be challenged in our courts and the government to lose, that would be merely declaratory. But if it made its way to the court in Strasbourg and the government were to lose there, the ministerial code would require him to abide by treaty law. Would he then entertain the prospect of a derogation from the Convention? Well, I'm grateful to my right honourable friend, but I believe that the declaration that I made on the front of this bill uh, speaks for itself. This is a bill that is... Well, I haven't finished developing the point yet. This is a bill, and I will, of course, give way to my eager uh, honourable friend, the chair of the Justice Select Committee, but this is a bill uh, on which I have made the following statement, that in my view the provisions of the bill are compatible with Convention rights. I take his point. I'm not going to anticipate uh, litigation in uh, uh, domestic courts or indeed in Strasbourg, but I will say this now, and I will repeat it for the benefit of the record, Mr Speaker, that it is my uh, firm view that this bill does not uh, engage the provisions of Article 7 of the European Convention because it relates to the way in which the sentence is administered, not a change in the nature of the penalty itself. And I'm grateful to him for allowing me to say that now. And I'll give way to my honourable and eager friend. (laughs) I'm I'm grateful to to my right honourable friend for giving me because it is an important point. Uh, Will he confirm that in coming to that conclusion and making that certification, he has taken the advice of senior Treasury counsel? And will he also uh, confirm uh, that it's very clear from subsequent decisions uh, that uh, uh, the the case law uh, has made it quite clear that the administration of a sentence uh, is not part of the penalty? And finally, that even were there to be, which I do not believe to be the case, successful litigation, this could, could result only in a declaration of incompatibility it cannot, in fact, strike down primary legislation. Yeah. Well, my uh, honourable friend is absolutely right to remind the House that when it comes to primary legislation, uh, there is no power to strike down uh, that type of legislation. I won't, uh, uh, I'm afraid, indulge him in a direct answer as to the nature of advice that may or may not have been tendered. He knows the reasons for that. But I can uh, reassure him that all the proper mechanisms have been uh, employed and engaged uh, in the preparation of this bill, uh, and that on the basis of all the information received, I was able, with high certainty to make the declaration on the front is peace. And I, I will give way to the, my, my right honourable friend, the former security minister, in due To my right honourable friend for giving way, who, uh, he will remember that we work together on these matters in government. He's right to speak about the metamorphosis of terrorism. And will he now confirm, and indeed this, this, these provisions underpin this, that we must never let the persistent and perverse advocacy of the rights of murderous individuals compromise either the work of our security services or public faith in the rule of law. Yes, sound point. Well, my right honourable friend speaks with considerable experience as we work together on the investigatory powers bill, a bill that I think rightly struck the balance between the need to protect the public and to make sure that the rule of law was respected. It perhaps gives me a chance to warm to a theme that I make no apology. I will give way in a moment. I haven't finished. I'm I'm warming. I'm warming to a theme. (laughs) I will will give way. Let me warm. Let me warm. The theme is this. Uh, In uh, our our fight against terrorism, in our determination to protect the public against those who spread hate, division 
and uh, uh, um, death and injury, irrespective of what might motivate them, because we know we have a cohort of different types of terrorists, it, it means that we are defending something of value, Mr Speaker. We're defending a democratic, free society. We're, de we're defending the rule of law. We're defending the values of this place and, indeed, the values of all the people that we have the honour and privilege of representing. That's something that's worth defending, and by using due process, we mark ourselves out as distinct from, as better than, as different from those who seek to divide us. And I'll give way to my right honourable friend, the member for Stone. Uh, uh, is my um, right honourable friend in receipt of advice from the Attorney General on this question and the law officers? And I say this simply for this reason that whatever the arguments he may address with regard to compatibility and his statement on the face of the bill, the reality is that this could easily end up in the courts if they can possibly ma manufacture an argument. And I just simply want to be quite clear that his advice relates to the action in the courts and not just the inc incompatibility. I am grateful to my old friend. I can assure him that uh, all the usual processes were followed. I am not going to go into the weeds of uh, what the law officers might have said. We know they have a particular function when it comes to uh, the uh, necessary clearances for the introduction of a bill. I can assure him that those processes have been followed and that the issues that he rightly uh, outlines and indeed uh, presages uh, through his uh, 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 amendment are ones that are very much uh, in the uppermost of our considerations. I, I was explaining to the House, Mr. Sp and I'll give way to the Honourable <coughs> Lady. Uh, I thank um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the Lord Mr. Chancellor yes, for, uh, for giving way. Um, and indeed, the recent events have um, shown the need for a review of this legislation, which um, I certainly do support and which has, I think, appropriate safeguards and implementation measures that will be debated today. He made a point earlier about victims as well, and a member of somebody who had done work experience in my office was a witness on that day who was working uh, at Fishmongers Hall, and so the impact not just on those who were injured or killed, but on those who were there and their families has been tremendous and continues. But if I can just ask him this point, the provisions in the bill, I understand, change the release point for offenders who have committed a, a relevant terrorism offence and refers those offenders to the parole board at two-thirds of the points of the sentence. I think we can understand and acknowledge that the resources available to police and probation is also a critical part of this, that change of the legislation won't be enough. Is he also committed to making sure that the resources required through the justice system will be in place to make any change uh, effective on the ground? Well, I'm very grateful to the Honourable Lady, and indeed I pay tribute to uh, uh, everybody who uh, not only was involved with, but who witnessed those awful events at Fishmongers Hall. And she and I served on the Justice Select Committee for some time together. I know she's had a long-term interest in these issues. Um, she's right to ask about resources. Several announcements were made some weeks ago when it was announced that we would be introducing a counter-terrorism bill. Uh, extra resources of £90 million for counter-terrorism activity were uh, additional to the overall package of £900 million of support for counter-terrorism. But when it comes to what we're doing with probation and those interventions that she's referred to, again, we announced extra resources, a doubling in the number of specialist probation officers. I'm still developing the point, uh, doubling the number of specialist probation officers and indeed introducing more expert psychiatric and imam involvement. Uh, she can be rest assured that whatever resources are needed in order to deal with this issue, we will devote them to this particular line of important intensive work. Um, I will give way to the hon my honourable friend from Stafford. Thank you. Um, the convicted Staffordshire-born terrorist Usman Khan was let out of prison early on licence. Less than a year after his release, he killed two young people near London Bridge last November. So does the Minister agree that this illustrates why this bill is so important to protect the public in my constituency and across the UK and ensure that the most dangerous criminals do serve the prison time that they deserve? Well, I, I'm grateful to my honourable friend. She rightly points out the, uh, um, the sad local connection uh, to that uh, appalling case last year. And I know she uh, shares my, and indeed I think the whole House's, commitment to the maximum amount of effort when it comes to protecting the public. Because it's clear, Mr Speaker, that we must put a stop 
to the current arrangements where a dangerous terrorist can be released from prison by automatic process of law before the end of their sentence. And we must do so as quickly as possible. I'll give way to my uh, right honourable friend from Basingstoke. And I warmly welcome this legislation that's being put before the House today. But he's talking about resources. Could he outline for the House any estimates he's made of the number of individuals that might be covered by this legislation um, so that we can understand perhaps uh, the, the impact that this could have had on our police forces if those individuals had been released from prison early? Well, I'm grateful to my right honourable friend. The number of offenders, uh, either terrorist offenders or offenders who uh, committed offences with a terrorist link, is around 50. Uh, it doesn't sound like a large cohort, but in this particular uh, situation of extreme gravity, uh, we cannot afford to allow uh, any uh, further incidents to happen. Now, I've spoken about the need to minimise risk. That does not mean that I can eliminate risk. But this is why this emergency measure is, in my judgment and the judgment of the government, absolutely necessary if we are to meet the concerns that she and other honourable and right honourable members have. I'd like to. Can I just make some progress, and then I will give way further. Of course, I'll make. Oh, I uh, forgive me. My right honourable friend. I am very grateful to my right honourable friend for giving way. He has just raised this issue of risk. He is absolutely right to be addressing, and the government is right to be addressing, this question of the automatic early release of terrorist offenders. But terrorist offenders will still be released at some point. And that is why the issue of rehabilitation, the work that is done both in prison and when they are out of prison, is so important. There has been much, many efforts at this over the years. But as recent incidents have seen, that has not always been with success. Does my right honourable friend agree that actually we will never deal with this issue of terrorism until we deal with the ideology that drives it? And will he reassure me that the government is make, taking extra efforts to find new paths to ensure that we can turn people away from the extremism and the terrorism that takes other people's lives? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my right honourable friend speaks with... Uh, unparalleled experience of these issues, both as Home Secretary and Prime Minister. And I can assure her, uh, and I will develop these issues later in my speech, that uh, there is a constant, uh, uh, if you like, a self-questioning uh, amongst those responsible for uh, these particular programmes to make sure that they are properly calibrated, that they uh, understand the particular drivers uh, that uh, uh, mean that people are, are compelled to commit these acts, and that the dis different distinctions between the types of offender that we see, and there are, and she'll know from her own case experience, the, the myriad of different motivations are fully understood, and that rather than a blanket approach being taken, a case-by-case -case analysis is indeed very much at the heart of how we approach these matters. Uh, and I'll give way to my honourable friend. Henry Smith. I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend for giving way. Uh, he's absolutely right uh, that uh, this legislation ending the automatic halfway point of release is uh, the correct thing to do. The parole board. Uh, still has, obviously, in this process, a very important role. What uh, does he envisage in terms of reform of the, re the parole board to make it more accountable? Uh, because that, that is a key aspect uh, of ensuring that citizens are kept safe uh, from those who would cause them harm. Well, I'm very grateful to my honourable friend, and he will be reassured that, indeed, a lot of ongoing work continues with regard to the role of the parole board. So very recently, reforms were introduced that allow uh, me to uh, ask the parole board to reconsider important decisions that they make with regard to the early release or the release of offenders. Uh, and secondly, there is a currently uh, a tailored review uh, being undertaken to make sure that its work is as practically effective as possible. And indeed, in the manifesto, we committed to a root and branch review to look at issues about the involvement of victims to make sure that they are aware and uh, are, are as involved as possible uh, from the outset, uh, and that secondly we make sure that the sharing of intelligence and information between either the security services or indeed the police and the parole board is as thorough and comprehensive as possible so that the fullest uh, and most appropriate assessment of risk can be made. And in this particular area, counter-terrorism, nothing can be more important 
Mr Speaker. They're making sure that that intelligence is shared and that those who handle it have the appropriate clearances and the appropriate expertise in order to make that necessary assessment. I can see my honourable friend. I will give way to the honourable lady from Stretford Urmston first and then the Isle of, Isle of Wight. I'm very grateful to the Lord Chancellor and he rightly mentions the need for resources to support this, this new legislation because, as others have noted, albeit potentially later than now, most of these offenders will eventually be released into the community. The issue is not just one of resources, it's also of process and expertise, because the recall provisions that are in place now could potentially have been of use in the cases that we have seen in the recent months. Can he assure me that the government is also looking at training, at process, and that the, um, any reforms that may be needed, for example, to re recall processes, are properly put in place to support this legislation? Well, I'm very grateful to the Honourable Lady with whom we served, uh, I served on the Justice Select Committee. She's right to talk about risk assessment and indeed the recall process. She knows that the recall process actually can be triggered uh, on, on arrest and certainly on charge uh, and that in the normal course of events that is something that is regularly uh, done. Um, when it comes to the multi-agency public protection issue and the, the mapper approach, she'll uh, note I think with, with uh, pleasure the fact that uh, only three weeks ago the Home Secretary and I ordered a review. It's to be conducted by Jonathan Hall, QC, uh, who is the government's independent review of terrorism. He will be looking at the mapper arrangements with regard to this high-risk, high-level uh, 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 sector of the cohort in order to make sure that we are really getting it right and that the, the appropriate expertise is deployed at the right time in order to make the finest judgment with regard to risk. And I'll give way to my old friend. If I understand correctly, there are about 220 terrorists, uh, people serving time for terrorist offences, uh, 50 of which, uh, my right honourable friend said, are going to be affected by this. Is that because those 50 are up for imminent release within the next period of a few months? And does it, in principle, apply to all 220 terrorist related uh, offenders in prison? Well, I'm grateful to my honourable friend. The, 50, uh, the, the cohort of around 50 uh, relate to automatic early release. The, the rest, of course, will be subject to uh, parole board assessment. Uh, the different types of sentences that are available. We're talking about people on standard determinate sentences. There are other types of sentences, the extended determinate sentence. There will be some who are I th may, may be still on the what we call the historic IPP regime. Uh, there's offences of, uh, offences of particular concern, the Spock offences. As you can see, a number of... Uh, uh, forgive me for the alphabet soup, but I'm afraid criminal justice sentencing legislation has not been the easiest uh, matter for uh, us to deal with, either, either as legislators or certainly when I was a practitioner in this area. Can I... Can I, 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 I will give way before I develop the... the I'm very grateful for his being hugely generous. I would like to ask the Lord Chancellor whether he accepts that whilst a lot of these people are clearly um, terrorists and criminals, a significant number of them are clearly insane and the uh, people who were in jail with the latest perpetrator said that that individual was plainly off his head and he did indeed have a history of drug abuse uh, and mind-altering substances clearly played a role. Therefore, why is it that if people are secular uh, and criminally insane, they will be locked up indefinitely but if they can ascribe this to some sort of religious motive, we feel we have to give them a finite sentence and release them when they might run amok at any stage. Well, as ever, my, my uh, right honourable friend makes a very interesting and thought-provoking point. Whilst I won't go into the individual facts of this case, because, it, of course, it is subject to a police investigation, bearing in mind we have an ongoing inquiry, I will say this that, of course, the judgment as to mental health or a mental health, dis uh, mental health disorder within the meaning of the Mental Health Act 1983 is a matter for two uh, Section 12 qualified clinicians, uh, consultant uh, psychiatrists who will have produced uh, clinical evidence that will satisfy a court that the provisions of Section 37 of the Act, or indeed a restriction under Section 41, which then puts the power of release into my hands, uh, uh, that that has to be satisfied on the basis of 
evidence. Uh, I think it's important to make a distinction between that clinical approach and the risk assessment that we have to undertake when it comes to those who profess political motivation. Um, it's thought-provoking in this sense that we do need to think about a mechanism that would be robust, that would be legally sound, but which would allow an objective assessment to be made about the risk posed by individuals, even after their sentence has been completed, because public protection has to very much uh, uh, come into the forefront of our thinking. Um, I, I will uh, now develop... Uh, what we have done operationally, Mr Speaker, since uh, the attack uh, at Streatham. The P Prison and Probation Service has taken immediate action to strengthen our operational grip of terrorist offenders and to protect the public from any further attacks. And the National Probation Service is working very closely with counter-terrorism partners and several offenders on licence have been recalled to prison since the attack where, offenders, where officers identify concerning behaviour. And I think that leans into the point made by the Honourable Lady from Stratford and Urmston. We've also instructed prison governors to report any concerns and to take any action required. Several terrorist prisoners have subsequently been placed in segregation units as a result of concerns raised by prison staff. And the prison service is managing the risk of incidents in prisons that may be inspired by or in response to the attack at Streatham. I'd like to put on record my thanks to Ian Aitchison for his 2016 report on our response to extremism in prisons. In the intervening years, the operating context has changed and our response has strengthened considerably, but we must go further and will take all additional steps necessary, including keeping the full list of recommendations in Mr Aitchison's internal report under careful review. However, Mr Speaker, we need to take further action urgently to ensure that the public are protected. We cannot have the situation, as we saw in the Streatham attack, where an offender, a known risk to the public, is released without any oversight by the Parole Board. The Bill therefore sets out new release arrangements for prisoners serving a sentence for a terrorist offence or an offence with a terrorist connection. There are two main elements to this. First, to standardise the earliest point at which they may be considered for release at two-thirds of the sentence imposed, and secondly, to require that the parole board assess whether they are safe to release between that point and the end of their sentence. This will apply to all terrorist and terrorist-related offences where the maximum penalty is above two years, including those offences for which Sudesh Oman was sentenced. Only a very small number of low-level offences, such as failure to comply with a police cordon, are excluded by this threshold, and prosecution and conviction for those offences are rare. The changes affect those who are serving sentences for a specified offence, whether the sentence was imposed before or after the new section comes into force. Applying this to serving prisoners reflects the unprecedented gravity of the situation we face and the danger that is posed to the public. The Bill won't achieve its intended effect unless it operates with retrospective effect. Therefore, it will necessarily operate on both serving and future prisoners. This doesn't mean that the Bill will change retrospectively the sentence imposed by the Court. Release arrangements are part of the administration of a sentence, and the overall penalty remains unchanged. And as I was outlining earlier, Mr Speaker, domestic and ECHR case law supports our stance that Article 7 is not engaged where the penalty imposed by the court is not altered. The measures in the Bill will also amend the release arrangements for terrorist offenders sentenced in Scotland, which will ensure a consistent approach, where possible, to the release of terrorist prisoners. And I'll give way to my right honourable friend. Can I commend my right honourable friend for the introduction of this legislation and dealing with this issue of early release? But perhaps I can come back to him on a point that I've raised previously about how we do manage risk of people who have offended once they have left prison. The availability of post-release conditions, the enforceability of that, 
and indeed the TPIMS regime and its potential application to give that sense of assurance. Could he comment any further on the next steps, how he looks at how this can be progressed, because clearly this is an issue that will need to be addressed. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm hugely grateful, Mr Speaker, to my right honourable friend, who the House will know was a distinguished security minister and Northern Ireland secretary, having to deal with these issues daily. Um, I, I'll say this to him. Uh, he will know that the counter-terrorism bill that was announced some weeks ago will be, be coming before this House soon. Uh, there will be measures in there relating not only to the minimum term to be served for serious terror offences, but also the way in which licence periods will be applied as part of that sentence. That's clearly, I think, uh, one of the most effective ways to deal with this problem through the criminal conviction, the prosecution and conviction process. However, he makes that wider point. Uh, one that he will know from his time having uh, navigated the TPIM legislation through this House, subsequently strengthened and uh, uh, amended, uh, that there are other circumstances in which public protection will have to uh, play a function absent uh, a conviction. And it is that particular uh, uh, area, that particular cohort, that the government is placing a lot of attention uh, and concentration upon. Uh, I think it would be perhaps idle of me to uh, uh, try and speculate and outline what precise forms those would take, but it is a dialogue that uh, I would encourage him to take part in actively over the next few months, and it's something that I would want to develop with support from all parts of this House. And I'll give way to the honourable, my honourable friend. Um, at, at this stage in the debate, and uh, trying to avoid uh, our having what might otherwise turn into a kind of argument about the law in court, uh, could I just ask him whether the case of uh, Del Rio Prado has actually been taken into account? Does he know that that has been taken into account in this case because it was about policy and, and administration? No, uh, and he will, be, he will be glad to know not only is it being taken into account, but I've read it. It's a 2013 authority from the Strasbourg Court. It relates to uh, a particular set of circumstances involving the Kingdom of Spain. Uh, there have been subsequent uh, uh, cases, uh, both before that court and indeed domestically. Uh, in summary, Mr Speaker, we are satisfied on the basis of all the information we have that the provisions of Article 7 are not engaged in this respect. And I'll give to my right honourable learning friends make a most compelling case for this legislation uh, and for the sake of completeness I'm sure he will also read and take into account the subsequent cases in the Strasbourg Court of Evadian in the United Kingdom in 2016 uh, and of the Supreme Court in Doherty in 2017 both subsequent to Rio del Prado which it seems to me support the government's contention. Well, I'd say to my honourable friend, as, as I'm sure he's heard many times in court, uh, his submissions find uh, great uh, force uh, with uh, the government, and we are persuaded by them. Um, I was going on to deal with the issue about uh, 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 parole release uh, and in the uh, ambit of, of that release. Oh, and I'll, I'll give way to the honourable gentleman. I'm very grateful to the Lord Chancellor, and I appreciate just before he moves on uh, to another point. I think it's uh, very clear that he is carrying the House with him um, this afternoon, and that all of us are seized by the, the necessity uh, to bring forward this bill at this time and as quickly as possible. But it is acknowledged uh, that there are serious concerns and issues around the engagement of Article 7. I think he has an entirely justifiable position, but also that we are bereft uh, of the detailed pre-legislative scrutiny that, that we otherwise might, and that is a consequence of the situation we find uh, ourselves in. But given that, has the Lord Chancellor given any consideration to injecting a review mechanism uh, within this Act? Lord Chancellor. Well, well I am very grateful to uh, the Honourable Gentleman. In fact, uh, I think it is right to say, in the context of Northern Ireland, we have given such careful consideration to the engagement of Article 7 that we have not chosen to extend the legislation to Northern Ireland, because the way in which the sentence is uh, calculated and put together by the Northern Ireland courts does actually cause potential issues with regard to engagement uh, and, therefore, potential interference with the nature of the penalty itself. And I think, actually, that is very important in this context, that it is real evidence 
evidence of the fact that the British government has thought very carefully about the engagement of Article 7 and has not sought to uh, take a blanket approach to all parts or to, to, to the various jurisdictions within the United Kingdom. I, he I hear what he says about a review mechanism. He will be reassured to know, of course, that a counter-terror bill is coming forward, which will cover all parts of the United Kingdom. There will be opportunity within that bill to uh, uh, debate and uh, analyse uh, uh, further long-term proposals. And inevitably, the, uh, the status of provisions of, of this bill, uh, hopefully an act of Parliament, will be part of that ongoing debate. So I'm confident that through the mechanisms of this House, we will be able to uh, subject these pr provisions to post-legislative scrutiny in the way that he would expect. I was explaining the extension of... Per and I'll give way to my right honourable friend. I'm extremely grateful to my right honourable and learned friend for giving way before he moves on to the parole board. He's mentioned already the effect of this legislation that will keep terrorist prisoners in custody for longer and he's also paid rightly tribute to prison imams who maintain religious interventions for those whose motivation is at least claimed to be religious for their terrorist offending. Can he reassure us that given the extra time in custody that many of these prisoners will now serve these sorts of effective and in many cases very brave interventions by prison imams will be given the extra time available to take further effect. My right honourable and learned friend, the former Attorney General, speaks with great experience uh, and knowledge of these matters. He's absolutely right to focus upon the specialist intervention of our imams. I think I'd referred to the fact that we were going to increase resources and increase the number available within our prisons. Both the Home Secretary and I have seen at first hand the uh, partnership working that goes on within the high security estate when it comes to dealing with these particular challenges and it's precisely that type of specialist intervention that he and others can be confident about that we will be supporting in the years ahead. I was explaining the extension of parole release, Madam Deputy Speaker, who I welcome, uh, to those those who serve standard determinate sentences and other transitional cases currently subject to automatic release. And in line with the normal arrangements for prisoners released by the Parole Board, for this cohort of offenders, the Board will set the conditions of an offender's licence when they are released before the end of their sentence. Uh, the Parole Board, as I was uh, outlining earlier, has the necessary powers and indeed the expertise to make risk-based release decisions for terrorist offenders. The Board currently deals with terrorists who serve indeterminate sentences, extended sentences and those uh, sentences for offenders of particular concern, the SPOCs as they are uh, colloquially referred to. There is a cohort of specialist Parole Board members who are trained specifically to deal with terrorists and extremists offenders. They are, in effect, the specialised branch of the board that will be used to handle these additional cases. They include retired High Court judges, retired police officers and other experts in the field, all who have extensive experience of dealing with the most sensitive and difficult terrorist cases. Due to the nature of the emergency legislation, I have uh, proposed that the provisions uh, cover both England, Wales and Scotland, uh, and the justification for this emergency retrospective legislation, out of the ordinary though I accept it is, is to prevent the automatic release of terrorist offenders in the coming weeks and months. Given the risk that this cohort have shown already that they pose to the public, it is vital that we pass this legislation rapidly before any more terrorists are automatically released from custody at the halfway point. And therefore, we're aiming for this legislation to receive royal assent before the end of the month. And with the support of this House, Madam Deputy Speaker, I am confident that we can do this, and I commend this bill to the House. The question is that the bill be now read a second term. Shadow Minister Nick Thomas Simmons. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I should say, first of all, that I'm grateful to the Justice Secretary for his briefing last week and for his opening remarks. And I'm also grateful to the Minister who's been keeping me updated in recent days. This piece of legislation follows the awful terrorist atrocities, first at Fishmongers Hall on the 30th of November, and more recently, of course, in Streatham. 
And I would like to say from the outset that my thoughts and the thoughts, I'm sure, of all members across this House go out to the victims of these terrible attacks, their families and friends, and we thank the emergency services who responded so quickly. We on these benches support the Parole Board involvement in release decisions, and should this legislation not be passed and rushed through all its stages in the next couple of weeks, then there will be terrorist prisoners on our streets without any Parole Board assessment of risk or dangerousness. Now, that isn't to say that it leaves the House in the easiest of positions, but that is the reality of the position that is before us. I do say to Ministers today that what is going to be needed for this to be durable and workable is that it doesn't amount to simply a delay confronting the problem, but there, there is a relentless focus on an investment in the most effective of de-radicalisation programmes in our prisons. I give way, don't I? One of the most effective uh, de-radicalisation programmes is that run by the Saudis, but it does take a long time. Is he satisfied that sentences are actually long enough to accommodate a, a, a successful programme? Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I had a long debate on sentencing in the last Parliament with the then Security Minister, now the Defence Secretary, and a number of sentences were increased. But I thought that, very fairly actually, the former Prime Minister pointed out in her intervention on the Justice Secretary, there's certainly been an issue with the success of the programmes in recent years. Now, length of the sentence is one matter, but whatever the length of the sentence is, that programme must be targeted and effective, and that's something I will come to in a moment in my remarks. Because whilst we are here for emergency legislation, it is also an emergency in resources. Now, the Leader of the House indicated yesterday that the Treasury had approved additional resources for the additional time prisoners spend in custody as a consequence of this bill and for the Parole Board, but clearly there is going to have to be, in addition to that, a specific and dramatic increase in resources to tackle extremism in our prisons. It isn't just about resources. I think my honourable friend, the member for Stretford and Urmston, made the point about process and expertise, and she's absolutely right about that as well. But that clearly will require a strategic approach from the very top. The Justice Secretary has made clear that there is no need for derogation from the European Convention on Human Rights, and he set out the government legal position with regard to Article 7. We on these benches firmly believe that we can tackle the issue of terrorism and proudly remain signatories to the European Convention on Human Rights. To leave it and to join Belarus as the only non-European signatory would, in our view, be to send out a terrible signal to the rest of the world. And we should never sacrifice the values, the very values that we are defending in the fight against terrorism and hatred. Madam Deputy Speaker, those who perpetrate hatred and violence are responsible for their own actions. But it is for the government to do everything it can to keep our streets safe and to minimise the risk of something like this ever happening again. And I do think the House today is entitled to ask the question as to why we have ended up requiring this law to be made via emergency legislation. Automatic early release is hardly new. It's been part of our system for many years and could have already been dealt with by a government that took a more strategic approach. And over the past decade, there have been a number of warning signals. The Justice Secretary mentioned Ian Aitchison in his opening speech, former prison governor who led a review of Islamist extremism in our prisons, probation and indeed youth justice system which was published in August of 2016. This is what Mr Aitchison said, and I quote, What we found was so shockingly bad that I had to agree to the language in the report being toned down. There were serious deficiencies in almost every respect of the management of terrorist offenders throughout the prison system, and it was a shambles. Shame. A shambles. Now, Mr Aitchison proposed 69 recommendations that, according to the Justice Secretary on the media on the weekend, 
had been consolidated into a total of 11, eight of which the Justice Secretary said was being implemented. But this is what Mr Aitchison said in a newspaper article last Thursday. He said, as part of my review of prison extremism, I made a great number of recommendations that specifically related to a tactical response to a terrorist incident in prison where staff were targeted. I have no way of knowing if or how many were implemented as none made it into the response published by the Ministry of Justice. Now, that was only days ago. I don't know if the Justice Secretary has met Mr Aitchison since last Thursday. He says, I'm proud for him to intervene and answer that. I'm extremely grateful to him. He makes a very important point. I haven't met Mr. Aitchison since last Thursday, but I have met him. In fact, I took part in a documentary he uh, produced for Radio 4 a few weeks ago before the latest attack. Uh, the engagement that he's, he's had has been valued. Uh, I'm not going to go into the precise circumstances by which the uh, uh, report was consolidated, because in essence there were some sensitive matters within the report that uh, we all understood uh, at the time could not be published. But I'll say this. This, that um, he's right to talk about 2016, and we accepted what Mr. Aitchison said, but things have moved on a long way since then. Uh, and the, uh, the problems that he identified are being directly tackled. Still more to be done, we accept, but we have moved on in the four years since that report. He'd be glad to know. Well, I'll come to the issue of whether things have moved on in a moment because we'll be exploring what the Chief Inspector of Prisons says about that. But as regards what Mr Aitchison said last Thursday, he clearly was unsure of the position only days ago. And I take what the Justice Secretary says about what's in the public domain. Of course, that's entirely appropriate. But one would hope that someone who led a review for the government would know four years later whether or not specific recommendations had been acted upon or not. And I take what the Justice Secretary says about appearing in a documentary, but I would strongly suggest he meets with Mr Aitchison fairly urgently and discusses, I, I, I will give way to him now, in a moment, and discusses with him precisely what Mr Aitchison isn't sure of so that that matter can be cleared up. I'll give way. Oh, for giving way. Uh, I should have added that indeed uh, I have offered and he has accepted a full briefing from HMPPS as to the issues that we are talking about. I'm, I'm pleased, I am pleased to hear that and I hope we'll never be in this situation again where someone all those years later having led that review isn't aware of what's going on. That simply cannot happen and shouldn't, I'm sure the Secretary of uh, State would agree, be the case. Because there, there are concerns frankly, about the Ministry of Justice listening and the extent to which justice has been a priority for the government over the past decade. The coalition government chose not to make the Ministry of Justice a protected department when it implemented spending cuts, and that's led to 40% cuts over the past decade, including to the very prisons that we're all here today are expected to play a vital role in offender management. We know 21,000 police officers disappeared from our streets and prison officer numbers have been slashed as well. There's currently only 18,912 frontline prison officers still not back at 2010 levels. And that loss of prison officers, Madam Deputy Speaker, didn't just reduce the capacity of prisons to deal with issues of rehabilitation. It also meant that years and years of experience in working in challenging environments in our prisons have been lost. In 2019, 35% of prison officers had been in post for less than two years. That's compared to just 7% back in 2010. I'm not saying that those officers, of course, aren't doing their best in very difficult circumstances, but it is to say that the government needlessly threw away very valuable experience in our prisons. Would my friend give you okay, would he agree, due to the lack of prison officers that we've had, and by privatising some of those prisons and having young officers in there, has led to certainly problems in HMP Birmingham, where there's been a number of riots over the last couple of years, and that actually adds more to the costs of the Treasury rather than putting real people in, and people with experience have been taken away and bringing them back in? My honourable friend. 
speaks with great authority about HMP Birmingham and his own knowledge from his constituency. But he's also quite right to identify that if you run prisons in that way, then it is going to have particular consequences. And of course, it reduces the time available for meaningful activity. Now, on the media on the weekend, the Justice Secretary talked about improvements in our justice system since Mr Aitchison's report. He repeated it in his speech and just repeated it in an intervention a moment or two ago. So what I thought I'd do is compare what the Justice Secretary is saying with the views of the Independent Chief Inspector of Prisons. And the latest annual report from Peter Clark, the Chief Inspector, said this, and I quote, far too many of our jails have been plagued by drugs, violence, appalling living conditions, and a lack of access to meaningful rehabilitative activity. Now that should be a wake-up call to the government. Mr Clark went on to say, and I quote, levels of self-harm were disturbingly high and self-inflicted deaths tragically increased by nearly one-fifth on the previous year. Madam Deputy Speaker, that is no way for a prison service to be run and things must change. And there is as well, if I may say so, an issue at the Ministry of Justice with the government failing to provide it with stable leadership. The Right Honourable Gentleman is the seventh Justice Secretary since 2010. Seventh. And of those seven, five have served for 18 months or less. The role of Lord Chancellor should have been respected and not been subject to a revolving door. No wonder there is a lack of direction, no wonder there isn't any long-term planning, as the Justice Secretary simply aren't in post long enough. There are even indications from 10 Downing Street that half the Cabinet could be out by Friday. And I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman in all sincerity, I hope very much that he survives in this role. Because there is an enormous job. I hope I haven't uh, jinxed him by saying that. That could, I could have just ruined uh, his Friday. But there is an enormous job to do, Madam Deputy Speaker. There are 224 terrorist prisoners in England and Wales, of whom 173 have been assessed as having extreme Islamist views, and we also know there is a growing threat from far-right terrorism. If we want to properly manage the risk of terrorist offenders, we need the most effective, targeted de-radicalisation programmes being delivered by staff in the best conditions we can provide for them. Will you give way? I'll give way. I'm grateful to him for giving way, and I almost intervened on the Lord Chancellor because the one area that hasn't been mentioned in this, when I just completed the police parliamentary scheme and spent some time with the counter-terrorism units, the one area that they highlighted was mental health resources in our communities to work with on the ground. And that risk decision, that decision about someone's mental capacity and their radicalisation at that, at that community level is, is really important when we, we look at resources and the cuts to our mental health services are also impacting on this area. Yes, my honourable friend is absolutely right and I think one of the issues sometimes is we tend to see things in isolation and not the fact that cuts to many other services have also had an impact. It's something the government needs to take into account. Indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker, when we talk about conditions for our prison officers to work in. We still have a third of our prisons built in the Victorian era. There's a £900 million maintenance backlog and there's a desperate need for new investment. I'll give way to the In relation to the question of mental disturbance, um, does, my, does the Honourable Gentleman accept that there are circumstances in which, for example, the principle of mens rea may not apply simply because the person in question, for a variety of reasons, some of which may be drug affected, some of which may be intrinsic, actually is incapable of making a, uh, an act within the framework of mens rea, and that in those circumstances we should perhaps be thinking further down the line as to what kind of containment people need in order to be restrained from performing these murderous acts. Well, there are a number of issues, I would say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, of course, about mens rea, which is an essential element of committing a criminal offence. There are various issues that have been decided before the courts in relation to that. But in relation to those who do suffer from severe mental health problems, there are also already elements of our law that can deal with those situations. And they can be used and operated appropriately on a multi-agency basis. I'll give way. 
take this opportunity to reiterate my previous intervention. The suspicion is that there are people who are gravely mentally ill who are in prison when they actually ought to be treated as if they are criminally insane and held in secure psychiatric units. And the concern is that people are being treated as terrorists when they're clearly mad simply because they have picked up some smattering of something that passes for a religious motivation. Well, we're where I can agree to a degree is I certainly accept that there are people with mental health problems in prison who shouldn't be, frankly. But if we come to the issue of psychiatric units, which I think is what the Honourable Gentleman is referring to, secure psychiatric units, there's also a shortage of places there as well, which is another issue that the government needs to accept on the basis of the past ten <laughs> years. And we are asking, ultimately, I heard what the Justice Secretary said about specialist officers, particularly in de-radicalisation programs, but we are also tolerating a situation, frankly, where physical attacks on our prison staff have risen. And to be fair, and that can't be fair to them in order to have a constructive environment in our prisons. From September 2018 to 2019, there were 33,222 assaults, 23,592 prisoner on prisoner, and 10,059 assaults on staff, alongside, by the way, the highest ever recorded levels of self-harm. Now today, the Justice Secretary, I'm sure, would argue will deal with the immediate crisis of the next few weeks, but he must plan ahead. And I say this too, the crisis in our criminal justice system doesn't end with our prisons. We also need the best possible probation services and the best possible supervision. In 2014, the government part privatised the probation service. I don't think it's unfair to say it was an absolute disaster. Uh, the government had more than 150,000 people supervised by private community rehabilitation companies and just left the high-risk offenders managed by the National Probation Service. The Chief Inspector of Probation, Dame Glenis Stacey, said last year, and I quote, the system which sees private firms monitor criminals serving community sentences is irredeemably flawed, and she's right. No wonder the Right Honourable Gentleman's predecessor had to announce that the supervision of all offenders on probation in England and Wales was being put back into the public sector last year. I'll give way. The Honourable Gentleman for giving way. He's making a pay by capacity, and that seems to be, to be reasonable. But early release, of course, and there have been scores of people released early since 2013, uh, I'm speaking of terrorist uh, uh, convicts, uh, adds to the demand on capacity, which he's making a case that we should address. So, um, on that basis, I'm sure he wants to support the, uh, the Secretary of State uh, in taking that pressure away, building the morale and allowing the uh, police to exercise capacity in a more effective way, as he described. Well, yes, I, and I've made clear about my support for uh, you know, the, the measures before us today. I've, I've made that absolutely clear, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. But what my point is simply this. Today we'll deal with an immediate crisis. What it won't do is deal with the broader, deeper problems that we have that will need to be dealt with in the months and years ahead. And to use the point about probation, Madam Deputy Speaker, and its botched part privatisation, the National Audit Office announced that part privatisation had cost the taxpayer nearly £500 million. Quite frankly, it is time for good sense and consistency in policy making at the Ministry of Justice. And with regard to the, the Home Office, the independent review of the Prevent programme, which I secured in the last Parliament, I think I've debated it previously with the Right Honourable Gentleman across the floor, uh, has been announced, but there is no reviewer. Uh, we are now a year from the point at which the bill that he and I debated received royal assent. Uh, Lord Carlyle was appointed to it, but resigned before Christmas because he'd already expressed views on the programme. And the government have hardly shown any urgency in appointing a replacement. It's high time that they did. And whilst I appreciate that isn't the responsibility of the Justice Secretary, I'm sure you will pass that message on to Cabinet colleagues that that reviewer needs to be appointed and the review must begin, take place and make recommendations. 
Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, today really must be a day when that focus on rehabilitation comes and we do actually turn the page away from the decade of problems that we've seen in our criminal justice system. Now, one of the recommendations made by Mr Aitchison was for an independent advisor on counter-terrorism in prisons. I would go further and press the Justice Secretary on actually providing external scrutiny and assessment of the de-radicalisation programmes across our prison estate. And that way, this House can regularly assess the position, and we will not be in a situation where we are again taken by surprise or are responding on the hoof. We cannot tolerate a position when our prisons become breeding grounds for extremism, and we need to be asking searching questions. Madam Deputy Speaker, this emergency legislation will, I hope, now pass uh, without a division. And alongside it, I hope the Government will now invest in the very best expertise available in counter-extremism and tackle the crisis in our prisons. It is only by doing that that the Government can truly say it is doing all it can to keep our streets safe. And in doing that, we will be holding them to account. Yes. Yes. Robert Neil. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I must say that both the front bench speeches have been very thoughtful, uh, and I think that measures uh, and matches the important significance of this debate. Can I say that I think my right honourable and learned friend, the Lord Chancellor, made a, a very compelling case for this legislation. It's not uh, the type of legislation that the House should uh, undertake upon lightly, uh, but uh, ultimately, the protection of the public. Uh, it is something which must trump uh, all other considerations. Now, it is always right that we should protect the public in a way which is commensurate with the rule of law. And I believe that the Government and the Lord Chancellor have managed to achieve that balance. And I'm glad that the official opposition uh, recognised that uh, too. Uh, that's a fundamental duty for, for all of us, uh, and reconciling the two is a considerable achievement uh, under the pressures of this time. Uh, the reason I think it's necessary to move in this way, Madam Deputy Speaker, has been well set out. But as somebody who has represented a London constituency, uh, many of whose constituencies work in and around the very places where we've seen so many atrocities, it brings home to us profoundly the catastrophic risk that can come when an individual is released, even though the index offence which caused them to go to prison may not have, relate, may not have led to a very long sentence. Nonetheless, the nature, I'm sorry to say, of the type of terrorism that we see now often based upon perverted uh, ideologies uh, and the deep-seatedness of, of, of the hatreds which that breeds do give us the need to be particularly careful and cautious about all forms of release uh, going forward. And the fact that uh, once the automatic period of release has been moved to two-thirds, it will in fact no longer be automatic, will be, will be in all cases uh, under the, after the consideration of the, of the parole board, is itself also a worthwhile uh, and important uh, aspect of the Bill. Of course, I give way to my uh, honourable friend. And I listen, as ever, to, with great uh, interest to everything that my honourable friend says. Uh, does he th think, however, that this question of this bill has a limited effect, whereas really the problems which we are facing have a much longer term consequence. And does he also believe, therefore, that we ought to be having a more rigorous analysis, this being only emergency legislation, into the future to make sure that human life in this country takes priority over the interpretation of law? Well, I certainly agree that we need a more detailed analysis uh, as to the best approach to what is a, a threat which is, continues to change and develop. Uh, and I think my right on one friend is right uh, on that matter. Uh, and I think it's right that this is of itself uh, a discreet uh, and uh, emergency measure to deal with a, a specific and urgent problem. Uh, I certainly think we need to uh, look at the way in which we deal with sentencing and the treatment of these particular individuals uh, and the protection of the public in that context. That is uh, absolutely right. Uh, I happen to believe, lest it be hinted at, that that's perfectly uh, capable of being achieved within our continuing adherence to the European Convention on, on Human Rights, uh, and I think a, a series of British court decisions would tend to support that. But the broader thrust that there is more work to do in this field, uh, my honourable friend, is absolutely right. Uh, about. I think the government, I've got the sense that the government and the Lord Charles recognise uh, that too. Uh, coming to this specific uh, legislation, uh, it's right that we should consider the necessity of it. I would have thought that was well made out now. 
Uh, that's one of the principles of the rule of law. Uh, Lord Bingham famously uh, set out a number of principles. Uh, one shouldn't act in haste unless there is compelling reason. Uh, but the very re reality of blood being shed on the streets uh, 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 of this country itself, it seems to me, is a compelling reason. Uh, and the fact that people have been released uh, and then very so swiftly and very frequently uh, seized articles and used them to catastrophic effect, it seems to me, to make this uh, legislation both necessary and indeed proportionate uh, as well. So I hope that the House will have no hesitation uh, in supporting it. Uh, the one issue that seems, particularly amongst legal uh, circles, to have, have raised some concern is whether or not there is any risk of retrospectivity. Uh, I don't seek to, 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 uh, to see retrospective uh, legislation. I don't believe, for the reasons uh, that the Lord Chancellor set out, uh, that is the case. Um, when I was in practice at the bar, uh, it, it was very clear uh, that the prospect of early release, whether or not that might occur, uh, was not a consideration that any judge should take into account in, in passing sentence. Uh, the, the principle was, and always has been, that the sentence uh, should be passed commensurate with the level of the gravity and seriousness of the offence and any other legitimate mitigating or aggravating circumstances which the Crown or the defence can uh, put forward. Uh, the prospect that there may or may not be the pros uh, of release thereafter was never regarded uh, as a uh, consideration affecting the penalty. And that's important to the argument that this is retrospectively uh, uh, increasing the penalty, uh, which I think is a, 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 a misguided argument to make uh, under these uh, circumstances. Uh, it was often said that the prospect of, of early release, in effect, ameliorates the penalty that was passed rather than anything else. And as a string of authority, as has been said in both the UK and uh, the uh, Strasbourg Court, to the effect that the penalty, I'll just make this point and then give way to my uh, right honourable friend, that the penalty passed uh, is that which is, is the total duration of the penalty which is laid down by the court at, at the time. That's the bit that can't be changed retrospectively, and the legislation does not seek to do that. I'll give way to my right honourable well, friend. Well, my right friend, from his uh, long experience of these things, is making a, a cogent argument, of course, about the character of uh, penalties. Uh, and, of course, uh, go, you might go, want to go further. The problem with the assumption about automatic early release is injurious to the very principle that he set out. Early release has always been part of... Uh, judicial considerations, but on the basis of an assessment of risk and merit and worthiness, and automatic early release runs against those principles. Well, I understand that point, uh, and it's something which is certainly something which I think in more broad terms we can de debate when the larger piece of sentencing legislation comes forward, as I understand it, uh, later in this session. Yes. For the purposes of this legislation, of course, effectively that's what you're doing, that as well as moving the two-thirds, uh, the, the point from half to two-thirds of release, you're then automatically saying there must be consideration with the parole board. And the one thing I make on that is it's very important that the parole board uh, have the resource and the expertise uh, to carry out the additional and heavy burden that they must properly take on board for this. There have been good reforms to the Parole Board since, for example, the War Boys case and the Justice Select Committee in the last Parliament uh, looked at and urged changes to the way in which parole operated, which I know have been acted upon. So I think there is movement in the right direction, but we must be ever vigilant in making sure that they have the resource, and that may include more specialist resource in, in, in those terms. I'll give way to my right honourable friend. I'm very interested in, in my honourable friend's lucid speech, and in particular the fact that he says that the sentence imposed by judges is meant to reflect the gravity of the crime uh, does explain why so many people feel short-changed, victims feel short-changed, when people are let out early. And when we do come to consider the larger question of sentencing, wouldn't it make more sense to uh, have judges impose sentences that people will actually serve and extend them if people misbehave in jail, rather than reducing them if they behave? 
it's an interesting point that, that, that's made, and we will want to, I think, look at a, a number of issues when we debate the sentencing bill. I would just say, by way of caution, when you start extending the sentence and the penalty, then you do, I think, run the risk of falling foul of the principle against retrospectivity. And that isn't, with respect to my right honourable friend, something that I would wish to see. That's different from remission, from remission of the sentence for earned good behaviour, which was the, the traditional system that we grew up with. But it's an important distinction with respect that has to be drawn. I'll give one more time. I'll be give away one more time. But no, I mean, the point about extending the sentence would be they'd be extending it because of the commission of a further offence whilst in prison, and that would not be retrospectivity. Well, that's with respect to our honourable friend, it's an interesting point, it's a wholly different consideration. And there has been uh, uh, much debate, and again, the Select Committee has looked at this and has urged that when there is an offence, for example, an assault on a prison officer, uh, there is a compelling case very often, as a matter of public policy, for that to be charged as an additional offence, rather than dealt with being dealt with under the prison disciplinary rules, uh, as is frequently the case at the moment. I'd be with him as far as that goes, and perhaps as far as we need to take it for the purposes of uh, today's uh, debate. Um, but the, the other thing I just wanted to do with on retrospectivity uh, is this. Uh, I know that some uh, learned commentators uh, have raised concerns on the basis of the European Court decision uh, of uh, uh, the Rio Prada, uh, which, when you look at it, itself, I think, at most raises a tangential concern or a speculative concern that there might be retrospectivity. I think the briefing I saw from the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law, which I've got a lot of respect for, and therefore it's, I think it's right to address it, says that arguably this could be regarded uh, as falling foul of one of the principles. It doesn't come down hard and fast in that regard, uh, but it's worth bearing in mind that was a decision after a very particularly convoluted uh, history of changes within the Spanish judicial system. Uh, utterly different from what we're seeing here, uh, and uh, subsequently there have been decisions uh, both uh, in the uh, Strasbourg Court uh, in the reference the application of abating against the United Kingdom, and subsequently the decision by the Supreme Court uh, here in the UK in the case of Doherty, where the line of reasoning, it seems to me, to be much more consistent uh, with the traditional stance that we've, uh, that we've had ever since the House of Laws decision in the case of Upland. Uh, that uh, the uh, changes to remission and early release provisions are part of the administration or execution of the sentence and not part of the penalty. And that seems such a well-established uh, principle that we ought, to, I think, to have confidence that we can act upon that in this case. I'll give way to the Minister, of course. Well, I just wanted to say I wholeheartedly concur with the Honourable and Learned Gentleman's analysis. But just to add, in the Rio del Prada case, which he refers to, that touched on the way that concurrent sentences were calculated, really a wholly different matter to the one before the House today. Uh, my my honourable friend makes a very important point, and uh, in, in legal parlance, if I was being asked to distinguish the two, I would have thought that was the most material, uh, a most material consideration for distinguishing between those cases and the current ones that we are dealing with here. So I hope that the, the House will be reassured, having considered and thought about, will be reassured on the retrospectivity uh, point. Uh, the final things I'd say very briefly, Madam Deputy Speaker, are these. It is important, though, as other honourable members have observed, to recognise that this is a specific piece of legislation to deal with a specific uh, and discrete problem. It does not mean that we should not act urgently, too, to deal with the broader issue of how do we deal uh, with uh, this particular type of terrorism which has developed in recent years. How do we contain uh, uh, those who are deeply radicalised within prison? How do we prevent further radicalisation within prison? And there's some concern that, for example, the uh, Streatham attacker was continuing, it seems, potentially to have received radicalisation material whilst in prison. I think we need to look most urgently at that. And, of course, the real threat that many of us have come across of hard-line um, uh, terrorist prisoners seeking to further radicalise more vulnerable inmates within the prison estate. Uh, and that's a real risk. And that's an issue which Mr Aitchison, who has been referred to um, uh, favourably, I think, by many in the course of this debate, addressed. I'm glad to hear that uh, the Lord Chancellor has been in touch uh, with uh, uh, Mr Aitchison. I, I share the view of the Shadow Minister uh, that I think Mr Aitchison has a good deal more to give to this, di to, to this discussion. Things have moved on since his 2016 report. Uh, he was certainly a most um, compelling witness when he appeared before the Justice uh, Select Committee uh, in, in the then Parliament. 
and it may be that we'd like to have the benefit of his views uh, again. But it's certainly something I hope the government will make the point uh, of engaging directly with him as to see how, within the new context, we can continue to take on that expertise and other expertise. I think it's also right that we look to build upon the good work which is being done within the chaplaincy service in the form of the specialist imams. Uh, we haven't, I perhaps, looked often enough and given enough credit to the work of prison, of prison chaplaincy generally uh, and of the specialist imams who have a very difficult task uh, to fulfil uh, and uh, from those I've met uh, often do so very admirably. But what can we do more to give them a greater professional, um, pastoral, if you like, um, and uh, practical uh, and professional support in carrying out that task? I think that's an important area. I hope the Minister will confirm that we intend to continue with work on that area. And what can we do to make sure uh, that uh, the, those prisoners who are held in, for example, Belmarsh near me, um, in, in South East London, significant numbers of terrorist prisoners uh, held in, in a high security prison. Can we make sure that they are being done so in a way which A does not propose any further threat to staff in terms of attacks, an issue that Mr Aitchison dealt with, and also, as I say, any threat either physically or in terms of further corruption uh, to other more vulnerable inmates uh, with whom uh, they might be serving. So this is an important piece of legislation. I hope the House will speed it through, uh, but there is much more work to do. And I'll end up, although the Lord Chancellor uh, is not now with us, concurring with the Shadow Minister in one final point. I too have been frustrated as Chairman of the Select Committee uh, at the revolving door of Secretaries of State and Ministers uh, who have appeared before us uh, uh, over the years. Um, I very much hope that the Lord Chancellor uh, will stay in office for very many uh, yeah, years and very yeah, successfully. Yeah, yeah, and I would yeah. have thought the way he's handled this delicate matter, as he did yesterday, gives him as good a claim to that uh, as any. And I hope yeah, that yeah. hasn't done too that much damage from my side of the house <laughs> either. Thank you. Kenny McCaskill. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I first of all concur with the Lord Chancellor's comments that the, one of the primary duties of any government in any uh, country is to keep its uh, population safe. Uh, I would go as far as to say that that applies to everybody who is elected to this institution and to any democratic chamber. Nobody seeks to make their constituency, let alone their country, uh, unsafe. And therefore, it is in that spirit that we come to this debate. Uh, we do understand the spirit of the legislation, and we do also understand the need for urgency, because I have had to deal with urgent and special procedures on severe matters uh, and danger to the public in another chamber. There are, though, obviously some duties, and we do also have some element of proportionality. I think the Lord Chancellor used the word cohorts. I do think it is important that we put on record, uh, despite what might be put across by some tabloid newspapers or by others, we are not dealing with thousands, we are not dealing with hundreds, we are dealing, he said, I think 50, as some actually suggested it might even be lower than that. Equally, Madam Deputy Speaker, we do recognise that they may be few in number, but the danger and damage that they can cause in our communities is significant, as we have sadly seen. By all means. In concurring with what he has just said, he will, however, recognise that even to keep close surveillance of one of those people can involve up to 50 members of Special Branch or MI5, and therefore only a handful of them will severely test the resources of the security services. Oh, absolutely. I am going to come to that particular point, uh, given my own involvement as a former Justice Secretary in Scotland. But we do have, as I say, on these opposition benches, a duty uh, not only to ensure public safety, but also to challenge and hold the government to account on proportionality, on practicality and, indeed, on operability. Uh, so some issues will test, uh, some issues will probe uh, to ensure that public safety criteria that we all on whatever side of this uh, House uh, share are being met. But I can give the Minister the assurance that we are not uh, dealing or opposing the general principles of the Bill. <coughs> that deals me to the first question of retrospectivity that has been commented by many members. It is unusual, it is rare, it is infrequently done. We are open to it, uh, but we do have some caveats. And in doing so, I think the major caveat is that we have to ensure that we get it right, because we do appreciate uh, and indeed very much welcome the extensive consideration that has been given and indeed provided to all members of the logic and thinking. But it is important, because I am always conscious of the analogy of wasps in the jar. If you shake them all about and then you let them out, 
then you're going to get stung. And I think what we have to ensure is that if we are dealing with retrospectivity, and as I say, we are sympathetic to that, but we do take on board the points made by the Bingham Centre that members will have seen earlier today. So we're seeking as much assurance as can be given by the Minister, because no absolute assurance we recognise can be given, but that he is as certain as he can be that we won't face protracted litigation, a rewrite or further emergency legislation, and indeed the potential calamitous problems that may follow upon that, with the in reference to the analogy of wasps in a jar. But that takes us on to the substantive issues that have been dealt with by many in the Chamber of both sides, but in particular by the uh, member for Turfane. Because the real issue, I think, at the end of the day here is radicalisation. And our primary concern in these benches is not so much with the nature of the legislation, but the action with prisoners, current or future, that has been and must most certainly be taken in the future. Because it's one thing to detain them longer, it is quite another to do something constructive with them when you have them, and that is the nub of the problem, and that is the underlying issue that we are seeking to test with the Government. Because I think it was the uh, former Prime Minister, uh, Theresa May, who mentioned that all will ultimately be released. And indeed, I had significant discussions with her when I was Justice Secretary and she was Home Secretary. The likelihood is that most will be released, bar for a very uh, small few, perhaps even only a handful. We have to ensure that when that date comes, that we are as safe as we can be. And indeed, although no government can give every assurance that nobody will reoffend, we have to be as sure as we can be that the risk is limited, or indeed that the actions to protect the public are in fact in place. So that, as I say, reminds me once again why we are generally supportive of the thrust of the amendments coming from the opposition benches and indeed mentioned by the member for Turfane. The real issue is not the legislation, but the action to de-radicalise when within our prisons and monitor when without them. Equally, we recognise that it is a relatively new phenomenon, and I think many members have mentioned that it has been with us for more years than we care to remember. But it is a challenge for those involved in criminal justice because it is a new aspect. We do have to think out the box, which is why the mention of the input of imams is extremely important. They are to be welcomed and sometimes face significant challenges, if not threats themselves, because, as I say, we do have to address them within and monitor them without. Dealing with, by all means. The point he is making is absolutely correct, but there will be some who will not be de radicalised. Uh, in that circumstance, and when it does come uh, for their release, they are not mentally ill. They have a different view of the world. Is it not the case that we may need to look at uh, reviewing perhaps the treason law, as my honourable friend, the member for Tombridge and Mauling, suggested at the weekend? No, I do not think that uh, that would be required. I think there are ways in which we can deal with them. I think uh, the chair of the committee will know better than I, and the law in Scotland is somewhat different in how we address psychopathy. There are always difficulties in dealing with mental health. It challenges the courts as it challenges those in the health service who quite correctly uh, deal with them. I do think it comes to an issue of dealing with a new phenomenon. There are those who are mentally ill and who either individually or indeed encouraged by others are set loose uh, to cause havoc, uh, and they have to be uh, tried to be dealt with by the uh, National Health Services as best we can. There are others who are simply malevolent. We do indeed uh, currently have powers under terrorist legislation, so I do not think that there is any additional matter there. It comes on to the point of how we deal with them within and how we deal with them without. And dealing with the latter first, obviously monitoring them, as the member across the chamber mentioned earlier, is extremely resource significant. It is not a matter of somebody in a rain jacket tailing an individual or even accompanied by another. It takes dozens and indeed often significantly more because there's back office, there's different shifts, there's different ways of monitoring in the world in which we live. The resource just to deal with one individual, never mind the supply chain that we know uh, accompanies them, is significant. And that is why there has to be assurances that that will be provided, because more police numbers are required, certainly south of the border. But the input of uh, terrorism impact upon policing is significant, and that has to be taken on board, given the other demands that they rightly face within our communities. That deal deals to the uh, former issue, and it deals to the point, I think, uh, and leads on to the point being made about the HSN review as far back as 2016, where it does appear that little has to be done. 
It does appear to me from discussions that uh, one of the points made by Mr Aitchison, and quite correctly, I think welcomed by the Government, was that there should be specialist separation units within prisons. Now, I understand some four were established, but only one, I think, at HMP Franklin is in operation. I may be open to correction or challenge on that, but if that is the situation, then frankly it is simply not good enough. If you have an independent reviewer of the statute of Mr Aitchison, we all agree, then you are duty bound to implement it. If he brings in specific points that you go to the trouble of actually establishing, then it is rather mind-blowing that only one should be operating. So I would hope and expect that the Minister, by all means. I find um, that I needed to interject because I agreed with you on a point of um, special separation units. I think that we do need to look at how we can increase our numbers because what we're seeing is people coming in who are already radicalized and then preying on vulnerable inmates mm -hmm. to increase the levels of radicalization. And the suggestion has been made, can we put people who are already convicted of these terrorist crimes in a separate unit to not increase the spread of radicalization? And I think my friend makes a very good point. Thank you for that. I think it's something that we've addressed in this country in previous years with other prisoners. I do recollect even within uh, my tenure we did have special units for those involved in paramilitary uh, units from Northern Ireland. But it is something that's come in, it's something that's deeply specialist, but it will require both those involved in this establishment, but also the prison service, which deals me on to another aspect, which is de-radicalisation programmes. It is difficult, I recognise, in terms of how we check against delivery, or indeed how we ensure that actually they're working or operating, but I do think we need to take steps. But there's one particular point that I would make a special request to the Minister to take on board, which is that there should be the input of prison officers within these courses. At the present moment, my understanding that their input is very limited, indeed almost nil. They are outsourced and brought in, and that's understandable. People have specialist resources that were mentioned at Nimans. But let's also recommend and understand that prison officers have remarkable skills. They are able to see who is pulling the wool over their eyes. They might not be trained in this or qualified in that, but they know psychology and individuals within the prison institution. They can tell you who's going through, in the main, because nobody can fundamentally always get it right. But these officers have huge skills in being able to say who's actually signing up because they just want to be able to tick the box and be able to satisfy the parole board as it will be or whether they're signing up and actually going through it because they believe in it, because they don't just engage with them on that course. They live with them 24-7. They can see who they're interacting with, what their behaviour is. So, as I say, I think that is something where we have been remiss, and I would ask the Minister to take that on board. So, finally, I will draw my remarks to a conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, and simply say we are satisfied with the need for this. We are satisfied with the general principles. We do wish assured that retrospectivity will be addressed, and we do want satisfaction that there will be the resources both within and without provided. If that is done, then no government we accept can give us an absolute categorical assurance that these people will not re-offend, but can at least go back to our constituencies and say to our constituents and our people there that we are doing as much as we can to keep our communities safe. It is a pleasure to call Dr Kieran Mullen to make his maiden speech. Do you speak of this opportunity to make my maiden speech? I'm conscious of the seriousness of this topic as I embark on the traditional features of a maiden speech to start with, but we know the positive community stories I will share are exactly what the terrorists seek to destroy and that this bill seeks to stop them from doing. Yeah. I want to begin by paying tribute to my predecessor, Laura Smith. Laura was a vociferous in her advocacy and, like me, has frontline experience of public services. Before becoming a politician, Laura was a primary school teacher and a private tutor. It's a good thing to have diverse backgrounds and experiences in this place. Crewe and Nantwich is a true melting pot of Northern Britain, and I couldn't possibly do all its diversity justice in this short speech. I represent a large number of villages and parishes, including Haslington, Williston, Worcesterston, Rope, Huff, Basford, Shavington, Bartonley, Weston, Leighton and Wimbury. Just a few. Across the constituency, you can see a whole host of community activities that embed each of these places in my mind. Huff Village will always be best known to me as the home of a monthly charity bingo club set up by village resident Celia Brown. Raising thousands of pounds for charity over the years, I pay tribute to the amazing contribution Celia and her family have made to charity fundraising. Yeah. Williston, 
hosts the annual World Worm Charming Championships, yeah, yeah, yeah. which sees competitors travel from a far, as far afield as New Zealand and Australia. I will ensure that the upcoming reform of the immigration system makes the necessary visas available for those wishing to compete in this important global competition. We have a fun host of fantastic local sports teams, including Crew and Nantwich Rugby Club, that I play for. There is no better way of keeping your feet firmly on the ground than running around on the rugby pitch on a Saturday with teammates and opposition who couldn't care less about me being an MP, as a bruise in my cheek testifies to. <laughs> the second team that I play for have a two-part team motto, the first part of which is win or lose, and the second part contains unparliamentary language I can't repeat in this place. <laughs> But inevitably, the constituency is best known for its two towns of Crewe and Nantwich. Nantwich is a true gem in the Cheshire tourism crown, attracting streams of visitors every year, whether it be to the regular farmers' markets, the famous food festival, or just to enjoy a stroll around the cobbled pavements with a view of St Mary's Church and the beautiful floral displays by Nantwich in Bloom. It's home to Barony Park, championed by friends of Barony Park and their irrepressible cheerleader, Rachel Wright. Crewe is a town with a proud history, and there can be no better example of the kinds of towns this government is pledged to support. Everywhere you look, there are people fighting to make a difference. People like David MacDonald and Margaret Smith working hard to improve Crewe as part of Crew Clean Team. And when the Beechmere residential home burnt down last year, the whole community rallied round. But it faces a declining high street and an ongoing struggle to return once again to the high point of its enormous contribution to our national economy as home to Crew Works, which at one point employed 20,000 people designing and building world famous trains. The site's famous 11 metre tall wall, standing for more than a century, was finally knocked down last year to make way for development. I grudgingly understand why this might have been the right decision, but it serves as a symbol of what we must get right for all of Crew. Yes, let's see progress, as we soon will with the arrival of HS2 and with the town's fund investment. But we must ensure the reward is worth the cost, and losing the war and the legacy it represents has been a blow for many local residents. Bombardier have allowed me to have a brick from that wall. That brick has pride of place in my office to serve as a constant reminder to me of what has passed and what must come next. Why do things like this wall matter to people? They matter because they help us tell a story of our lives and our history. Seven years ago, as a junior doctor, I had the privilege to look after Jan Krasnodepski, a Polish man of quiet dignity, admitted to hospital towards the end of his life. His family were deported from Poland to Russia during the war and were then allowed by Stalin to join the British Army training camps in Persia. <coughs> Jan eventually joined the Polish Army Cadet School in Palestine and, when the British mandate ended, came to Britain. He went on to live a, ri live a rich life, but he had no wife or children. We would sometimes talk in the evenings and he told me of his worry that without children of his own, his life would not be as vividly remembered as it deserved to be. As a gay man, the question of whether I will have children, how I would be remembered, sometimes crossed my mind at the time, so I felt an affinity towards him. We agreed that I would write the story of his life so he could share it with others and ensure it would be remembered, and for a week, after I finished work, I sat with him as he quietly but studiously sketched, out, sketched it out for me. It was the story of two generations, both his and his parents, who lived in a world more precarious than most of us can imagine, and full of hardship but also dignity. What we wrote together was read at his funeral following his death a couple of months after he left hospital. In preparing this speech, I revisited this story, and in it I think we can find some clues as to why, despite the hardship they faced, the upheaval, families like Jan's and the communities they lived in still lived content lives. As I share Jan's words now, they enter Hansard so he can be sure his story is preserved forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jan told me, you can have a happy, fulfilled life as long as you do something that you think is important. When we get home from this place in the evenings, we climb into bed and all the pomp and the ceremony and the expectations on us fall away and we're no different to Jan in his hospital bed, wanting to reflect on his life and feel it had meaning. And our constituents are no different either. Listening to the maiden speeches of many new members, I've been struck by how many have spoken about what we know is increasingly missing from people's lives. It's that sense of how they fit in with this ever-changing, complicated world we live in. People want meaning and a sense of where they belong. We forget too often that that comes in the form of expectations and obligations on us. Delivering on what we must give to others and what is expected of us helps to create our own sense of worth. 
There are no simple solutions to this challenge of people struggling with their identity and place in the world. If you have a low-paid, skilled job, but every week you help run a women's refuge, you can feel important. On the other hand, you can have a high-paid, high-skilled job, but get lost in the world of addiction because what you earn on its own has given you no sense of meaning. You can live on a deprived housing estate surrounded by drug dealing gangs, but feel no temptation to join them because your loving family is all the community that you need. And you can hold enormous talent in your hands, but not feel valued because society has decided that grafting all day for a great wage is not as important or worthy as going to university. Today we are talking about the evils of terrorism, but at the heart of any successful terrorist recruitment campaign are people who have lost that sense of meaning in their own lives, leaving them vulnerable to simple narratives of victimhood and betrayal. We can build infrastructure, we can create jobs, but all of this sits in a vacuum if it isn't part of a broader story of a nation and a community that people feel part of. Of course, I will always believe that it is our families, the very first community we are part of, that can ensure we grow to become part of the wider world of confidence, ambition and a sense of right and wrong. People lacking that foundation need our help most of all. Modern culture holds up as important the people whose stories are being told loudest on radio and television, in newspapers, on Facebook and Instagram. Whether a story is being told by admirers or detractors, we are made to feel it's volume that counts, something that modern terrorist groups understand very well. Let's make sure our constituents feel their story, however quietly told it is, is important. I finish by returning to Jan's words. He reflected, though I have written about some of the more memorable events in my life, I would say most of my enjoyment of life has been from the day-to-day -day involvement in smaller ways with the Polish community. <coughs> Whether it be terrorism, loneliness, addiction, family breakdown, community, belonging and importance are where we need to start if we really want to level up this country. Whether it be community bingo clubs, world worm charming championships, parks groups, litter pit groups or rugby teams, Many people have forgotten their community right outside their door is where they will find that fulfilment. Belonging, fulfilment, belonging, a sense of importance. Let's work hard in this place to remind them of that, to ensure our society is one in which no terrorist ideology will ever find home. Yeah. Yeah. Yvette Cooper. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I start by congratulating the Honourable Member for Crewe and Nantwich? on such a thoughtful and beautiful speech and for his to give his maiden speech in that spirit I think uh, shows I'm sure the way in which he will work hard for his constituents to tell the stories not just of the two towns but of the people within the towns that he represents and also the search for meaning and the search for purpose in politics and I really must congratulate him on such a, a poignant and powerful maiden speech. Yay. Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise to support this legislation and the purpose behind this bill is the right one, to make sure that those convicted of terrorist offences are not released early without parole board assessment uh, of whether they still pose a danger to the public. In the last few months, we have seen those two awful terror attacks, one on London Bridge, one on Stretta, in Streatham, and all of our hearts will go out to those who were killed or hurt, but also to their families and those who were there and witnessed the awful events as well. We owe thanks and tributes to brave members of the public as well as to the police, security service and emergency services, but also to those like Jack Merritt and Saskia Jones, who worked so hard on the re rehabilitation of com offenders in the community, who work that every day helps keep others safe and who tragically lost their lives in that yeah. attack. And I agree with both the Lord Chancellor and my right honourable friend, my honourable friend on the front bench, that we should come together on this because terrorists seek to undermine our way of life and to divide us, and we cannot let them so do. We face terrorist and extremist attacks for many years in this country. 
We have seen an increase in Islamist extremism. We have seen an increase more recently in far-right extremism. And also changing patterns of those threats, including an increase in loan attacks by those who have been radicalised either online or in prison. And those attacks from extremists of all sides in pursuit of poisonous ideologies People are hoping not just to hurt and harm us, but to provoke fear and reaction that they can further feed upon. And so it is a sign of our strength and resilience as a country that most people have always been determined to come together in the face of that extremism and such attacks and not to let them divide us. So the Streatham attack does highlight a problem. The police, the courts, the security service, the prisons, rehabilitation and prevention services and affected communities all need our support and also government support to keep communities safe. And that is why this bill is justified and needed. When someone has been convicted of terrorism and when they are still dangerous to the public, they should not be released early from prison. And that means before they are released, they have to be subjected to a proper parole board assessment on whether they still pose a threat. And the seriousness of the terror events is the dangers from radicalisation mean that the police often rightly intervene before an appalling attack takes place and charge people for preparatory offences. But in some of those cases, they know, the security services know, the courts and the prisons and probation service are all aware that they are dealing with people who are capable of something even more serious. Now, I understand people have raised concerns about applying these rules to those currently serving their sentences, and I accept the government's legal advice on the fact that this does not change the length of the sentence. And we have always had administrative rules about the way in which sentences are served. For example, for the bit of the sentence that is served in the community, people are out on licence. If those licence terms are breached, people can be returned to prison to continue their sentence in custody again. So that concept of risk is built in to the criminal justice system, to the system of custody and to the system of sentencing that we have and has always been. So. so that is why I think it is right that the, prevent the Parole Board should be able to assess the risk in these cases, just as they do in many other cases. It is sensible and proportionate. And I have raised already with the Ministers, it is important that this legislation is drawn up in a way that is robust and is uh, uh, robust against legal challenge, particularly to ensure that that Parole Board assessment can take place. And I agree again with both the Lord Chancellor and the, uh, my honourable friend, the, the Shadow Minister, that we can always make sure that we can both keep our communities safe and do what is right to do so, and also do so in a way that defends those British values of the rule of law, yeah, yeah. of uh, supporting the uh, European Convention on Human Rights, and all the very things that terrorists, in fact, try to undermine and uh, to threaten. I also accept the need to do this as emergency legislation and accept the warnings from the government that they have other individuals that they are concerned about, that the police and security services are concerned about, who might otherwise be released without patrol as parole assessment and who they believe are a danger to the public and who we should not be allowing to be released early without any kind of assessment in place. But it is right to raise a concern that this is not an ideal situation to be making legislation, to be conducting this kind of legislation in a day. It is right that we do so in these circumstances, but the government must also recognise that this is not the ideal circumstances and to rush through legislation in a breathless way and, to be honest, Actually, there have been many warnings that this was coming down the track. The government has known about the problem for some time. The Home Affairs Committee took evidence from Neil Basu in October 2018 during the course, in fact, of consideration of the counter-terrorism and border security bill at that time, and he told us the point that some of our radicalisers are getting short sentences, coming out early and being able to continue is a problem as is not having sufficient resources in place to use desistance or disengagement programmes. With my... Oh, we'll give way to my friend.
Uh, I mean, I, I support the legislation as well, but I agree with my honourable friend. This feels a bit like sticking plaster. And isn't the danger that the unanswered questions are what happens to the people who we keep in prison longer, the issue that's been raised? Unless there's effective intervention there, <laughs> what's happening? And what confidence can we have that MAPA Level 2 and 3 are stringently managed and enforced? Because surely that is always the issue that's got to be addressed when they come out. I think my um, honourable friend is exactly right. And there is a danger that we're simply reacting this to this in a hand-to-mouth way rather than uh, in a more strategic way that recognises some of the underlying issues that need to be dealt with over a long term, where there may need to be further legislation, but that should be done in a thoughtful yes. way with proper scrutiny and not left until the last minute and as a result done in a breathless rush. So I would agree. I would just add that the MAPA review is exactly that opportunity. So yes, we need to see this emergency legislation go through, but actually it's by reviewing the MAPA process that we will see results. Because actually one of the most crucial changes that I would like to see to the MAPA process is we need prevent coordinators in MAPA meetings. Because it's prevent coordinators who can understand that someone newly released has come to their community and go, that individual is still a threat for the following reasons. I can map this individual against the communities and groups that they might be a risk to. So yes, the emergency legislation is important because, for example, if we'd had this legislation, Andrew and Chowder would still be in prison. But actually, the crucial change is to map her and make sure prevent coordinators know where Andrew and Chowder has gone and can therefore have relevance and analysis of what he will do there. So I completely agree with the, the Honourable Member's point. I think having that link between prevent programmes and the, uh, the MAPA process, uh, I think, uh, is extremely important. I think it, there is a, a question here for the Government, actually, about how the MAPA review and the prevent review are going to link together. And there is a problem at the moment. We obviously don't have a chair in place for the prevent review, and I'm not sure at the moment what the Government's plans are for the timetable of these two different reviews. It might be very helpful, in fact, if the Minister were able to say something uh, in his wind-up speech at the end about how those two reviews will, will interact, how the Prevent review will be we put really back on track with somebody in place, because it seems to me, I agree, I think the issues around what happens before a, a terrorist incident happens, before a crime is committed, as well as what happens afterwards, whether it be in the prison or probation or in the assessment afterwards, those things need to be properly integrated. And the expertise that there is in different parts of uh, the, the system need to be pulled together and, and need to be effectively coordinated. Uh, so, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the, the point I've made that we have known for some time that uh, someone like uh, Suresh Aman was due to be released this January, for example. And so we do have to have a more effective system to anticipate challenges from the legislation because there have been other opportunities to change this legislation previously. Um, Madam Speaker, we also need to address what happens at the end of the sentence because my uh, honourable friend is right to describe this as a, a sticking plaster if we're not also looking more widely. These individuals and these individuals where the parole board uh, decides that actually somebody still does pose a serious risk, they will then still, however, have served their time after, say, another couple of years and still, if they at that point pose a threat to the community, to the public, we still will not have addressed the heart of the problem. If they are sufficiently dangerous to end up serving their whole sentence in custody, then the former reviewer of uh, uh, terrorism, Lord Anderson, has pointed out that in those circumstances they will not, at the end of their sentence, then have any further licensing conditions attached or be subject to further supervision. In the past we had control orders and we also had IPPs to address these circumstances. The Minister will know that I opposed the removal of control orders and we have had debates in this House as well about the decision to end rather than just to reform the IPPs. But in their absence, 
The question for the government is, where, are the existing arrangements with TPIMS, for example, sufficient to address the circumstances for individuals potentially coming out at the end of their sentence, having served the full sentence in custody, where there are no licence conditions in those circumstances to be attached? And does the government have plans to address those individuals, should they still prove to be a dangerous and a risk as well? Thirdly, of course, Madam Deputy Speaker, there is, a, there is a massive problem about what is happening in our prisons. And uh, the, um, my colleague, the uh, chair of the Justice Select Committee, has raised this already. We don't yet have effective enough de radicalisation programmes in prison. Yeah. Former public prosecutors, senior prosecutors, have warned that they have been underfunded. Academics point out that some prisoners who are willing to go on de radicalisation programmes wait so long to get on them that they are released before they are able to do so. There are, of course, concerns about the effectiveness and the assessments of de-radicalisation programmes and about the interaction between programmes that may work in the community but may not in the same circumstances in prison and about the, the best way to do this. And nobody should ever pretend that this is easy or that there is a magical response that could solve these problems. However, I think there are real concerns that we are not doing everything that we could in prison at the moment. The concerns raised by Ian Aitchison, who conducted an independent review of Islamist extremism in the prisons and probation service, are really serious. And when he describes, he says, frontline prison staff were ill-equipped to handle it. Prison imams didn't have the tools or the will to tackle extreme ideology. The intelligence gathering system wasn't working. There were serious problems of lack of leadership and management, lack of end-to-end -end systems to deal with this, frankly, the prisons struggling to cope. Now, I heard what the Lord Chancellor said about things having moved on since then, but there is a real problem that we, we can't judge whether that is right or not, because at the moment the government has actually had refused to publish the entire Aitchison report, and I understand there are sensitivities around radicalisation, but if even Ian Aitchison is not able to say, actually, yes, all of the problems are being addressed, when we know still we have continued reports of people being further radicalised in prison. So not simply cases where de-radicalisation fails, but where in fact there is greater radicalisation and people who go in not re radicalised end up being perhaps converted not just to Islam but to uh, extreme perversions of a religion which are in fact an ideology and not uh, a religion where we have cases of people ending up where, for example, there was a sentence of a, um, uh, one Wigan man who was sentenced for far-right extremism, where the judge concluded that actually this person would be vulnerable to further radicalisation and chose not to give them a prison sentence on that basis. So if we have our courts reluctant to give prison sentences because they fear greater radicalisation, we are in a very uneasy situation where the prison system that is supposed to be keeping us safe and keeping communities safe from extremism and from terrorist threats instead may be contributing to the problem and may be in some cases making matters worse. Now, I don't doubt the huge commitment that there is and the huge hard work that there is across our prison system and for many people involved in this to try and tackle radicalisation and extremism. However, the evidence that we have seen from the outside is that the system simply is not working and that it is not enough for the Lord Chancellor to simply give us his word that things have improved if there isn't any proper system of oversight or proper system of checks and balances to be sure that progress is being made. And I really would urge the Lord Chancellor and the Minister to talk with the Justice Select Committee about what more could be done to ensure that there is proper oversight to be sure that we are making progress about what is happening happening in prisons and also what happens outside of prisons as well. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, all of us, I think, have a shared interest across this House in ensuring that extremists and terrorists are not able to threaten our way of life, to put people's lives at risk to threaten our communities and our democracy. 
And I think this is an area where there has often been cross-party consensus on the need to take a sensible approach to ensure that we can both protect people's safety and also protect the, the values that terrorists challenge, the values of the rule of law uh, and our democratic institutions. And that we need to do so by challenging the ideology as well as by working ever harder to make sure the systems that are supposed to address this can properly do so. And I think it is therefore not a surprise that we have a cross-party consensus in support of this legislation today, which I think is a sensible and proportionate response to keep people safe, to address a genuine problem that we face and where the criminal system does have to adjust and to adapt. But I think it is also imperative on all of us to work further cross-party to address some of the deeper, longer-term problems that are simply not working and where the government does need to do more. And I hope we'll be able to work cross-party on how we address those longer-term challenges so that we can do a better job of keeping yeah. us safe. Yeah. It's William Cash. Much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I very much follow the line that's just been taken by uh, the Right Honourable Lady, the Member for Normanton and Pontefract in Castleford, uh, in terms of the cross party consensus that's needed in relation to getting this bill through. Um, I have also to say, however, that I am concerned about, as I've already indicated in a number of interventions, um, the restrictive um, and the restricted nature of this particular piece of legislation um, in one respect, which is that I think that we uh, should actually hopefully get the um, Justice Committee uh, to look at the longer term uh, issues that are raised by the incidents and the murders that have taken place and the terrorist offences that have been involved. And I, I, I entirely understand why this bill is brought in and I support it and uh, I'm glad that the House as a whole has clearly indicated the same. But I do think that we really have to take seriously the problems which are deeply entrenched in parts of our society which are going to continue and are not going to change just because this piece of legislation has been put through on a correctly emergency footing. It has a limited effect, and I think there is a need for a longer-term assessment of the uh, real problems which underpin the reasons for the bill. And um, I would also add that um, I mentioned uh, in response to uh, my honourable friend, the member for New Forest, um, the questions <coughs> relating to the state of mind of some of the people concerned and the question of whether, in fact, in certain cases, this is in evidence of some degree of insanity or a drug-affected mind or a mentally disturbed mind on such a scale as to impinge the uh, question of mens rea, which does in its own ter time, and we haven't got time to go into all this this afternoon, but it's the reason I want this longer-term assessment, that actually places such as Broadmoor um, and other similar uh, secure places um, are where some people um, from whatever part of society have had to be confined because of the nature of their uh, uh, mental state. So I put that on the record uh, as, a, as a suggestion which I think needs to be taken up by the Justice Committee and indeed by any other committees. Um, the other aspect of it which I uh, also made an intervention um, is not only that I think that the issue of automatic early release in this bill um, in, and in respect of the necessity to have the agreement of the parole board doesn't answer for me the question why should it uh, be restricted uh, in respect of the, of the half of the sentence as compared to two thirds. I don't actually see in the circumstances where we're dealing with public safety and human life why two-thirds should be chosen as a boundary line. Um, and uh, it, there are circumstances in where I believe, uh, that in very severe cases, um, the, the, there should be um, any release at all uh, for the reasons that I've already touched on in relation to the instability of mind of certain people. Would there a gentleman give away that point? Oh. 
Would he agree with me that terrorists are traitors? They have declared this country their enemy. They have declared you and I and civilians as legitimate targets to be murdered and slaughtered in our streets. And therefore, I agree with you entirely. It, there should be at least a full sentence, and we should be looking at far longer sentences than just 14 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my, my old friend is actually touching on a point which I raised uh, several years ago, um, shortly after the murder, the infamous murder, the terrible murder of Lee Rigby. And I said in the House, uh, with respect to the question of uh, persons who will be returned to this country from uh, ISIS, uh, that as far as I was concerned, um, the issue of uh, their return should be evaluated in accordance with a convention which specifically makes it clear, that's Article 8 of, of uh, the Convention on Terrorism, that if a person makes an allegiance to another country and yeah. the caliphate in this context could be regarded as such, then although this is completely controversial, I accept, but nonetheless is already made applicable, for example, I think in the United States, Article 8 of that convention says that a person can be made stateless. Because if the person in question is engaged in giving allegiance to another country, by definition, they've moved into the zone of treason, they have abdicated deliberately and voluntarily their allegiance to this country. Yeah. And I put that on the record because I come back to the fact that despite my attempts to get that bill amended at that point in time, it was the counter-terrorism bill about four years ago, I do really believe that um, uh, we have to take the, these matters extremely seriously. Yeah. And it's not just uh, external activities, it's internal as well within our domestic law. So I do think that we need to take this incredibly seriously, which is why I'm appealing during the course of this debate uh, for this longer term assessment of all these questions, including the one my honourable friend um, has raised, because I think it's so important and can't just be put into a category of, of uh, rather extravagant thinking. Mm. It's really serious. As I said earlier, human life is more important and public safety is really more important, much more important than the question of whether or not the courts may or may not interpret a particular provision in a particular way in, in uh, what might be described as, as a more fashionable um, a ju judicial interpretation uh, than we ought to really expect of our courts. Um, in fact, I go further and say that human life is more important than the legal interpretation of human rights, which is why I've tabled some amendments uh, to this bill. Um, I can imagine when we get to the committee stage, it's going to be pretty truncated, so I'm not actually going to um, go into it in the committee stage in the detail that I will now. But as this is a second reading issue and a matter of principle, I do believe that we should include uh, in the bill in Clause 1 um, the um, exclusion of the Human Rights Act 19, 1998. Uh, I have something of a history in this respect, but then so does the Foreign Secretary. Um, and those of us who, and, and others such as the very distinguished uh, Martin Howard QC, and there are many others, um, we were regarded as highly um, unfashionable some years ago, but I think that issues of the kind that gravitate around this bill um, have drawn attention to the fact that we have to take these matters really seriously. And um, I understand the Bingham Centre have made a number of representations on this, and there are some quite clear, clear indications that there are, dis that there are lawyers of some notoriety, if not distinction, uh, if I can make that distinction, um, who will be seeking to try to overturn the provisions of this bill um, by going to the courts, uh, and I deplore the fact that they would seek to do so. I do also, however, need to say that I'm looking forward uh, to the discussion that takes place in the House of Lords on this particular matter, because there are some very distinguished lawyers on all sides of this debate in the House of Lords who 
with the greatest respect to all of us here in the House of Commons, have been practising at the bar and have been in the Supreme Court and so on and so forth, who will be able to bring to bear the degree of analysis of the case law, uh, which I think does need to be looked at very, very carefully in this context. I certainly give way. Um, my friend, of course, as ever, is making a compelling case, and I just suggest to him, and I wonder what he thinks, whether this requires a more fundamental review of the characteristic and extent of rights, and how rights relate to citizenship and duty and responsibility and the public good. That is an extremely important point. Um, as my honourable friend uh, knows, I have the greatest respect for his analysis when it moves just not, not just from the law but into the broader societal and philosophical questions which ought to inform opinions which are made in this House and not just treat them as if somehow or other issues of this kind are merely matters of semantics. We are here dealing with the kind of society that we want and the impact of the terrorism and the murderous and the dangerous behaviour of the uh, perpetrators um, of, of these crimes um, have on our own constituents. And in fact, of course, the most recent case uh, was uh, somebody who actually travelled from Stafford uh, down to uh, yeah. London and, and therefore is a matter of uh, immediate uh, concern to my constituents as well because he'd been living there for some time and uh, the whole of the manner in which he was allowed to um, leave uh, uh, and come down to, to London and uh, commit the murder in question um, in uh, uh, Fishmongers Hall um, is at, and around in the vicinity uh, is, 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 a, is a lesson for us all. Um, I, I now want to turn more, gen more particularly to the question of the um, retrospectivity element of this, which ties in with my general concern that we really do tie this down in the longer term, because it seems to me that... Um, and my honourable friend, member, the, mem the mem member for um, Be 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 Beckenham, Beckenham, I think it was, the, 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 the um, committee chairman of the Justice Committee, and I had an exchange on, on a number of cases. And I, I'm well aware that this is not the place for us to attempt uh, to make an assumption that we were able to treat this House as if it's a, uh, a chamber as a, as a court of law. Uh, although we are, of course, the High Court of Parliament, but that is, is to miss the point. The real fact is that the proper analysis of the case law has to be conducted, and I know that some of that has already been done in blogging and in some pamphlets, and uh, indeed I'm expecting the House of Lords to home in on this pretty effectively when it gets to that House, but they won't have much time. So... We know that the ministers have been warned that there is the likelihood of a legal battle, um, as the terrorist bill may be deemed, uh, despite the, the uh, assertions of the government, and I happen to be, for reasons I'll explain, um, sympathetic to their view, mm -hmm. that the bill uh, that is compatible with Article 7 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Yes, yes. But there are those who will argue that it is not, and I can see this coming, and um, I, 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 my amendment would remove altogether, in my opinion, any chance that there could be the kind of legal battle in relation to the question of the applicability of the Human Rights Act to this bill. Because my amendment would say, notwithstanding the Human Rights Act 1998, this is belt and braces. That is the point that I'm seeking. And I'm not going to move this amendment when I get to the committee stage in the, with any intention of dividing the House on it. I think this needs to have further consideration outside this House, and I look to the House of Lords, for example, for some indication of their views about this as well. Basically, my argument goes like this. The terrorist bill, that's this bill, is compatible with Article 7. Um, the Article 7 reads, and I'll just read it out, no one's done so so far, but let me have a go, quote, no one shall be held guilty of a criminal offence for conduct which did not constitute an offence at the time when it was committed. 
This bill does not purport, in my judgment, to create a new criminal offence. Rather, it seeks to prevent terrorists convicted by UK courts on the basis of offences that existed prior to the bill from automatic early release. I've already made my point about the length of time and indicated. And furthermore, the explanatory notes of this bill say, quote, the bill does not retrospectively alter a serving offender's sentence as imposed by the court or alter the maximum penalties for offences. It is concerned with the administration of sentences. But I'm afraid that that is where I still believe <laughs> Despite the, the exchanges I had with the, just, with the secretary, the, with the uh, chairman of the justice committee, that the uh, uh, Del Rio Prada case could well still come into play, and uh, I, I fear that it might be used effectively against this bill. Um, so my conclusion on the question of a textual interpretation of Article 7 of the ECHR indicates for me that it is not incompatible with the terrorist bill. However, Parliament does have the power to the, the, the Parliament does have the power to legislate retrospectively. Um, I, I just want to um, uh, let the honourable gentleman uh, know that um, I'm sure he will have the opportunity during committee stage to address his amendment and obviously I'm sure he'll be aware that there are quite a few spe uh, speakers in the second reading debate now but I just want to give him some assurance that he will be able to address his amendment during the committee stage. Than that, but I'm also anticipating there may be a bit of a, a, a need to, for brevity at that point. That's the way these things go from my experience, which goes back, which goes back some time. I am talking about matters of principle. I am talking, I repeat, about matters of principle. As established by Wills J and Phillips v. Eyre, courts only ascribe retrospective force to new laws affecting rights if, by, and I quote, express words or necessary implication, it appears that such was the intention of the legislature. Clause 1 of this bill amends the Criminal Justice Act 2003 and expressly restricts el eligibility for release of prisoners who have been sentenced of a of terrorist offence, quote, whether before or after the bill comes into force. So my conclusion on this point is simple. The courts would be expected to give retrospective effect to this bill. But I am concerned, and this is the principle I want to address, that actually the courts have a disinclination and a reluctance to give effect to uh, retrospective legislation, particularly when it deals with, words, with, with criminal acts. That is well established, and I quote Brett Bradley and Ewing, uh, I think I can give the date, page 56, which, which explains that. So although I don't think that Article 7 does apply to the bill, for the purposes of legislative clarity and ensuring the courts don't find a way around this, uh, or a misguided interpretation which would frustrate the real purpose of the bill, I am going to bring forward in the committee stage, I will bring forward in the committee stage my amendment for the purposes of legislative clarity and for the avoidance of doubt in relation to the power of Parliament to legislate retrospectively. That is the principle I am addressing at this moment and I therefore say, and I have no further comment to make for the purposes of this debate, that I do believe that this matter has to be taken seriously and that the wording which I'm intending to introduce when I get to the committee stage will be taken as such, which is a serious attempt to make sure that there is no way round found by the courts or by some ingenious lawyers who will actually avoid and frustrate the purposes of this bill as expressed in the second reading of, and the principle of this bill which we are now debating. Gavin Robinson. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for Stone. Um, he referred in his remarks, Madam Deputy Speaker, to notorious rather than perhaps remarkable uh, lawyers. Um, that is not he. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to follow from him. And of course, he will know that having raised the considerations 
around his amendment in this House, and should it ever reach uh, the Court for adjudication, having served us with notice uh, that the wording he proposes in, in his amendment should have been in it, uh, the Courts may be even more inclined to accept the argument, knowing that Parliament was fully appraised of the considerations and had the opportunity so to heed uh, the advice. That said, uh, I understand and I think it was uh, pragmatic uh, of the Honourable Member to indicate that whilst he may move uh, his amendment, he may not force it in this House, but hope it is considered uh, in another place. Madam Deputy Speaker, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this debate, and I think it has been incredibly positive uh, so far. It is a serious issue uh, that we have been considering, um, but I think every member uh, of the House who has spoken in this debate so far has done so uh, with a determination in recognition of the difficulties that we have faced as a society through terrorism, as to how appropriate it is that we respond pragmatically, sensibly and swiftly uh, that this debate is adding to the response um, that we as a parliament should bring. And I think it was of benefit to hear from the uh, member for East Lothian, uh, if I can mention him specifically, uh, someone who is new to this House, but somebody who has uh, incredible knowledge uh, of parliamentary approach to early release. Uh, and he did not make reference to any individual cases uh, in his own remarks, but members should know that uh, the member for East Lothian has been through the political, the practical, the public and the moral rigours uh, of, release, uh, of early release uh, for those engaged uh, with terrorist defences, and I think uh, we benefited from his insight. Madam Deputy Speaker, there has been reference made already in this debate to the contributions from the former, uh, former uh, reviewers of terrorism and terrorist legislation, Lord Anderson and uh, Lord Carlyle. Lord Carlyle has indicated that he believes uh, that this bill will be subject to legal challenge. Of course, that may be right. And I don't think that's something that this House should ultimately fear. It is appropriate that where people feel there is a, an incompatibility with the European Convention on Human Rights that they get the opportunity to challenge this measure in the courts. But I have to say the Lord Chancellor expertly has taken this House through all of the implications as to whether Article 7 uh, is engaged or not. It is surely engaged, but not to a fundamentally flawed way. I think it is fair for us to say that, yes, there are considerations that we have discussed this afternoon and that will be discussed in the other place uh, and in uh, the courts. But ultimately, I believe uh, that this bill is the right approach um, for our Parliament to take. The Honourable Lady for uh, Normanton, Pontefract and Castleford, I think, um, I think rightly uh, referred to the comments of Lord Anderson. Um, and Lord Anderson QC who was, I think, entirely appropriate to say that should this process through this bill exhaust the opportunity for licence and compliance and control within the public sector, within society at large, that is a missed opportunity and that is something that we need to be alive to in this debate. Uh, and I think the Lord Chancellor um, nodded to this point when he uh, was considering TPIM uh, and protective measures that uh, have been there in place that could be uh, put to good use. But licensing and rehabilitation are important parts of the criminal justice uh, process. And so retention of someone in custody without giving the opportunity under control, uh, I think, is something that we should consider and recognise that if somebody spends the entirety of their sentence in custody without any control upon release, that places an even bigger burden on our security services when there are other aspects uh, of the criminal justice system in this country that should be more appropriately engaged in monitoring and surveying and ensuring compliance and ensuring the rehabilitation uh, of offenders who have been brought before the courts um, previously. Madam Deputy Speaker, one point that I, I, I do need to make uh, as a representative um, from Northern Ireland uh, is to focus on the fact that this bill does not apply to our jurisdiction. And the Lord Chancellor did proffer a view uh, that the way, I think, to fairly reflect the comments that he made, the way in which we calculate uh, sentences in Northern Ireland means that 
where this bill does not engage fundamentally uh, injuriously Article 7 considerations in England and Wales or Scotland, it would in Northern Ireland. And I say to the Minister, I would be very keen to explore that in greater detail uh, in, uh, in another place. I do not think it would be important or appropriate to do that uh, this afternoon on the floor of the House, but I do think that that is worthy uh, of further uh, interrogation. I am not sure, and I do not challenge what the Lord Chancellor said uh, on the floor, believing what he said to be true, but I am not sure what was indicated is right, nor indeed do I believe uh, that it is the totality uh, of the issues that may have been under consideration in connection with this bill and its application uh, to Northern Ireland. And I say that, Madam Deputy Speaker, as somebody who stands here and has contributed to many debates uh, around terrorism, who lamented the fact that the counter-extremism strategy was brought forward uh, in this place and similarly did not apply uh, to Northern Ireland. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, you know the history that we have had both of terrorism uh, and extremism. I have made the point in this chamber before that as a Member of Parliament for four and a half years, I have seen a member of my own constituency murdered by the provisional IRA, an organisation that uh, most in this chamber would believe uh, do not exist anymore. I have had a prison officer in my constituency murdered by dissident Republicans through an undercar booby trap bomb, and I have had a father uh, January last year uh, murdered by loyalist paramilitaries in my constituency. So it was three and a half, four and a half years, we've had three individual murders by three different paramilitary terrorist organisations at a time of peace, Madam Deputy Speaker. So it does jar whenever we lend our weight and give our support um, to counter-terrorism measures in this place uh, that we are not uh, incorporated. Members uh, who have an interest in Northern Ireland Affairs will be aware that uh, the political process and the Good Friday Agreement led to the early release of terrorist prisoners uh, in Northern Ireland. And there were two protections. Everyone was released uh, on licence and legislative provision was made uh, for those licences to be revoked uh, if it was the view of the Secretary of State uh, that they had engaged in activity that was uh, leaning toward uh, paramilitary or terrorist uh, activity um, yet again. The Northern Ireland Sentences Act 1998 and the Life Sentences Northern Ireland Order 2001. And in preparation, Madam Deputy Speaker, for the introduction of this bill, I tabled questions to the Northern Ireland Office to ask well, just how many people who had been jailed in Northern Ireland as a result of the terrorist activity had been released and then their licence subsequently revoked because of their activity. One answer in the Northern Ireland Sentences Act was that two licences have been revoked since 1998. But I got the most obtuse answer back on those who had licences revoked under the Life Sentences Northern Ireland Order. And when you're trying to paint a picture, Madam Deputy Speaker, and you're trying to do research to understand where we have had experience of this in the past and where people have been released for altogether different political reasons and political settlement but have had licences revoked because they have re-engaged in terrorist activity, it's important that this House uh, has those figures. And the answer from 2001 to 2020 was that devolution of policing and justice was devolved in 2010. It tells us nothing, Madam Deputy Speaker. I think it's entirely discourteous uh, both uh, to me as a Member of Parliament seeking that information and to uh, this House. It does not answer the question about 2001 to 2010, and secondly, it does not answer the question about those revoked under national security considerations, information that I think would have been appropriate and important for the passage of this Bill. Of course, I'll give way. I am very interested indeed in what the Honourable Gentleman is saying. I just wondered if, in fact, um, there are steps being taken to raise the matters, not only obviously as he is doing here in Westminster, but also now in Stormont. Is that something which is now under consideration in the context of this bill? I think it is a very fair question to ask. Uh, the first thing is that when national security considerations are engaged and it relates to terrorism, um, the devolved instru uh, institutions at Stormont do not have a role. That remains the competence of the Secretary of State um, for Northern Ireland. But there are issues that I want to pursue, and I hope the Minister will give a commitment uh, that we can have a discussion about um, Article 7 and how it is engaged differently in a way that makes this bill incompatible with the European Convention on Human Rights, though it does not in England. <coughs> Uh, Scotland or Wales. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, I think you know uh, our position 
when it comes to legislation that is about protecting society and curtailing the uh, excesses of those that want to frustrate everything we value in the United Kingdom, the positive values and principles that we hold dear in this Parliament uh, and in this place, uh, we will be supporting uh, this legislation. I am very grateful for the opportunity to make those ancillary comments about Northern Ireland uh, that I hope added to the overall context of this debate. John Hayes. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Except for love infused by hope, fear is the most vivid of emotions. Love is perhaps more easily remembered, but fear is more easily envisaged, because fear in itself is the imagining of the horror that might happen, which is why provoking fear has been the instrument of bullies, thugs, despots and torturers through the ages. To terrorise, to hurt, harm, maim and murder is designed to intimidate through fear each and all of us and to undermine the certainty of order which underpins social solidarity. Today, the provisions we debate are designed to revisit the means of re-establishing order and so reassure the wicked that the wicked won't succeed. The Secretary of State described in his opening remarks the metamorphosis of terrorism, the fact that it is constantly changing and so becoming harder to counter. There are obvious changes, the uh, adaptability, the flexibility of terrorists, the instruments used uh, to terrorise are altering. Uh, the spontaneity of terrorism is altering too. And the business of the security service and the police and the legislation that underpins their business must be just as flexible, must adapt to meet that changing character of terrorism. The security service and the police, as I learned when I was the security minister, constantly re refine what they do to anticipate and counter fanaticism. But early release is bound to undermine their morale, as well as to stretch their capacity. Uh, the numbers of subjects of interest, leaving aside those that have been released from prison early, already present an extraordinary challenge to our security services and police, as we know from uh, various debates we've had here, uh, various reports into this matter, which time prevents me from going into detail about. Simultaneously, public faith in the rule of law is critical, and I suspect that most of our constituents would be amazed that we have released so many terrorist convicts early. I, I, I think they would regard that with disbelief, um, that we have allowed the formulaic leniency to characterise the treatment of convicted terrorists is, as I said, extraordinary, and in my judgment, unacceptable. And it's not as if there haven't been warnings, as the Honourable Lady from uh, Normanton, Pontefract and Castle said. 2018 uh, signals were sent uh, that this would have uh, the kind of consequences that we've now met with horror. So um, uh, the Government are acting in response, and they're acting decisively, and they're acting to reinforce the legislative powers necessary to allow the police and the security services to protect the public. Public safety, as has been said repeatedly in this debate so far, is the heart of this business. Uh, the enhanced role for parole boards will, as has been said by the Chairman of the Justice Committee, require uh, greater expertise, I suspect. Uh, the measurement of risk will also change as the character of terrorism and a response to it changes. We need to be able to assess risk, as we always have in respect of early release. Of course it's true uh, that parole is about measurement of risk. It always has been. But it also is rooted in the idea that someone who is going to be released early deserves to be released, as well as not uh, creating um, uh, further harm and danger. So um, uh, the rehabilitative aspect of criminal justice is accepted, I think, across the chamber. But the retributive aspect of justice should be accepted too. This is as well about punishment, about punishing guilty people that have, through due process, been found to do the most awful, the most horrendous of things. And we shouldn't be ashamed to, to say that. I was pleased uh, 
I am proud, as Security Minister, to guide the investigatory powers bill through the House, as you know, Madam Deputy Speaker. And that bill uh, struck a balance between the protection of the public and the necessary safeguards that always should be applied when we are limiting people's freedoms. Uh, we uh, maintaining the tenets of a free society and defending those very freedoms from the anarchy of fear and disorder. Since uh, that time, many people have been released early, and it is perhaps worth, before I come to the conclusion of my remarks, I am anxious that others are allowed to contribute uh, by being brief, to look at the numbers. Uh, I uh, consulted the House of Honours Library, as good members of this House do, uh, and I was surprised and disappointed to find uh, that since 2013, something like 163 uh, convicted terrorists have been released early. Uh, and those, by the way, I excluded from my considerations anyone who had been serving a sentence of less than a year. Those are just people serving a sentence of uh, somewhere between uh, 12 months and more than four years. So, leaving aside the short sentences, the more serious terrorist prisoners uh, have been released in significant numbers. Just imagine the effect on our security service of police of having to deal with the possible consequences of those releases. Some uh, of the people released will have been rehabilitated, will have been de-radicalised, but we know that that is not always the case. And so I strongly support this legislation. It does indeed strike that balanced. Ordered societies are built on the protection and promotion of shared public interest, the defence of the common good. To face down terrorism and the fear it spawns and face up to our responsibilities to protect the people we serve, we should support this legislation as it progresses through the House. And it may be necessary in doing so to challenge those who seek to undermine it on the ground of the advocacy of the rights of those concerned. Uh, I anticipate there will be those challenges, and we must stand together as a House of Commons to defend the common good and promote the national interest. Khalid Mahmood. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Always the privilege to follow the member from, for for South Island Deepings, uh, and particularly in his time as a security minister, I was privileged to be able to work with him. Again, which is demonstrated in the speech today. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to uh, share my thoughts at the moment with the victims uh, of all the terrorist, terrorist attacks and their families and the hardship they've all gone through. And I think it's important for us at this time, during this debate, but at any debate in relation to this, that we remember those people who have suffered uh, incredibly uh, because of the failures of us as parliamentarians and legislation that we provide and the cover and support we provide for those people. I think it's important that we do that. This issue here is about two things. It's about resources into our prison service, but also what's the soft power behind that that we need to put correct. It is not just good enough to say that we're going to extend further for a period of time the sentence that they have unless we put right what's behind it. And I think that really is the issue that I, that I want to concentrate on. Of course, we want to look at the number of prison officers that are there, the support that they get. As my honourable friend uh, on the front bench has already said, quite rightly, it's very important to ensure that we have the right corrective controls within the prison framework to be able to do that. Uh, and at the moment, we are failing in that. And I think we need to get that right and get that resourced properly and be able to move forward. It's important. A lot, of, a lot of members have spoken about the issues of imams coming into mosques. The issue is twofold here. One, in terms of psychotherapy and counselling for those people, but also in order to be able to tackle their misguided version of Islam. These people do not practice Islam. These people uh, practice what they believe to be Islam. Islam in itself is a peaceful religion. I'll give one. 
To my friend for giving way on that, as an RE teacher, I can assure him and want to sort of concur with his viewpoints that in no way do the uh, radical views of a minority, and a small minority in that, reflect the views of Islam. I think it's very important, I'm glad the member's raising it, that we ensure that that never comes across in anything that we see or hear in our national media and in our national debates. I thank the thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for, for his contribution. The issue is that when we get these people, how do we assess them and how do we work with them? A lot of issues have been made of de-radicalisation. But to do that, we need to have the right people to do that. Theologically, we do not have a principal education facility available to train those imams to go in. I had a friend at HM Birmingham, HMP Birmingham, uh, who was a deputy governor there. They brought in an imam to try and speak to somebody who was radicalizing the rest of the inmates. After a two hour one to one, the imam came out thinking, saying that, oh, I think I'll possibly agree with, with this inmate of what he was saying. That was due to the lack of knowledge of the so-called imam at that point itself. It isn't just good enough to say that somebody who calls themselves an imam are actually able, Madam Deputy Speaker, to deal with this very important issue. I give way. Isn't the situation even a little bit worse than that, that there have been reports of imams from the Deobandi sect of Salafists uh, who have actually been allowed access to prisoners? Uh, as the on, thank you, Madam Speaker. As, as the uh, right honourable member has said, and the experience that he's had himself uh, on, on, on these issues, uh, I think it's quite right to say that it's very difficult for people who don't understand the issues of religion to be then to be able to putting people into places of religious control and support. And that is my clear point on this: is that we, sh first of all, should have proper registration for these people who will actually go into this institution. For anybody else to go into this institution, they must require the proper uh, qualification, the proper certification to be able to go in. But yet on this issue, we will let most people walk in and say that they can do this job. So there has been an issue of actually uh, perpetuating radicalization by some of the people that have gone in. And we've had, I've had stories of this as well in, in, in certain prisons. Uh, and the way that that is followed. So I think it's important that we do that and the way we move forward. I give way. I'm delighted to, uh, to uh, that the Honourable Gentleman has given way, and I thank him. And I do so partly to pay tribute to the good work he's done in this yeah. field for a considerable period yeah. of time. Yeah. He's pointing out the difference between Islamism and Islam. Yeah. There's a difference that's too rarely identified by our media, as he describes. And I just say to him, perhaps a review of the whole work of the prison service in, respect, in the respect he described, the, the appointment of their mans and their work in prisons, is, should be part of the ongoing work the government does to address this issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great point. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Again, uh, I, I concur with, with what the uh, Honourable Member has said. I think in order for the government to move forward on this, I, I think for the last almost 10 years, we haven't paid enough attention to what has gone on. We actually now need to seriously look at this. These two instances and other instances have brought this to our attention and the potential release of other prisoners have brought this to our attention. One of the big functional issues that you have in prison is how you position the inmates. Uh, the Atchison report, which, is, which looks at uh, segregating these prisoners as an issue to look at. But the way to de-radicalize is a real big issue. If you put them all together, they become a group. If you put them with other prisoners, they radicalize other prisoners. If you put them on their own, you can't do that because the law doesn't, and the human rights of prisoners don't allow you to do that. So what we've got to do is not say there's a magic wand of de-radicalization and the way to move forward. What we've got to do is take this issue very, very seriously. We've got to get the right people with the right understanding. And there has been good work done. Good work been done in Indonesia, in the UAE, and Saudi Arabia in terms of looking at these ways of de-radicalizing. And I think we've got to learn some of the lessons from there in the way that they're moving forward in order to try 
and to address some of these issues. So I think we would go further than that, looking at how these issues are relevant, how these issues are related to what the community want to do, uh, and to do that. So also what we've got to look at is not just the issue of prisons that we've got to look at. We've got to look at external departments that deal with this as well. One of the big, pro big problems that we've got to do is very quickly is education. How we allow different madrasas to operate under what licenses, Madam Deputy Speaker, they operate and whether they operate under any license at all. Permission for a madrasa, for local authority, the only consideration that is given is whether it would cause, up, cause any traffic planning or, 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 or congestion at all or not. If you clear that, you can go and have one. No heed is given to where the qualification of the imam is, whether they are, have the proper uh, scrutiny in terms of their, 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 their past and what they've done, whether they, they uh, comply with any security checks at all or not. So I think these issues are very, very important for us to look at and see how we move forward. This issue will and is the tip of the iceberg at the moment, the people that we have. There is still significant radicalization that is taking place and we need to address that in the community. It is progressing more in prisons because they have a captive audience uh, to be able to do that and we need to move forward. I think what we also need to do and looking at uh, the, the, the availability that we have in our prisons is resources quite significant that is required to deal with this. So I think it's really important for us to look at how we deal with this. I also will say at this stage is that it's important, whilst we're looking at Islamic extremism, we also need to look at far right extremism as well. If this bill is to apply to terrorists, it must also apply to far right extremists as well. And I think that's important for us to say this. Uh, I know that my right honourable friend, uh, member for uh, Normanton, Pronfrank and Castleford, uh, has made a lot of sense uh, in her contribution uh, and the great work that she's done, uh, certainly as the chair of the uh, Home Affairs Select Committee and other work that she's done throughout, uh, and deserves commendation for uh, the great balance uh, way that she's worked on this and the issues that she's looked at. It's important for that to move forward. It's important for us to look at how we police some of these issues and how when people are in there, to, to, when they start to come out, and as they will come out, to look at the control orders, orders issues, which, which she has alluded to as well. Uh, and, and looking at how we need to sort of follow that forward. We have forgotten in the last 10 years about the issues of control orders when the pris prisoners were coming out. I think we need to get back to that and see what is valid and what is appropriate and how we can do that uh, and, how, and how, how we can possibly move forward uh, to be able to do that. I think that's uh, hugely uh, important for, for us to do that. So we need to move forward in all those issues. Uh, and including Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, I do support the bill because the necessity that is required at the moment for us to move forward with what, what, what is available to us. But I think we need to have a much deeper look at how we resolve this issue for the long term and for all of our community. Thank you very much. Paul yeah, yeah, yeah. Helms. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I want to speak very briefly on why I welcome this bill and why I believe that the bill outlined this afternoon is necessary to tackle the issues that many honourable members have made uh, very good speeches on this afternoon. Can I firstly congratulate uh, the Prime Minister and the Lord Chancellor as well as ministers from the department in the constructive and decisive action that they have taken uh, and in particular pay tribute to the Labour Party and the Shadow Attorney General, Solicitor General, uh, in, in his support for this measure which I show, think shows the importance of the subject that we are facing today. Um, as the Lord Chancellor said, Madam Deputy Speaker, the first duty of any government uh, is to keep its people safe, and this bill does that. It goes some way into uh, increasing the likelihood that that will happen. It, it increases the likelihood of ending the uncertainty for victims, the, the victims' families, and those that have been affected by these atro uh, atrocities. And it will go some way to restoring the confidence of my constituents and people across the country uh, in the sentencing guidelines when people can commit these most hideous of crimes. Uh, and if I may, I just want to very briefly talk about um, how terrorism affects everybody, directly or indirectly, uh, and two occasions which in particular stick in my mind. And the first was 7-7. Uh, I was 15 years old. Uh, I chose that day not to go into school. Um, don't tell me off, but I chose not to go into school. Um, and I remember the breaking news coming through on the television. My father at the time was working in London. My family were all working in London. I am a Londoner. 
Uh, and I remember trying to make some phone calls to see whether they were okay. And for some reason, I got a cross line. And I got through to a lady when I called my father's phone. And she was a woman that was trying to find out where her daughter was because she was using the tube that, sm- th- that morning. She was terrified, she had fear, she was concerned for where her daughter was. And just for that two minutes, we spoke and I tried to reassure her, uh, and she reassured me. Uh, and the reason, uh, the other occasion, was the Westminster Bridge attack. Um, I was a special advisor to Sir Patrick McLaughlin, uh, and I was walking up Whitehall when the shots were fired, and I was locked down in the Cabinet Office. He was locked down in here, uh, and members of my family were desperately trying to see whether I was OK. I was trying to see whether friends in this house and friends around the chamber were OK. And what I, the reason why I mention both of those occasions is because we all are affected by terrorism, and terrorism spreads fear, it harms lives, and most importantly, it costs lives. Uh, But this bill goes some way to giving some reassurance to the victims, families and people that are affected by terrorism that people that commit these crimes go into prison and they stay there. Uh, Sadly, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, we cannot say with certainty that attacks such as this won't happen again. We all know that. That's the nature of the beast, I'm afraid. But what we can... uh, I certainly will. Gentlemen, for giving way, um, he spoke extremely eloquently then about his own experience with London. Uh, certainly, Greater Manchester has also experienced its fair share of terrorism. Uh, the 1996 bombing, the atrocity at Manchester Arena uh, just three years ago. Um, does he agree with me actually that the terror doesn't just stop with the initial act and that by restricting early release, at least we're giving the family some comfort and some measure of protection from the damaging effects of the attacks and gives them a chance to heal? I absolutely agree with my honourable friend uh, for Hayward and Middleton and and I know that representing the constituency from that region he would have seen uh, the concern and the fear that went across that region and that's absolutely why I think this bill is necessary and can I also place on record, which I should have done at the beginning, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, is pay tribute to the security services, the police uh, and all emergency services across the country who have to deal with these and and pay tribute to the uh, victims and respect to the victims and also their families. So, uh, as I said, we cannot say with certainty that something like this won't happen again, Um, but we can give certainty to uh, people across the country that the perpetrators of these uh, crimes uh, are put away and kept away uh, with the reassurance that if they are in consultation with the parole board released Uh, two-thirds of the way through their sentence, they will be monitored properly and it's in conjunction with the parole board. Now, I know that colleagues on all sides will will have their own memories of attacks like these, um, as do so many of those of us who live or work in London. But we must never forget those who lost their lives due to the barbaric actions of terrorists. But we we must also never let the spectre of terrorism stop us from living well. The aim of terrorism, as I've outlined, is to spread fear, and I'm enormously proud that the people of London, and I'm originally a Londoner, are, are, allowed, uh, are not allowing these attacks to succeed by making us too afraid to go about our daily lives. Madam Deputy Speaker, this bill goes some way uh, to removing the fear of victims, um, that the, killers, won't, that the, uh, that the killers, killers in these cases will serve their sentences, but that they are monitored properly. Uh, and the involvement from the parole board, I think, is absolutely essential, and I'm grateful for the Lord Chancellor outlining that this morning. But what we must question is why these attacks happen. The perpetrators of the attack in London Bridge in November and this month's attack in Streatham were both released from prison automatically at the half point of their sentence, with no involvement of the parole board, uh, to serve the rest of their sentence on licence. Um, The fact that they were able to commit these atrocities shows that this approach must be changed, and that's why I welcome this legislation this afternoon. And I'm glad that the government is uh, is doing so with this bill. I believe it's vital that automatic release is not applied to those convicted of terrorism offences uh, and, and that the Parole Board is, not, is, is involved in each of these cases to assess whether or not these people should be released. But I do ask for some reassurance in the winding out debates by Ministers on the front bench for the uh, point that my right honourable friend, the member from Maidenhead, made, which is if these uh, perpetrators of these attacks serve a full sentence or go through uh, in consultation with the parole board release, um, that we do not see that that's the end of the journey and that rehabilitation and also a reassurance to people across this country that these people are being watched and monitored, um, that's absolutely vital because we do not want 
um, Streatham to happen again, because we know that this guy was on the records of the security services, and it's absolutely vital that we have some reassurance that despite these actions being taken, we go further to make sure that these people are being monitored adequately. Being monitored adequately. Um, these changes will not only make us safer, but they will also give the public more confidence in the ability in our criminal justice system to deal with terrorists. Uh, this is a valuable and much needed piece of legislation. Moreover, it is the right thing to do. The Lord Chancellor is right to act and should be congratulated in taking this swift action. And that's why I'll be supporting this bill this evening. Well done. Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, and I'd also like to put on record my thanks to the Minister who has kept me updated uh, in recent days. In the wake of two recent terrorist attacks, it is absolutely right that the Government looks at this legal framework to decide whether it's adequate or not. Um, like the Honourable Member who spoke before me, I too was caught up in the 7-7 bombing, being on one of the tubes behind the one that was blown up in Russell Square, and I remember the unbearable heat that came from that blast. I was also in this place during the Westminster lockdown. Um, he's right to say that many of us have been affected through acts of terrorism, but with respect I would say that many of us still come to this debate with slightly different views. This bill does three things. First of all, it brings about an end to automatic release and applies that retrospectively. That is overdue, but very welcome. Liberal Democrats have said before, and we say again, that this, this part of the law is currently wrong, and it is right that this House seeks to change it. We know that the Government is rushing this bill through to get to royal assent before the end of the month and before the scheduled release of other terrorists. But this part of the bill alone, end, ending automatic release and applying that retrospectively, this part of the bill alone would achieve the government's goal and indeed the priority of all of us to keep the public safe. This part of the bill alone would stop the release of terrorists without parole board agreement. So it would be possible to adopt just this part of the bill for it to be a change in the administration of a sentence in a way that is compatible with the rule of law. However, this bill also tries to do two other things which I think are fair to say problematic. The second thing it tries to do is move the point of release from the halfway point to the two-thirds point for future offences. Now, of course, it is the natural instinct of all of us to have bad people locked up for longer. But who would want somebody locked up for longer if there was evidence that this could, in fact, make them more radicalised and more dangerous at the point that they are released? I will. Uh, well, I say, thank you for giving way. That's not an argument for the length of the sentence. That's an argument about how people are dealt with when they're incarcerated. Thank the gentleman for that point. Indeed, much of the evidence suggests that it is not only about how they are treated when they are incarcerated, but in fact the, ter the amount of time they have on licence in order to find a home and rebuild family connections and do all of the activity outside of prison that helps them with the de-radicalised process. And there is some evidence to suggest that it is actually that part on licence which can make more of a difference to, to reduce reoffending and to de-radicalise individuals. I will. Can we just think about specifics? The last two attacks were very different. As I said in an earlier intervention, the second of the two attacks was by someone who was clearly mentally deranged. The earlier of the two attacks was by someone who appeared to have taken all the de-radicalisation on board and to be a model prisoner. So we've got to recognise that we're dealing with a kaleidoscope of personalities here, not necessarily people who have been fooled by something and who can reasonably be brought out of that situation. Thank you, gentlemen, for raising that point. Um, the point you raised talks to the issue of both capacity, but also what can be done in prisons and whilst prisons are on licence to make sure they are de-radicalised and to assess their particular behaviours. So, as I was saying, um, there is no, there's currently no evidence that longer periods in prison actually has any rehabilitative effect, and there is some evidence to, to suggest that it might be 
counterproductive. So for all of us who put national and public safety first and put them front and centre, this should be very worrying. The third element is this respect, um, retrospectivity. Now, I believe the retrospectivity to the first part, ending automatic release, is fine. Having retrospectivity to moving the release point is problematic. Now, I know that the government and others who have spoken in this House have pointed to individual parts of case law, but there is a long-established principle against retrospectivity of criminal laws. The government has suggested that this is actually only about changing the administration of the sentence, but whereas legal commentators have been pointing out that arguably this also changes the scope of the penalty. And as the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law has said, and I quote from the briefing circulated this morning to colleagues, by effectively overturning judicial decisions about sentencing, the bill also comes uncomfortably close to legislative interference with the judicial function. The last point that I wish, wish to address is the speed with which this bill moves forward and the reasons for it. Now, as I have said before, nobody wants this automatic uh, release, and the first part of the bill would tackle that and keep the public safe. But there is a reason why we debate laws and scrutinise them in both houses, and there is a reason why there are specialist committees to look at our laws as well. We know that fast law can make bad law. There is even more of a risk of that happening when four of the parliamentary committees which would scrutinise this bill haven't yet been appointed, those being the committees on human rights, home affairs, justice and the intelligence. Uh, I will. Do you recognise that although policy, quite rightly, should be based upon evidence-based research, this is not necessarily a good thing in the terrorism context, um, where we have an evolving set of threats. With evidence-based research, it can be four years before we formulate policy and implement it, by which time the threat has invariably moved on. Therefore, we need to employ a broader range of perspectives, such as interrogation, uh, uh, those who deceive, especially to that, in order to bolster the ability of the parole boards, and um, material for training as well for prison officers and those involved with in de radicalisation. I would suggest that actually the speed of adapting needs to be done, and this is why I support the government's position on this, because an evidence based approach is not appropriate in this context. I thank the Honourable Friend for that point. Um, he will recall that at the opening, uh, in my opening remarks I did make the point that this was a very overdue change because, in fact, we have had many years where we have seen the effects of um, increased radicalisation in prison simply because of the lack of resources both for our prisons and for our parole service. So he's right to point to that element. And it also leads me very nicely into my next point, which is that because of the speed of this bill, there is not sufficient opportunity for pre-legislative scrutiny. And therefore, I would argue to this House that in the absence of adequate pre-legislative scrutiny, I would hope that we would all sign up to a system of post-legislative scrutiny. Now, others in this debate have called for a review mechanism. The government says that there is other legislation coming down the line, but we know that other legislation can slip. So I would finish by asking the government to think again about this particular point to make sure that we do have sufficient post-legislative scrutiny so we can make sure that um, this law doesn't become a law of unintended... Of course. A point in which I agree with the Honourable Lady to intervene because I thought that was in the spirit of this debate. Um, she's right about the need to review this, but as she said a moment ago, there are any number of committees that will be able to do that in the course of time. So we can move ahead with rapidity to defend the public and then look at these matters in the round through the processes that she set out. Well, is right that uh, this legislation will, of course, be scrutinised in, uh, in due course. But I think it's vital that because we are moving it so quickly, I think it is right that we write into law the fact that there could be a statutory review in one year's time. Um, so what I was just going to conclude by saying was that there is a danger that this law becomes a law of unintended consequences. So in summary, 
We do welcome, we really do welcome the end to automatic release and doing that retrospectively. That is a good move. But we do have concerns about changing the release point, particularly if that ends up actually allowing people to be released more dangerous than before. And there are questions, um, uh, around, uh, questions to answer about the impact on the rule of law in terms of applying retrospectivity to that uh, release point. Thank you. Duncan Baker. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy uh, Speaker. This government is putting its money where its mouth is and doing exactly what it said it would do to deal with this urgent and specific problem. And I want to thank everybody who has helped put this bill together. Following the attack in Streatham, the government committed that it would introduce emergency legislation to ensure that terrorist offenders, including those currently serving, will no longer be released early and automatically. Now, you wouldn't think that back in my home of North Norfolk, terrorism is much of a problem. I can still remember being in business when, uh, many years ago, we were the first business in the community to take out terrorism insurance, and thinking at the time, why were we doing that? Look how times have changed. It's exactly why we need this bill today. Sadly, terrorism continues to be a sickening and cowardly set of acts that ruins lives, killing innocent people and devastating communities in our incredible country. We will not let terrorists win, nor allow extremist behaviour to divide our nation. Many Conservatives here, we all stood on a manifesto where we pledged a raft of measures to crack down on crime and introduce tougher sentences. And I speak, I guess, for everybody here that we are pleased that these are well on their way. This law is needed to do just that, to ensure our country feels safe. And it is a fundamental job of government to help protect its citizens. Those that wish to hurt us must not be released early. So I welcome the halfway release for terrorist offenders ending. And that offenders cannot be released without serving a minimum of two-thirds of their sentence. Indeed, no terrorist offender will be released before the end of the full custodian term unless the parole board agrees. And that is absolutely right. But I also welcome measures to rehabilitate and de-radicalise. Society must always have measures in place to help eradicate ideologies. Education will play a vital role in that and we need the resources to enable it properly and also work on why the root causes of terrorism come from. But for some people, there is no way back. And for those terrorists considered a threat to public safety, a continuing threat, it is absolutely right that they spend the rest of their time in prison. And as we invest in prison capacity, I welcome the tougher sentences and a new minimum sentence of 14 years for those worst terrorist offenders. It is, sadly, a situation in the world today where terrorism is still prevalent, but it must not prevail. We, as a government, have to show, not just to the public, but to the terrorists themselves, that we will not tolerate these despicable acts, and to those radicalists prepared to commit such acts, that they will pay for them with longer, tougher sentences, losing their basic right to freedom that they took away from the people they harmed. I welcome the fact that the government will be funding counter-terrorism and that, that the increase in funding to 906 million, representing a 90 million year-on-year -year increase. Victims must be supported too, so the immediate investment of 500,000 to increase the support provided by the Victims of Terrorism Unit shows the government's determination to ensuring more victims receive the support and advice they deserve. I am always proud of the way the British people have come together in the face of such attacks to show beyond any doubt that terrorism will never defeat the British spirit. And of course I would also pay an enormous tribute to the policing forces who look after us day out of day and risk their lives to protect us, not least the people that serve in this building protecting us. I commend this bill to the House. Yeah. Bob Seeley. Yeah. Deputy Speaker. 
Um, I think it's been true now for several years uh, that people in the security world have been privately warning that we faced a, a bulge of extremist prisoners uh, coming out uh, and being released now after the first wave 10 or 15 years ago of uh, significant and serious terror attacks in our country. Of the two recent attacks, one of whom was short term, so one may not have been part of that, but one certainly was, and he had been through a, a reoffender pro, uh, process. I think by way of helping this debate, what I'd like to do is raise some issues, as I understand them, with the Minister, and so the Minister maybe either can write to me or would maybe have the ability to comment at the end of this. Uh, and I'm also going to make reference to recent articles by Ian Aitchison, who seems to have still some very pertinent things to say, and I know a number of us uh, on both sides of the House have made reference to that. He has recently argued that the system for managing extremist prisoners, of whom I think there are about 220 in our system overall, is still flawed. He describes it as being, quotes, broken. And one of the elements, one of the evidence for that, he argued, came out at the trial of, uh, if I can pronounce the name correctly, Bohisanath Chowdhury, who was com um, convicted of preparing acts of terrorism recently. And he said, he described his time at Belmarsh as a form of finishing school, that he freely associated with other jihadis, including people serving a minimum of 30, 34 years in prison. He said, Chowdhury said that his, uh, the, what he thought was a crude, de-radicalised programme was, quotes, laughable. And within days of his release, he was planning new attacks and waiting for others to be released to come out as well. I would like to know from the Minister, what reassurance can the Lord Chancellor give us that we are moving on from that position? Because this has been of significant concern to people in the police and other security agencies for some time. And we know the amount of the remarkable amount of police time that goes into monitoring highly dangerous people when they leave, because the most recent case, uh, that individual was being monitored. And it's not by a single individual, but it's going to be by groups and teams of individuals, of police officers and others, who are going to be monitoring those individuals. The next point I would like to raise with the Minister is on the separation units. I've asked the Lord Chancellor, who I very much hope is going to remain in his job because I think he is doing a cracking job and that he's a superb Lord Chancellor. I asked the Lord Chancellor about separation units, I think, uh, within the last two weeks. And he said that he hoped that the government, that the government although the government was reviewing the situation, that we had got the balance about right. And I respectfully ask, is that still the case? Because the separation units that we have are not the separation units that Ian Aitchison recommended. <coughs> The separation units he recommended was to take prisoners out of um, a more general prison population to be completely incapacitated from radicalising others over a significant and sustained period of time, around which would be built individual responses to those individuals, because as my... Uh, as, um, uh, members on this side, friends on this side of the House have said, the range of, of psychological conditions of extremists ranges from people who are probably just very mentally ill to people who are very bad but in absolute coherent control of their actions and are very good at radicalising and proselytising others. So what Aitchison describes as a sheep dip approach and generic psychosocial interventions from secular people, people trained in a secular approach to psychology, <coughs> is not going to work for people whose universe is extremely difficult and different and built on have a warped but a theological basis. Um, Aitchison said specifically that the prison service had unwillingly adopted some of his recommendations, and I know the Lord Chancellor was good enough to say that we were adopting them, but apparently at a lower level there has been some resistance. And out of the three separation units that we have, one, he said, was mothballed before it began, one lies empty or was lying empty, and a third one has barely a handful of residents. And I would be very grateful if 
the Lord Chancellor could talk to us or ministers could talk to us about the, the day-to-day -day life of these segregation units. And maybe MPs should go and visit some. I'm visiting my prison, uh, one of my prisons next week, uh, and I will be talking to them uh, uh, about the culture in prisons, both my own, but also more broadly, because I think this is an area where we probably don't spend enough time, but I think clearly there are significant problems, because if people are coming out of prison and killing our fellow countrymen, that, that is something which we have to prioritise and probably have not been doing so. He also warned of a fear of litigation that was driving some of the decision making. Now we all have to be mindful of the law clearly, but a fear of the human rights lobby should not be a reason for forcing people or allowing people out who then go on to kill and maim and do bad things to their fellow countrymen. And the final point, and I think it's again a valid one, is that he talked about the terminology of safeguarding vulnerable prisoners, the vulnerable prisoners being the terrorist prisoners. Now, I sort of get that at a certain level. So if you do the hostage and crisis negotiators course, one of the things that the police teach you is that the person who is maybe trying to kill other people in a state of crisis because he or she has taken hostages, that person is themselves in a vulnerable state. And Morality aside, that is clearly true. But in practical and indeed moral terms, sticking a knife to somebody's throat or walking onto the tube with a bomb, treating that person as in need of safeguarding is frankly not as important as treating the people that that person is going to kill, who are also in need of safeguarding from that person. So when we talk about safeguarding prisoners, extremist prisoners, I'm wary of using at a certain level, I understand why it's being done, but I think using that language, uh, I think goes down a morally and ethically dangerous route where we are, um, uh, we are not making a moral distinction between innocence, uh, which is what the term safeguarding should be used for, and people who want to do considerable harm to other people, and in fact see it as being a perverted religious duty in order to slaughter other people as part of a holy jihad, however perverted and however twisted. And as my uh, honourable friend from New Forest East said, you know, that is very much part, that can be part of the mindset, and that is on the spectrum of that mindset. Um, I think because I know that other people want to come in, I, I would wrap up uh, on this but I would very much like to be reassured on some of those questions and some of those issues raised because they are concerns felt by other people who are being directly responsible for trying to protect the British public as well as members in this House. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, <coughs> order, we have had plenty of time for this debate this afternoon, but there have been some very long speeches and in order that there will be time for a proper wind-up from the front benches and many people have asked questions of the Minister which ought to be answered in here and therefore there should be time for the Minister. I'll have to ask people now to make very short speeches of two to three minutes. Um, well, three minutes. Jonathan Gullis. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, we in this place exercise our duty to protect the people we represent, to amend the law where appropriate and ensure the highest standard of living and safety for everyone in this country. I wholeheartedly welcome this bill brought before the House to implement more stringent preventive measures, ending the automatic halfway release and increasing the threshold of two, two thirds of a sentence to be sat as a minimum provides more justice for victims and helps to protect the wider society. I also hugely welcome the Lord Chancellor outlining the role the Parole Board will further play in such decisions. A big part of tackling radicalisation and decreasing the frequency and severity of crimes of this nature must be community-led. We need to empower people to report suspicious activity, however great or small the suspicions may seem, and for those reports to be received with the utmost seriousness and investigated thoroughly. The attack on Westminster Bridge in particular hits close to home. The terrorist who stole two bright lives on London Bridge in November was raised in my constituency. I will not name him and hope that his name is forgotten alongside his hatred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This individual deserves no recognition. Yeah. I have spoken to faith leaders in my community and they have unequivocally condemned the actions of this individual. As a former RE teacher, I know that such viciousness and violence is born through extremism, not through religion. Yeah. Islam is a peaceful religion and the actions of this man in no way reflects upon the many millions of loving, law-abiding citizens who also worship Islam. 
We cannot and must not be lenient with those who attack the core values of this nation and all that it stands for. One of the victims of the Westminster attack in November last year was Saskia Jones. She was from Stratford-upon-Avon, my childhood home. I didn't have the pleasure of knowing her, but we were raised in the same community. The impact of her death and the grief felt by such a small, close-knit community is virtually unimaginable. My deepest condolences go to Jack and Zaskia's loved ones and those who were harmed in Streatham. The best way to honour the memories of all those who have lost their lives as a result of extremist violence is two-pronged. Firstly, to implement protections on the grounds like this bill, and secondly, we must focus on institutional protections to ensure that the time offenders, that the time offenders of this nature spend in prison is used to rehabilitate and reform in a meaningful way so prison sentences, prison sentences stop serving solely as a delay of the inevitable. James Daly. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I support this bill because, from my perspective, it's a matter of complete common sense. Um, I, when I was a criminal lawyer and I stood up and I mitigated on behalf of defendants, defendants would get credit for the guilty plea, they get credit for showing remorse and various other factors. It is a complete anathema that if somebody gets a 16-year sentence, they serve eight. There is no evidence that I have been able to see, Madam Deputy Speaker, anywhere to show that having a prolonged period under, re under the supervision of the probation service makes any substantive difference to rehabilitation whatsoever. I think my constituents would expect somebody who receives a lengthy custodial sentence to serve that period of time or a period as close as possible to that period of time. And any other, if any other member can give me a, an argument against that, I would be very interested to hear it. This is sensible, it is practical, it is reasonable, it is proportionate. It must come in now. Um, the risk, we, we, we here, if we have no other duties to protect members of the public, this must come in so no further terrorists are released. How can we possibly, as a House, continue with a position whereby terrorists are released automatically at 50%? It's preposterous. And anybody watching this would see how preposterous it, it is. So I warmly welcome this. Uh, two other very brief points, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the prevent de radicalisation. I mean, a lot of people in this House, for for the best of intentions, say let's, let's support de-radicalisation work. I've not heard one practical suggestion as to how it's going to work. We use words all the time to describe what we want to happen, but actually putting it into, into practice on the ground is a totally different thing. Well, I can... Well, Frank, we're on that point. Yes. I would ask him whether he believes terrorists can ever truly be de-radicalised. Having worked in counter-terrorism, my belief is that the attributes that make someone vulnerable to becoming an extremist and radicalisation never go away. Those attributes always remain. That person is always vulnerable in some way to some form of extremism or radicalisation or membership of groups that would seek to benefit from those attributes. I don't, know whether, I don't know whether I would go that far, Madam, Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, but what I would say is that the present programmes which have been used by the criminal justice system to tackle de-radicalisation simply do not work. So uh, I would ask the Minister to look at other options if we are going to pursue these. And my last point is, and I feel a duty to say this, Madam Deputy Speaker, as uh, a constituent of mine, Rachel Wheeler, and a dear friend, is a probation officer. I have known her for many, many years. I have known many of her colleagues for many, many years. The probation service provide a, a, uh, a tireless service in trying to serve um, the public, but the probation service is not working as it should do. I think everyone in this House understands that. Staffing shortages, various other matters. We need a probation service that is fit for, for, fit for purpose. but. I could be like, and I could just say to Madam uh, Deputy Speaker, let's put some more money into it. Money's one thing. Let's get services that work, that actually practically deliver on the ground. And then we may have rehabilitation successes. The, I, I repeated this, or I repeat from my speech yesterday. The success of rehabilitative programmes and sentences in our criminal justice system is negligible. Absolutely negligible. Whatever we have been doing, do not work. And at that point, Madam Deputy Speaker, I will sit down. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, 
Stratham is a place that's very close to my heart. I, I lived there for many years and indeed had the, uh, the privilege of being the chairman of Stratham Conservatives and working closely with uh, community groups and indeed the police. And uh, uh, I pay tribute to the professionalism of, uh, of the, uh, the police, the, um, so the closeness of the community groups. And certainly Streatham is a place where we know the people of Streatham will be coming together at this dark hour to support each other. Um, the incident on Streatham High Road was especially tragic because it came so close after the incident, a similar incident at, at London Bridge, um, which brings us to why we're here. All of us in this place have been put here by our electors with an understanding which is both explicit and implicit that we will keep them safe. We have a duty to keep our constituencies, our constituents safe. I have a duty to keep the people of Milton Keynes North safe. And we have the power to act on this matter. Indeed, it's our duty as public servants and as human beings to act on this matter. Let us be quite clear, Madam Deputy Speaker. Those who have been proven to commit or conspire to commit acts of terrorism are enemies of the yeah. Crown. Yeah. As my right honourable friend, the member for Rutland and Melton put it, they are traitors. Yeah. People expect the full application of the law, the full application of justice and the full application of sentences. Deanna Davison. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, there have been some incredible speeches from right across the House today, and I'm really pleased to see this cross-party consensus that this is absolutely the right thing to do for the security of our country. Yeah, yeah. Um, her Majesty spoke back in 2001, and her words, I think, still resonate today when she said that nothing that can be said can begin to take away the anguish and the pain of those moments, and grief is the price we pay for love. Now, our nation has grieved on multiple occasions, Madam Deputy Speaker, not least following the horrific attack in Manchester um, that was referenced by uh, my honourable friend who's not here, the member for Haywood and Middleton, um, where innocent <coughs> children lost their lives mm. through terrorism. And more recently and more relevant to today's debate, we grieved as a nation following the London Bridge and the Streatham terror attacks. Now, both of those offenders had been convicted of terror offences and both had been released early. And in this place, we have a duty to the innocent victims of terrorism. We have a duty to ensure that justice is done through the courts, and that's why I welcome the upcoming counter-terrorism bill, which will help ensure that sentences really do reflect the severity of crimes with a minimum of 14 years. Yeah, yeah. Though I hope we do go even further still for those who have, in all intents and purposes, declared themselves enemies of our very way of life. Because yeah, yeah. uh, yeah. these are not petty criminals, Madam Deputy Speaker. These are people committing some of the most evil, atrocious offences and it is right that they receive the very harshest of sentences. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have a duty to uh, ensure that the public is protected. And that means ensuring that those sentenced for terror offences are not automatically released early from prison. Because it is not right that convicted terrorists should be allowed to freely roam our streets before the end of their sentences. Yes. And this emergency legislation seeks to address this by ending the automatic early release, and I support this wholeheartedly. Yeah. Now, some members have expressed their concerns about the swift timetable for this legislation, but as the Lord Chancellor rightly highlighted earlier, there are around 50 terror convicts who, under current rules, would be due for automatic release before the end of this month. And this is unacceptable, and which is why it's yeah. right we support the government's changes and use our power to keep our streets and our people safe. Yeah. And this is why we must act now. Under this bill, terrorist offenders will only be eligible for early release if they pass a thorough risk assessment by the parole board. If they're considered to pose any threat still to public safety, they will rightfully be forced to serve the remainder of their time in prison. Uh, the parole board make their decisions based on a variety of factors, including behaviour displayed in prisons. And so I'm pleased to see the government increasing counter-terrorism resources in prisons and ensuring that frontline staff are trained in identifying behaviour in those who still pose a threat to society and ensuring that those who still pose dangers to the public are not able to leave prison early. 
But our duty doesn't end at the point of release, Madam Deputy Speaker. We must also ensure that after release, sufficient monitoring takes place. And that's why I'm pleased we're also introducing new measures to strengthen supervision on licence for terrorist offenders, bolstered by doubling the number of specialist counter-terrorism proba uh, probation officers, so that upon release it will mean that terrorists could be subject to measures such as notification requirements, restrictions on travel and communications, and imposed curfews, all helping to prevent further offences. Because in this place, public safety is our number one duty, and we also have a duty to do all we can to defend the memories of those victims and ensure that terror never wins. And that's why we must pass this bill today. Yeah. 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 Nick Thomas-Simmons. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And with leave of the House, I seek to wind up the debate in addition to having already opened it. Uh, uh, quite, quite right. Uh, this has been a wide-ranging debate on the most uh, serious of issues. And... We have a duty, I would say, across the House to reduce the risk of incidents like we saw in Streatham happening again in the future. We can never eliminate the risk, but we certainly must put in place all reasonable and proportionate measures. We must never sacrifice our values, the very values this Parliament seeks to protect in tackling these issues, whether it's the European Convention on Human Rights or indeed our own country's common law, actually over centuries. That's the framework in which we must act. I am grateful, Madam Deputy Speaker, to honourable and right honourable members across the House for their contributions. The member for Bromley and Chislehurst, the chair of the Justice Select Committee, the honourable gentleman for East Lothian, who brought his own expertise from being a minister north of the border. And I want to pay tribute too to the honourable gentleman for Crewe and Nantwich for his maiden speech. He did quite appropriately pay tribute to his own predecessor, Laura Smith, who certainly was a great champion for the constituency during her time here, and pointed to her own experience that she drew on as a primary school teacher. I think, as a true Welsh Valleys man, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, given a choice between the Worm Charming Championship and watching Crew and Nantwich Rugby Club, I'd go for the rugby club every time. <laughs> but I do wish the worm charm as well in their competition. Uh, and actually, I thought that that particular maiden speech spoke very movingly about the struggle that many people have with identity, and I do look forward to hearing contributions from the Honourable Gentleman in the time that he has in this House, in this Parliament. Uh, I thank also my Honourable Friend for Normanton, Pontefract and Castleford, who spoke with her usual authority, including, I thought, on the oversight of de-radicalisation programmes, which will be vital in the years ahead. I also thank the members for Stone, Belfast East and South Holland and the Deepings for their contributions, and my honourable friend, the member for Birmingham Perry Bar, who spoke, I thought, very powerfully about the need for training and expertise for those who actually are going into prisons and providing the de-radicalisation programmes, and also pay tribute to his extraordinary work in this particular area. I was also grateful, too, for contributions from the members for East Lee, uh, St Albans, North Norfolk, the Isle of Wight, Stoke-on-Trent North, Bury North, Milton Keynes North and indeed Bishop Auckland. I think it's been a well-natured and constructive debate in the Chamber this afternoon. As I said in my opening remarks, Madam Deputy Speaker, we really do need this relentless focus on the treatment of extremism in our jails. And whilst I'm sure in a few minutes' time this particular piece of legislation will pass uh, this House at second reading, we do need to get the wider issues around this right. We do need sufficient numbers of prison officers, properly paid and supported, working in a constructive environment. We need a prison estate that is fit for purpose. We have to tackle, too, the problem of increased violence on our prison staff, and we cannot continue to tolerate a situation with attacks on our prison staff at the level they are. And if there was any doubt about that, I think many honourable and right honourable members have spoken about the awful atrocities at Fishmongers Hall and indeed in Streatham. But let's not forget either that on the 9th of January this year, 
there was an attack on prison staff at HMP Whitemore by two inmates with bladed articles, which is a reminder of the extent to which we ask our prison staff to take risks on a daily basis. We need that very best regime to tackle extremism in our prisons. The best expertise, appropriate resources, trained staff, all these things are required. And we need that programme to prevent people falling into a life of terror and hatred in the first place. It must be as effective as it can be, and the government does need in a speedy fashion to get the independent review of the Prevent programme underway with a reviewer in place. We need stable leadership and a Justice Secretary who remains in place long enough to make a lasting mark on the Department. I hope this Prime Minister will not be chopping and changing his Justice Secretary at every opportunity to give that opportunity for strategy and indeed for long-term planning, which is absolutely what is required in the Department at the moment. Madam Deputy Speaker, keeping the public safe is the central duty of government. We need consistent evidence-based policy making. And even if it is a fast-changing situation, we should never lose sight of the evidence before us. What counts in this sphere has to be what works. Madam Deputy Speaker, this emergency legislation will, I hope, now reach the statute book in timely fashion to avert the immediate crisis. But it should mark a beginning, not an end. A beginning of a wider debate on how we tackle extremism in our prisons and a real commitment of resources from the government to secure the very best expertise available in counter-extremism. That is what we must see in the months ahead. The public deserve no less. Minister Chris Philp. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's uh, been a great privilege to listen to so many extremely fine speeches this afternoon, but I would like to particularly pay tribute to the newly elected member for Crewe and Nantwich for his excellent maiden speech earlier this afternoon. There was a great deal in that to think about, touching on issues of identity, as the Shadow Minister just said, but I was especially interested to hear about the worm charming competition. I am looking forward to the member for Crewe and Nantwich demonstrating his worm charming skills, whatever form that may take, in the tea room later on. But we are uh, clearly here, Madam Deputy Speaker, to um, consider an extremely serious matter, a matter touching on national security and a matter touching on public safety, prompted as it is by two terrible recent cases, the murders committed uh, at Fishmongers Hall by Usman Khan on November the 30th last year and the attack by Sadesh Aman in Streatham on the 2nd of this month, a little over a week ago. It has become very clear to the Government that the automatic release of terrorist offenders, uh, some terrorist offenders, after serving only half of their sentence, um, does pose an unacceptable risk to the public. And that is why we are acting uh, with urgency with this emergency legislation to end that happening. It is, of course, a set of exceptional circumstances, uh, as many members, including the Chairman of the Just Justice Select Committee and indeed uh, the member for East Lothian, the former Justice Secretary in Scotland, uh, both said, uh, not something any government undertakes lightly, but where we believe we have to act quickly and decisively to protect the public, we will do so. Yes, happily. Giving way, and he's making an excellent speech on this very important issue. And I refer the House to my register as a risk assessor with the Risk Management Authority in Scotland. Has he considered, and perhaps going forward, might he consider the order of lifelong restriction which is in place in Scotland for those offenders who continue to exhibit a significant risk for their lifetime, who can be recalled at any point during that time? And might that be something he would consider finding out a bit more about in relation to? these issues. 
Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for raising um, such a thoughtful point. Um, it certainly is something we'd be prepared to study and consider. We're always very keen to learn from uh, you know, other jurisdictions, so we certainly will study that, as the Honourable Lady um, suggests. Uh, we will be bringing forward wider measures as part of a counter-terrorism bill in the next few months. One of the provisions we have in mind um, certainly are very greatly extended licence periods following release, so very much in the spirit of what she suggested, um, and I thank her for that very constructive proposal, which we certainly will take the opportunity of studying. Yes, of course. Um, I've heard throughout the debate, and, and just now, uh, talking about measures of ending automatic release as if it was a new thing, but the Honourable Member will be aware that the measure already exists in Section 9 of the Counter-Terrorism and Border Security Act. And like me, is he confused as to why it wasn't made retrospective then? Because it was in direct response to the 2017 uh, terror attacks that went on throughout the entire year. And I would have thought that that would have been something that the government would have done then. Good and point. we would have supported it on this side of the House, as we did when they put in the uh, review of prevent. Good point. Well, of course, um, retrospection is something which uh, the government, and I think Parliament as a whole, um, thinks very carefully about and takes a very circumspect view about, quite rightly. Um, a number of changes to sentencing have been made over the last um, five or ten years, including the introduction of extended determinate sentences, where um, release at two-thirds is a matter for the parole board for following an assessment of dangerousness by the sentencing judge, and, of course, extending um, SOPSI sentences, sentences for offenders of particular concern, um, to include um, terrorist offenders who don't have an EDS or life sentence um, were introduced a short time ago, which have a parole board assessment at the halfway point. So a great deal has been done in the last few years in this area. But I think these two recent cases, including, of course, um, the one in Streatham um, just a week and a half ago, I think underline the need to go even further than we've gone before, which is why this bill is before the House today. The number of offenders affected is a small one. As the Lord Chancellor said in his excellent introduction earlier, it is only uh, 50 offenders. It's small in number because the rest are all, um, are all covered by other sentencing types. But even a small number of offenders, as we have seen, can cause a very high level of harm. And that is why it's important we go further with today's bill. The next offender due for release um, is by the end of this month. And that is why we are acting so quickly to make sure this legislation is in place prior to that next release. Uh, and, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to thank uh, members from across the House, uh, including uh, the opposition uh, front bench, uh, the Honourable Member for um, Torfine, um, and, of course, the um, opposition spokesman uh, from the SNP uh, for the very constructive um, and supportive tone they took in their speeches. This is a good example of Parliament working in a cross-party way in the national interest, and I am grateful to them for the approach they have taken today. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, some questions were raised today which went uh, sort of touching on some wider issues in this area, one of which was a question of resources um, raised by the Shadow Minister, um, the Honourable Member for Torvine, in his opening speech earlier this afternoon. Um, and I would like to just um, confirm to the House once again that next year there will be another £90 million spent on counter-terrorism policing, bringing the budget to £900 million. That's a very significant increase in resources announced just a short time ago. In relation to the prison estate, there clearly is more we need to do. Um, the prison budget in the last two years, since 2017-18 to 2019-20, the current year, has increased from £2.55 billion to £2.9 billion. That is a 15% increase. And the number of prison officers serving in our prison estate over the last three years has increased from 18,003 up to 22,536, a very welcome increase in the number of prison officers. Of course, we're also investing in the quality of the prison estate. Um, this next financial year, the one starting shortly, will see an extra £156 million invested in the prison estate's physical condition, in addition to a £2.5 billion programme to build 10,000 additional prison places, over and above the 3,500 under construction currently at Glen Parva, Wellingborough and Stockton. Of course, I give way. Uh, the Minister is making, a, making a, a good speech, and I recognise uh, the various measures which the Government is taking in relation to investment in the prison estate and staffing. Uh, 
Picking up upon the point made by the uh, Honourable Member Free Lothian from the SNP side, will he also uh, recognise the importance of a comprehensive policy to uh, ensure the retention of experienced prison staff as well as recruitment of others? Because they do have particular skills and knowledge which are valuable in this field. Well, I think the um, Chair of the Justice Select Committee makes a very good point. It is important uh, to retain experience in the prison officer establishment. Um, they do have long, long, long expertise, long experience, um, and that retention point, I think, is an extremely important one that I know my colleague, the Minister of State for Prisons, is acutely aware of. Um, I think many uh, honourable members, including the members Fries Lothian and Normanton Pontefract and Castleford, um, drew attention to the importance of a, de- a comprehensive de-radicalisation programme in prison. It's a point the member um, for Birmingham Perry Barr made in his excellent speech as well. We are acutely conscious of the importance of that and the need to do more. Um, there are programmes in place, the Theological and Ideological Intervention Programme, um, the Healthy Identities Programme and the Resistance and De-Radicalisation Programme. I'm sure there is more that needs to be done um, in, those, in those areas. Um, now, I know my honourable friend, the member for the Isle of Wight, um, touched on this during his speech, um, and I think the, uh, the Minister for Prisons um, would like to take up his offer of meeting um, it very shortly um, to discuss exactly these issues. Of course, it's equally important to make sure that after release, these uh, offenders are properly monitored, whether on licence or otherwise. Of course, the TPIM regime um, was strengthened in 2015, and we always have multi-agency public protection arrangements where necessary. And in fact, we saw in the case of Shudesh Aman, um, those were actually effective in that the length of, you know, the, when he and begun his um, uh, behaviour, it was a matter of, of seconds before the police were able to intervene, which I think is an example of those mapper arrangements working well in practice. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, in the few minutes remaining um, to me, I would like to just address this question of um, retrospection, which a number of members have touched on, including, of course, um, the member for St Albans. Um, it is our very firm belief, based on legal advice, um, that these measures do not contravene Article 7, um, they do not constitute a retrospective change of the penalty, because the penalty is the total sentence. The penalty is the sentence handed down by the judge at the point of sentencing. And as the Honourable and Learned Member for Bromley and Chislehurst um, elaborated, there is a very wide body of case law that says changing the early release point does not change the penalty. It, in fact, early release ameliorates the penalty, it reduces the penalty, it doesn't add to it. Um, The Utley case, I think, makes that very clear. So do other cases that have come before the UK Supreme Court and, indeed, the European Court of Human Rights. The Del Rio Prada case, um, which has been mentioned this afternoon, uh, a case uh, where the uh, the Kingdom of Spain uh, were the respondent, um, I don't think is is directly um, germane because that concerned the calculation of concurrent sentences and a change in the way concurrent sentences were handled, Um, and that is obviously not the matter before the House today. So we are, uh, the Government is very clear um, that this does not contravene Article 7, this does not constitute a retrospective change in the penalty, it simply constitutes a change to the way um, the sentence is administered. And just touching briefly on the point raised by the Honourable Member for Stone, um, which I suspect we may debate more fully in the committee stage shortly, um, you know, we don't believe a notwithstanding clause um, is necessary because we don't believe Article 7 is, um, is contravened by this legislation. Um, uh, we can debate this more, but nor, nor are we wholly convinced that a, a notwithstanding clause um, would derogate our treaty obligations under the ECHR um, in any event, I am just very conscious of time. I will happily give way in the committee stage and debate this at greater length. And I very much look forward um, to hearing the Honourable and Learned uh, Gentleman's um, further views on this. And I will happily take an intervention during committee stage, but I must wrap up, I think, in just a minute, a minute or so. Um, the Honourable Member for Normanton Pontefract um, and Castleford asked about the MAPA review and the Prevent review. The MAPA review is underway, being led, of course, by Jonathan Hall, QC. And the Prevent Review um, has a statutory deadline of August 2020, which we intend to abide by, and will make further announcements about its progress, including appointing a new reviewer as soon as possible. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, the... I fear I'm out of... Very briefly. Just very briefly, could you tell me, is it actually doing any work? 
Um, well, well it's, it's a Home Office matter, but I don't think work has stopped simply because of the uh, issue with the reviewer. Just in conclusion, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, these are emergency measures to deal... The well, gentleman has one and a half minutes. It's all right. Madam Deputy Speaker is extremely kind. I thought I had about ten seconds. Um, but I would, but I would, but I would like to use up my remaining. I would like to use up my remaining one minute and probably ten seconds now um, by saying that although these are emergency measures designed to address a specific problem, we will of course be coming back with a much wider and more considered set of proposals in our counter-terrorism bill in the next few months and the sentencing white paper. Many members have pointed to the need to think uh, widely and thoughtfully about these issues, and we will of course be doing so in the counter-terrorism bill. Uh, members will be pleased to hear that for the most serious terrorist offenders we will be imposing or seeking to impose a 14-year minimum sentence with no prospect of early release, as well as being thoughtful and considered about issues of de-radicalisation. Um, of course, more resources are going into the system, 20,000 extra police officers, £85 million extra for the CPS and more Crown Court sitting days in the coming year. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is an important emergency measure designed for public protection, and I am very pleased to see that it commands uh, support across the House. Yeah. Thank you. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As many as that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Under the order of the House of today, we shall now move to the Committee of the Whole House. Order. Order. Terrorist Offenders Restriction of Early Release Bill. We begin with Amendment 3 to Clause 1, and I will call Sir William Cash to move Amendment 3 to Clause 1, with which it will be convenient to consider the other amendments to Clause 1. Clause 1 stand part, Clause 2 stand part, the amendments to Clause 3, Clause 3 stand part, Clauses 4 to 10 stand part, Schedules 1 and 2 stand part, and the selected new clauses as on the selection list. I call Sir William Cash to move Amendment 3. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I, I have already um, canvassed some parts of what I'm about to say, but uh, there is more to say for a very sound reason. Uh, Parliament is full of opinions. Ministers are full of opinions, and we've got two ministers sitting on the front bench who are debating the issue, I've no doubt, um, in front of us at this moment. <laughs> but I have to say that their opinions are not the law, uh, nor are those, if I may say so, um, of uh, leading council, whether they are senior Treasury Council or whether they are um, matters uh, which uh, arise from academic discussion. I say this really seriously. I've been practicing the law since 1967. Uh, I know a little bit about how the law is interpreted. We saw the Gina Miller case the other day. How many times were we told that there was absolutely no question uh, but that the government was right in its interpretation? I served as a shadow attorney general. Uh, I saw the whole of the Iraq, uh, Peter Goldsmith, um, exercise and how we were told over and over again this and that and the other about the interpretation on the floor of the house this is what would happen this is the way it will go and i have to say that this is no way to make decisions on matters of this kind of critical importance there are occasions when the question of interpretation may be merely about a modification of policy this is actually about saving human life and I repeat that, saving human life. And I do not think that where it is possible for this House to ensure that human life cannot be unreasonably uh, and, and willfully disposed of by people who are intent on murdering them uh, for, reason, for no reason at all, 
then I do believe that we need to take very seriously the question of whether or not we can exclude the courts, because this is Parliament, not the judiciary, from making the wrong decisions when it comes before them. And I hear with interest the, the Chairman of the Justice Committee uh, and his various cases, and I've just heard the Minister refer to the Utley case, and then there is the Hogburn case as well. Uh, and in, in, in the Hogburn case, of course, that was 1985, which was before the Human Rights Act uh, 1998. Um, and there was also the reference to the Del Rio Prado case. As a matter of fact, it does not, in my opinion, depend on an interpretation of these individual cases by way of precedent that we should be worried about. We should be thinking about the purpose and the scope of this bill and its objective, which is to do everything that we can to ensure that human life and public safety comes first. So I don't want this to become an argument about interpretation of law. And that is why I brought forward my amendment, notwithstanding the um, uh, to, to, to Clause 1. Um, well, I'll offer and give way. I certainly will. I, I'm grateful to him for giving way. Can he just clarify on this subject of opinions? Is he intending to test the opinion of the House or merely the opinion of the Minister? <laughs> That's an extremely good question, to which I've already given an indication. I know perfectly well, being a realist, that this is not a bill uh, to which an amendment is going to be passed, certainly as of today. But I did say, and I repeat, that the House of Lords, which is where it's going to, is full of lawyers, some of whom I will disagree with and have done for as many years as I've been in this House, but there are others who will take a different view. And I'm very interested indeed to hear the views of the House of Lords on the question of my proposal that the uh, that clause uh, the, the clause one should be amended in sub clause two uh, as follows, which is at the moment the wording is is an offence is within this subsection bracket whether it was committed before or after this section comes into force, and I propose at that point to put in the words and notwithstanding the Human Rights Act 1998, the effect of that would be to put a, a, a complete bar on the use of the Human Rights Act by interpretation of the courts to any attempt, whether it is regarded as misguided or whether it is a matter of culture, because there's a load of culture in the courts at the moment relating to questions relating to human rights, which have built up over the whole of my lifetime in the law. And I am deeply concerned that we should allow legislation to go through which could be interpreted in a way that would result in human life being lost and that is my and public safety being infringed that is my object that is my concern and i see the minister looking at me somewhat uh, either apprehensively or, or with anticipation i'm not sure which it is and i don't really care what i'm saying to you is i want certainty and I know that if the words notwithstanding the Human Rights Act are brought into this bill, the effect of it will be to exclude completely, for reasons I'm about to give, any attempt by the courts to uh, modify the effect that this bill otherwise would have. I have other concerns about the bill. I've already made them clear with respect to the fact that I don't think it should be um, half or two-thirds. Or two I have a lot of sympathy with the amendment uh, put forward by our own friend, the member for New Forest. I don't know whether he'll, he'll uh, address this shortly. And he says nine-tenths. But I mean, the, the bottom line is that we should not allow any, if we can avoid it, and we can because we are the Houses of Parliament, and we've just, as a result of Brexit, uh, regained an awful lot of our sovereignty. In this particular context, um, this is more a matter of the European Convention on Human Rights than the matter of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, or for that matter, Brexit as a whole. But it's an indication of our determination to use our sovereignty in this House to make law which will guarantee that we do not find ourselves faced with people losing their lives or public safety being 
uh, damaged or uh, undermined. And without the words that I'm proposing, I believe, as I said before, with respect to the Lee Rigby case, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And what concerns me is that if this bill does go through, and I concede this is a matter of emergency legislation, that's why I'm supporting it. But I also say it requires a full and thorough review. It should be perhaps through the uh, Justice Select Committee or some other mechanism to ensure that we deal with this issue properly and fully. So I applaud the, the government for bringing in this bill on an emergency basis, but I criticise the fact that it doesn't go far enough. And I also criticise the fact that the minister, who is, if I may say, not a lawyer, um, can only have received his information from others who are, is taking a, a bit of a punt uh, by saying the words notwithstanding the Human Rights Act they are not needed. He doesn't know. Um, and I say that with not only respect, but also with knowledge and certainty. It's a very difficult thing for anyone to be sure, even for lawyers to be sure, as to what the impact would be of allowing this bill to go through without excluding the Human Rights Act 1998. I'll give way. Minister. Well, I thank the Honourable Member for giving way, despite my non-lawyer background. No. Um, but uh, look, the question I'd like to ask is, I'm very interested with what the Honourable Member is saying, of course, and I've been listening extremely carefully as he has seen. What effect does he think, or how does he think his amendment would operate? And in particular, does he think it would in any way disapply our treaty obligations, uh, our ECHR treaty obligations? And wouldn't it be the case that even were we to pass that notwithstanding amendment that's in his name, um, litigants or applicants would still have the ability to go, certainly, directly to the European Court in Strasbourg? We can't uh, disapply that route by this amendment. The, the short answer to that is that, um, and I notice that he's reading very carefully from the notes he's been provided with, and, I, and, and I, agree, I agree with the sentiment that lies behind it, but I'm putting the case in a different way. I'm saying that whatever it, does, it takes to preserve human life, and we really are talking about serious questions of human life here, that therefore every step should be taken I, I had originally had in mind to exclude the European Convention on Human Rights as well with respect to this amendment. This I have de described in effect as a probing amendment, but I want proper consideration to it, not just simply somebody saying, oh, I don't think that that particular wording might achieve the total effect that the Honourable Member, that's myself, would wish. I am saying that human life in this context is so serious a matter that we really have to take every step to make sure that we don't have a repetition of the uh, instances of murder and of terrorism which we have witnessed and which, uh, from Lee Rigby onwards, in recent times, have become uh, more and more prevalent. And we know that there are people who are prepared to take those steps. And it may be that they are, have, are, some of them are mentally disturbed in the future or otherwise. And it may be that people don't think that it will happen again. But it's what, what I said in that former um, bill, the counter-terrorism bill, about four or five years ago. I said it's not if we have another Lee Rigby, it is when. And we've had one after another at regular intervals. And now they're becoming more and more imminent, more and more serious. And I doubt whether this bill, however worthy its objectives, necessarily will deal with the problem in the manner in which I'm setting out needs to be done. So I don't think that uh, there is any doubt that Parliament has the power to legislate retrospectively. And I want to make this entirely clear. And I, I, if the words are clear and express, then whatever judges may wish to interpret is displaced by the wording of, that Parliament actually utters. And my <coughs> authority for this, and there are plenty of authorities, but I'm going to give you the one, uh, give you, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, the words of Willis J. in Phillips versus Eyre, which boils down to this, that the courts will only ascribe retrospective force to new laws affecting rights 
if by, and I'm now quoting from his words, express words or, or necessary implication, it appears that such was the intention of the legislature. And I'm supported in that by what appears on page 56 of Bradley and Ewing. It's very clearly set out, this is the greatest constitutional authority that we have in this country. And they are in the 15th edition, and they are quite clear that if the words are express uh, in particular, and all thereby necessary implication, it's, it appears that such was the intention of the legislature, then there is no argument. The courts, quite rightly, will then interpret that law in the light of those express words. And the words, notwithstanding the European Community, not, notwithstanding the European, uh, the, 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 the Human Rights Act 1998, and for that matter, you could add all the European Convention on Human Rights, if you like, to answer the minister directly. I don't mind. And I'm not doing this as an exercise in academic uh, analysis. I'm doing this because I don't want people to be killed. And I don't want those people to be released in circumstances where they might do that because I think it's too much at stake. So for practical purposes, um, I believe that, uh, as I said earlier, for the purposes of legislative clarity and for the avoidance of doubt in relation to the power of Parliament to legislate retrospectively, I'm not interested in the interpretation that may be placed on it by leading counsel, or for that matter academics, or bloggers, or senior treasury counsel, or, for that matter, if I may say with the greatest respect, and I really mean this, either the Chairman of the Justice Committee, or, for that matter, uh, the, the Lord Chancellor himself. In this House, we make decisions about the legislation that we're going to pass. And if, on the basis of what Will, Willis Jay said in Phillips v. Air, and in other cases, it's absolutely crystal clear, by using words which are explicit and express, we can have the effect of ensuring that human life is saved. And that is my main, object, my, my, my main, my main inten intention in the amendment that I put forward. It's not for me today, this afternoon, to go into all the criticisms that I've had over all these years about the Human Rights Act 1998, but I can assure you there are an awful lot of other very distinguished lawyers, including the Foreign Secretary, who have had a lot to say about this over the years, and I mentioned Martin Howe QC and others. So there is a huge body of opinion, legal opinion, on both sides of this. And those who are inclined to take the view that um, the Human Rights Act has a lot of merit in it, or the Charter of Fundamental Rights for that matter, which we've now excluded by virtue of the Withdrawal Agreement Bill, which went through as an act only a, a, about 10 days ago. I'll certainly give way. Um, I thank my honourable and learned friend for giving way. Um, just as, a, as another layperson, a non-lawyer, non um, is, can he see any downside to actually including the set of words which he's suggesting in this amendment? Does it limit something which might otherwise not be limited? Because um, um, I hear very clearly his arguments about it being potentially superfluous, subject to, being, uh, subject to interpretation, but does it actually limit anything else? Is there any downside to doing this if it is, um, if it is um, an additional safeguard that wasn't required? Indeed. Um, as usual, my old friend is very perceptive, and this is really the main purpose of my, uh, of my words on the subject, because there is no downside at all in this context. I can think of circumstances where it might be arguable that there could be, because somehow or other you might be infringing some genuine human right. But the idea that you're dealing with this issue in this legislation for the sole purpose of preventing people being murdered in the circumstances, in the manner, and for the purposes for which, it is, uh, for, for which they indulge in those heinous acts, there can be no downside in making it absolutely crystal clear. That's the point I'm making, and subject to comments that may be made by other lawyers, both as a result of what I'm saying here now, and also for that matter in the House of Lords as well. Because I am not pretending that I have all the answers to every question in matters of this kind. But I do think it is our duty in the, in, the, in the context of what we're actually seeking to prevent to ensure that we are as crystal clear as we can be in our direction to the courts that they should not and must not allow human rights considerations to allow murder to take place.
That is the problem, and that's why I'm so emphatic about it. I absolutely understand, but I've already noted, if I may say, from the Minister's remarks and from other conversations I've had with senior ministers, that they're more interested, perhaps, in the questions of interpretation than I am. I don't want any interpretation in this context. If a person is going to commit murder as a result, and that's what the sole purpose of this bill is about, be under no misapprehension, this bill has not been brought forward to deal with some questions relating to the whole generality of human rights law. It is specifically an emergency piece of legislation to deal specifically to prevent people who, for a variety of reasons, or without reasons, are actually intending to perpetrate murder. Human life is at risk. That is why this is such a good move on the part of the government. There's nothing negative in my approach here. It's entirely belt and braces. That's the point I'm making. And if the opportunity is to be given to Parliament to make sure that we have both the belt and the braces, then for heaven's sake, let's take it and not leave it to the vagaries and the uncertainties of judicial interpretation. So um, I, I feel that uh, I've almost, uh, I, I'm just going to refer to a few cases uh, where I think that um, the, the uh, notes which, I, which I've got here uh, warrant some reference. I've already referred to the Hogburn case and I'm not going to go through the uh, analysis because I don't think this is something which depends upon compiling a judgment about the interpretation of law based on precedents. I don't think there should be any case that we put forward which, to come back to what my own friend has said, uh, could ge generate a an upside or a downside. I just want clarity. That's the whole point. And I know that the words that I've used, as indeed have been adopted, the notwithstanding formula, in the Withdrawal Agreement Act, which was just passed 2020. Where under Section 38, in relation to the sovereignty of Parliament, I argued in Number 10, and the Prime Minister, to his enormous credit, completely backed me, and I said, you have to include the words notwithstanding the, um, notwithstanding the, the European Community Act 1972. Uh, the reality is that by doing it in a certain manner, you, 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 do, you ensure that you achieve your objective. You don't have the uh, uncertainty which can come in the circumstances that I've already described. So, uh, on the question of the Del Rio Prado, Prado case, I mean, we need to perhaps bear in mind that this was a decision by the European Court of Human Rights. The other cases, the ones to which the Honourable Gentleman referred, the Minister referred in, in the case of Utley, um, uh, was uh, uh, an appeal by the House of Lords that Article 7 could only be infringed if a sentence was imposed on a defendant that constituted a heavier penalty than that which would have been imposed at the time the offence was committed. Um, the ECHR <coughs> then declared that his application was inadmissible. But in the De De Del Rio Prado case, uh, yes, it was to do with Spanish policy, but there is no doubt that part of the argument that's been put forward by the government today has rather depended on administration rather than on the object of the bill. And I think that is another area which needs to be uh, carefully considered because I don't think that the question of administration is really the basis on which we should be making these decisions. So there we are. Madam Deputy Speaker, I've made my case. I do think that the government could review the situation when the bill goes to the House of Lords, um, and I would be very interested to see um, what, how, how people develop this argument from now on out. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 3 to Clause 1 be made. Mr Nick Thomas Simmons. Here, here. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I rise to speak to new Clause 1 in the in my own name and that of my honourable and right honourable friends. But before I do, just with your indulgence, Madam Deputy Speaker, if I could just commend my honourable friend, the member for Streatham, who of course has come into this House and had to deal with this awful situation that's happened on the High Street in Streatham, and to say that 
in terms of her intervention on the Minister in his closing remarks in the last debate and the issue about various sentencing decisions over the last 10 years. It was, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, an issue in a a different clause that wasn't selected, but I think more broadly I would say that reviewing the sentencing regime in a strategic way is something I commended in the second reading debate and I hope will be considered in the Ministry of Justice. I'll turn directly now to new clause one, to which I will direct my remarks. Uh, And I've made clear to the Minister previously that it's not my intention to divide the House on this, but I do think the issue of scrutiny of the de-radicalisation programme and giving this House confidence that it is being monitored and considered is a very important one that I hope he will address when he responds to the debate in committee. Now, the clause specifically requires the appointment of an independent reviewer of the prison de-radicalisation programme. And the Minister, in his speech at the end of the second reading debate, mentioned some different figures with regard to resources. £90 million, I think, on counter-terror policing and an uplift uh, from, I think, £2.55 to £2.9 billion in the prison budget. But, of course, what that doesn't tell us specifically is how much of that is being spent on the de-radicalisation programme. It tells us the general budget in terms of the prison but it doesn't tell us that. And that's the sort of information that I think an independent reviewer would be able to discover and to then put in a format that this House could consider. We've already discussed the report of Mr Ian Aitchison regarding the review of Islamist extremism in prisons, probation and youth justice and the various recommendations. And indeed, one of his recommendations was to have an independent advisor of counter-terrorism in prisons who is accountable to the Secretary of State. Now, this proposal, in the form I'm putting it forward, goes slightly further than the Aitchison recommendation. And what would be required would be for the Secretary of State for Justice to appoint a person to review the operation of the prison de-radicalisation programme, but also with the power to enter prison premises both to gather evidence and to provide scrutiny. There would be a statutory requirement. I mean, the amendment uh, states a report every three months to be laid before Parliament on the programme. That could be regarded as uh, too often, but the general point really stands that the position would be that this House was in a position to properly judge the effectiveness of rehabilitation work in our prisons. The clause also gives power under subsection 5 to the independent reviewer to look into the resources available to the programme and the resources available for probation and rehabilitation work. And that proposal of an independent reviewer would give the opportunity for proper scrutiny of this very important programme. Now, the Honourable Gentleman will, of course, be aware of the Healthy Identity Intervention and other programmes that currently exist. And the proposal would seek to build on that and give real confidence to the government's work in the rehabilitation and de-radicalisation space. Now, I'm not absolutely clear of the extent to which those who've perpetrated these awful atrocities in recent months took part in de-radicalisation programmes, but I'd hope that that would be considered and that the minister would learn the lessons from that. The time in prison of whatever length in the debate I had earlier with the Honourable Gentleman for uh, New Forest West, whatever the time in prison is, it is vital that we use it in a constructive way to protect the public. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the broader point is such an important one. I have throughout the debate indicated that Whilst, of course, there is support for the principles behind the bill, the principle of parole board involvement, there must, in addition to that, be that focus on resources and on strategy in relation to de-radicalisation. The proposal that I've put forward of an independent reviewer is one way of producing that, but I accept that there are others as well. I will look forward to hearing the remarks of the Minister on this. As I say, I will... Now, may I ask him a question? Um, just 
because I'm engaged in this probing exercise as well, and I'm not going to move this amendment to the vote, I would like to know what the opposition front bench thinks about my amendment about excluding the Human Rights Act 1998 and what reason he would give for saying that it was unnecessary. I'm delighted to get the chance to respond. I mean, I'll, I will respond in a moment. But the first thing I would say is that I remember the criticism of myself and my honourable friend, the member for Hoban and St Pancras in the last parliament when we were seeking disclosure of legal advice, not from the honourable gentleman, I think, but maybe others. But it, it struck me that we now have a situation where members were discussing case law across the floor of the House and ministers are actually now referring to legal advice, which perhaps shows there is a change. Uh, I wouldn't be in support of his amendment. I think the point made by the Minister is correct. I think that even if you put that into the legislation, the right to go to Strasbourg would still exist. The second reason I'm uncomfortable with what he's saying is that, uh, and I'm quite happy to give way to him again if I'm wrong in my interpretation, but he, as I understand it, wants the House to pass a piece of legislation and then somehow prevent courts from being able to adjudicate upon them, which surely isn't what is meant by having a sovereign parliament that is accountable to judges. Thank you very To that very simply, uh, and refer him to the speeches made on the introduction of the Human Rights Act 1998. I was in the House at the time, and it was made absolutely clear that, the, that this act would not in itself impinge upon the sovereignty of Parliament. That was made clear and therefore, as far as I'm concerned, I understand where he's coming from, but I'm afraid that his point is erroneous because actually it is implicit in the passing of the 1998 Act that we are able, if we wish to do so, to take the legislation that we pass in this House as the final word and the courts are obliged to obey that. And with respect to the European Convention on Human Rights, I would simply make the point that I've already made just now, which is that I could have included those words, but as far as I was concerned, that yet again is another part of my probing amendment. It could have been notwithstanding the Charter on Fundamental Rights, as a matter of fact, but that would have been destroyed by the existence at that time of the European Community Act 1972, which was binding on us by Act of Parliament. Well, with the greatest respect to the Honourable Gentleman, it is not an erroneous point. I mean, I taught the Human Rights Act for the best part of 11 or 12 years. I'll resist the temptation to give his contribution a grade. But uh, in terms of the Human Rights Act, yes, it contains the power to make a declaration of incompatibility, thus preserving the concept of parliamentary sovereignty. It doesn't have a strike-down power, as, for example, the US Supreme Court does. That's absolutely right. But there are two, I have two fundamental problems with his amendment, and the first problem is the one I've set out. It seems to be that this House passes a piece of legislation that essentially tells the courts, well, you, you can move aside. This is absolutely what we say without any scrutiny. And I know he nods his head, but I'm not comfortable with that position. The second point is, I firmly believe we can tackle this issue of terrorism and remain signatories to the European Convention on Human Rights. That's essentially what the government's position is here today. And I really don't think we need to get into this debate because the government has clearly stated that the Act is, or the bill as it currently is, is compliant with Article 7. If people wish to go off and challenge that in the courts, that's a matter for them. But it's for the government to be confident in its legal position. And that's why again under the Human Rights Act, each bill before this House contains that sentence on the front page where ministers have given consideration as to whether it's compatible or not. Now, it was open to the government, if it wished to, to put on the front of the bill. It didn't think that it was compatible, but it wanted us to proceed regardless. But it didn't do that. It's clearly put on the front of the bill its belief it's compatible. We've had quite a case law history, I think it's fair to say today, from the Right Honourable Gentleman and indeed others, that's the position of the government, and uh, those reasons taken together are why I'm afraid I couldn't support the uh, Honourable Gentleman's Amendment. I understand he isn't pushing it to a vote, and I guess the debate will continue in the other place. But it's not uh, an amendment, I'm afraid, that would have found favour on these benches. If I can move back, Madam Deputy Speaker, just to uh, new clause one, and just to make the point to the Minister. I'm not pushing the idea of an independent reviewer to the vote today. I'm not frustrating the past of the bill in that way. 
But I do think it would really assist if the Minister could put before the House what members over the next few years are going to be able to do to scrutinise this programme of de-radicalisation and have information before us, whether it's from the Ministry of Justice directly or in another way, that we can assess how this is working. The Honourable Lady, the former Prime Minister for Maidenhead, intervened on the Justice Secretary in his opening speech and said quite clearly that she felt there had been a lack of success in these de-radicalisation programmes. She's right. We need to see some success in the years ahead. And I hope, even though I won't be pushing New Clause 1 to a vote, that the Minister will give some assurances as how that scrutiny can take place. Sir Desmond Swain. Hey, Melina, I don't intend to detain the committee long. Uh, and the Minister should consider uh, my amendment not so much as a, a probing amendment as a prodding amendment. Uh, it is my intent to prod the Minister. The, the purpose of my amendments are uh, stunningly obvious, uh, to uh, remove at line 34 and line 37 the words two-thirds and insert the words nine-tenths. The reality is that many uh, sentences, even for acts of terrorism, for example, possession of a terrorist promotional material with intent, would give rise to a sentence uh, surprisingly short, some four years, in which case the difference between half as currently served um, and two-thirds is a mere six months. Admittedly, Extending that to nine-tenths doesn't actually address the nature of the problem. That's why this is a prodding amendment. The fact is the sentences are too short. Firstly, there is the general problem of honesty in sentencing. When a judge hands down a sentence in court, all those in the know work out on the back of a fag packet what it actually means in terms of imprisonment. And the public, who are generally not in the know, don't understand that actually it's not that at all and would be scandalised if they knew. Well, of course, I Subject. Uh, can he remember quite recently a case of two treasure hunters uh, who I think got as much as 10 years because they hadn't declared treasure trove and compare that with somebody who is intent on murdering people on the streets of London or anywhere else? That is, <laughs> that's, if I may say, the, the random caprice of the judiciary. Um, but nevertheless, returning to the issue of uh, before us today. So the, first of all, there's that general principle of uh, honesty in sentencing. But with respect to the specific point of sentencing for terrorist acts, I think we have to be clear in our mind as to what our intention is that lies behind the whole uh, sentencing policy. And I believe that fundamentally it must be to secure the reformation of the offender before he is released. And the problem here is the strategies that exist for uh, reforming offenders, for de um, deprogramming them from their ideology are somewhat untested and those that are tested such as the program that's run in Saudi Arabia which has shown to be effective take a relatively long time and I would suggest therefore that that lends itself to an indeterminate sentence to detainment under Her Majesty's pleasure until um, a licensing authority, the parole board, has decided that the offender is safe to be released. And that's the purpose of my amendment, merely to contribute to that debate. Daisy Cooper. Sorry, Dame Eleanor. Um, I'm very new to this. Uh, whilst I'm not speaking to move my amendment, uh, I am seeking reassurances from the Minister uh, about the purpose behind New Clause 3 and a commitment about post legislative scrutiny. In my remarks earlier, I did make the point that fast law can be bad law, and in the absence of an opportunity for thorough pre legislative scrutiny, 
we absolutely must have post-legislative scrutiny. Now, there are other examples of where this has happened that are relevant to this. For example, the 2014 Immigration Act. That was quite a controversial act, and so it contained the same requirement as exists in new Clause 3. The Data Retention and Investigatory Powers Act was rushed in in response to a court ruling. That included a sunset clause of 18 months. Now, I am not asking for a sunset clause at all, but this amendment does set out quite clearly that we would like the opportunity for a statutory review after one year, and that the person conducting that review should be appointed after consultation with the Independent Review on Terrorism Legislation, and they should have professional experience relating to the imprisonment uh, for offences of terrorism. This amendment does not seek to outline a scope for such a statutory review, but I would like to give the House some examples of the kind of things that could be covered by it. For example, such a statutory review could ask whether the extra time that terrorists are in prison is in fact being used to de-radicalise them. Are they actually receiving effective de-radicalisation programmes or, on the contrary, are they potentially becoming more dangerous? It could also look at whether the parole board has the resources to cope with the extra demands that have been put on it. It could look at whether terrorist prisoners are actually being, uh, whether they are be, being failed by the parole board and then whether they are released at the end of their sentence without any supervision on licence. It could look at whether um, the probation service has the staff and resources that it needs to ensure it has effective supervision on the shorter period that offenders spend on licence. And it could also perhaps look at whether the change in the release point affects the sentencing decisions made by judges. As I said earlier, there is a risk that because of the lack of opportunity for pre-legislative scrutiny, there is a possibility that this becomes a law of unintended consequences. And I know that there are proposals for legislation down the line, but we know that legislation can get delayed. I think it would be absolutely right for this House to insist on post-legislative scrutiny by virtue of a one-year statutory review. And who knows, that review could even identify things that could be included in future legislation. Sir John Hayes. I'm grateful, um, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, and speak in sympathy with all of the uh, amendments uh, for the reasons I shall give. Uh, in respect of the, my right honourable friend uh, for Stone's amendment, it is important that we anticipate the likely counters to this legislation that will come from malign forces uh, in the other place, perhaps, uh, and outside of it. There are people who will seek to frustrate the government uh, in its attempt to do the right. I will happily go away. Thank you. Um, I note that the uh, point the Honourable Member has said is that there are malign forces. Uh, I would ask him to recognise that there are those of us who do hold uh, public and national security front and centre in our roles here in the House, but we some people who may be looking not to frustrate it, but to improve this legislation through making sure it complies with human rights law. Yes, um, we haven't time and you wouldn't permit us to have a broader debate about the character of rights and human rights law, uh, but I welcome the opportunity to do so with the Honourable Lady at a place and time of her choosing. Um, and I do have profound doubts about that law and the root of it, which is essentially the acceptance of natural rights, which I do not uh, believe in. I believe in lawful entitlements we call rights, of course, uh, how they should be dealt with legally. Uh, is an entirely different matter and not one pertinent to these considerations. But I happily look forward to that, uh, that broader debate. Given that there will be challenges uh, to the uh, government, uh, malign and otherwise, uh, given what the Honourable Lady said, it, doesn't seem to me, it does seem to me there's, that there's a good case for a belt and braces approach, as my rapporteur well, friend described well, it. However, but I will give way before I come to the yeah, house. I only, I only want to just in the context of what is developing into a very interesting speech to refer to um, Edmund Burke's famous attack on Thomas Paine in respect of uh, human rights and what he really thought, uh, which I thought was a brilliantly expressed um, uh, metaphor, uh, that we would not be trust um, uh, like chickens or something of that kind. Um, uh, by, by the human rights proposals of Thomas Paine. Well, I, well, I, well now, 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 you're, now you're really testing. Uh, uh, I'm really testing your patience, uh, 
uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, because the Honourable Gentleman is uh, inviting me to, uh, to uh, articulate a Burkean case against natural rights, which I'd be happy to do perhaps on another occasion, and given that I've offered this lady the opportunity to have a debate about that, that might be that very occasion. Perhaps the right honourable gentleman might agree to be my seconder in a debate of that kind. Uh, what, a, uh, what a humbling experience that would be for me, an, ele an elevating one for him, I hope. So um, we'll do that on another occasion, and we can indeed explore why so many people take for granted the existence of natural rights, as though they spring from the ether. As a Christian, of course, I couldn't possibly take that view, but now is not the time to, to go into that discussion. Now, um, uh, on the specifics of the amendments, the Honourable Gentleman makes a belt and braces case, as I've said, for a notwithstanding clause. The Shadow Minister uh, made the point that that was uh, a, a f fundamentally disagreeable in the sense that he made a constitutional argument against the notwithstanding clause per se. But he also went on to say that he believed the government were right in their, or were likely to be right, in their assertion that they were clear that in any case this legislation didn't contradict any existing rights legislation. Uh, and uh, we heard that both uh, uh, today from the, uh, the Secretary of State uh, and we've heard it again subsequently in the debate that the government don't feel that this uh, uh, proposed legislation uh, is likely to be successfully challenged in the way the Honourable Gentleman suggested it might. Now, if that's right, and I, we have to take the government, uh, we, have to, we have to assume the government has taken legal advice to make that claim, I have to give away. Yeah. I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for giving away. I should make clear one thing. I obviously haven't seen the legal advice that the government's uh, relying upon, which I'm sure they have sought quite appropriately. I merely was pointing out that that's the view that the government takes, and as a House, the, that's what the uh, Secretary of State for Justice has put on the face of the bill. And on that basis, Article 7 wasn't engaged. I just wanted to make that point clear to the Honourable Gentleman. Yes, and, and I, I wouldn't have wanted to suggest anything other than that. But the Honourable Gentleman was very... Uh, clear that he uh, heard what the government said about having taken that advice and their confidence that, that a legal challenge wouldn't succeed on that basis. Now, um, the Honourable Gentleman um, may be more sceptical uh, than, uh, than others about that, but I think it is important to point out that the government have made clear that further legislation on counter-terrorism will be forthcoming, and that legislation might of itself on a primary basis, revisit the issue of how counter-terrorism measures interface with and may be contradicted by existing uh, legislation. Now, that will be a very fundamental uh, debate because, of course, it will oblige the consideration of exactly the kind of points that my right from the made. And I, on that basis, am happy to go with the Minister. Uh, notwithstanding my temptation, uh, to follow the example of my esteemed right honourable and learned friend, I'm happy to, like the Shadow Minister, to err on the side of the government and to say that the government's taken this legal advice with this further opportunity to revisit these matters in that primary legislation that we hear is going to be speeding its way to the House. Uh, I'm prepared uh, to concede uh, 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 the argument about rights. Well, you, you'll try to, my honourable my my friend is going to try to persuade me not. My right honourable friend will accept that this is, prim this is primary legislation. Well, and furthermore, that I have already said that I'm looking forward to a proper discussion about this in the future with a view to getting this right, because the object of this bill is to prevent people being killed on the streets of this country. Well, it's because of the murderous intent of people who I described earlier as wicked. Uh, by the way, and I use that word advisedly, not all of these people are mentally disturbed. Some may be, and we know that from in evidence some are. Uh, but not all are. It, uh, crime is not an illness to be treated. Crime is a malevolent choice. It's an act of wickedness. And wickedness is entirely different from mental illness. And it's, I know it's difficult for some uh, to grasp that, but it's important to emphasise it 
in the way that we deal with. I'll happily give way to the Honourable Lady. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way, and he's making a very good point. And of course, if an individual were mentally disordered, then the correct pathway for uh, their rehabilitation and also their punishment would be through a secure, um, a secure hospital rather than prison. So yes. that would actually <coughs> deal with that matter. Yes. We're well established. Uh, ways of differentiating between uh, uh, people in those terms, uh, different ways of dealing with them through law, different ways of dealing with them one, once convicted, and different ways of dealing with them in the community. And uh, the psychologists uh, and psychiatrists associated with both the probation service and the prison service are well accustomed to that differentiation. But in the public debate about these things, we need to be bold and brave enough to say there are some very wicked people who want to do wicked things, and it is our job not only to deal with those things by anticipating, deterring them and punishing them, but also to reinforce public faith in the rule of law by saying so. And that's, this, this is an opportunity to do that, and this bill gives that life. The second uh, amendment is the one proposed by the Shadow Minister, and again, I have a great deal of sympathy with it. Um, I think all legislation uh, relating to these kind of matters benefits from both pre legislative and post legislative scrutiny, both because we need to get this kind of legislation right for the obvious reasons we have all been debating its salience, its significance, uh, its uh, impor importance, but also because in order to build the consensus that's necessary to uh, cross the House uh, to proceed in, the, in a way that maintains public faith, pre-legislative and post-legislative scrutiny uh, is important. The emergency uh, that we face, and I, this is recognised by all the contributors to this debate, is such that that has not been possible on this occasion. And the reason I would resist the Honourable Gentleman's Amendment is not because I don't believe in the principle uh, or indeed the sentiments that lay behind it, because I think there is a very good case for the select committees of this House, notably the Home Affairs Select Committee and the Intelligence Security Committee, to look at this matter once the bill has become an act. I'd be surprised if they didn't, uh, and, I, and I know the Minister in his wind-up will, I won't quite say invite that kind of scrutiny, but certainly note, I'm not sure the minister is, it's quite appropriate for a minister to actually ask the select committee to investigate or scrutinise the government, but I expect he would want to say that he would be surprised if they didn't. Uh, and that kind of reassurance, uh, I think, would give uh, a great deal of comfort to the House uh, in measuring the effect of this important legislation. I happily give way to Honourable Lee. And it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting and mature debate that we are having here, and it is about getting it right. Um, and of course, um, it is paramount that we are um, um, making sure that the public is safe. But what I don't understand is if one just sort of um, has a review in order to make sure we get it right, um, you know, even if other legislation is coming further down the line, to just have a sort of double security on that one, I don't quite understand what um, speaks against that at all. Well, because we have well established mechanisms for doing, in the way that I've just described, for doing exactly that. Sometimes government builds into legislation a review mechanism, but much more often uh, the committees of this House that are designed for the purpose consider the effectiveness of what government does and how legislation is working. And uh, our uh, select committee structure, now long established, uh, even longer than my right honourable friend's time in this house, I might say, um, uh, is well served at fulfilling that function, and particularly in respect of legislation relating to terrorism, the Intelligence and Security Committee has time and time again played its, an important role in uh, uh, considering these matters, uh, reflecting, uh, reporting, uh, and influencing government policy as I know from my time at the Home Office. So uh, I think there's well-established practice. Why why, if it ain't broke, why fix it? So the, the, 
the suggestion uh, is not only that there is a review, but also about who, that, who it is that conducts that review. And of course, you've talked about various committees and various select committees, and as we know, they have a very broad workload. Would he agree with me that it is important to make sure that we have an independent review, somebody, um, somebody who is independent of this House, who has experience in relation to the sentencing of, uh, of terrorists, who could actually conduct that independent review on our behalf? have an independent review of terrorism. I was privileged to work with Lord Carlyle uh, in, in uh, a former Liberal Democrat member of this uh, House, by the way, and now a member of the other place uh, in that regard. So we do that, that role exists. But I, I wouldn't want to underestimate the significance or value of the committees of this House to do their job. Uh, the ISC in particular is a well-respected committee of this House, which uh, uh, has a very strong track record looking at these things empirically uh, and advising accordingly. So my argument is not that we shouldn't uh, have that kind of scrutiny, not that ideally we wouldn't have done so as a precursor to this legislation, but that we should indeed consider it through the mechanisms I've described, and I invite the Minister to embrace the spirit in which I've made my argument. The third and final amendment we have heard ably articulated during our considerations this afternoon is the one in the name of my right honourable friend. And the, again, I am extremely sympathetic to the uh, purpose of the amendment. Indeed, I might even go further and uh, say nine tenths is too, too, too modest. Um, but, but I do think that given that the government have been crystal clear that in forthcoming legislation they will look at the following three things, that whilst this amendment is welcome and it uh, adds pressure, uh, if I might put it that way, uh, he said prodding rather than probing, I've, I've added a third of P, pressure, because alliteration I know is something dear to his heart. Um, uh, given that the government have said that they are going to bring further legislation which looks at these three things, minimum sentences, maximum sentences and mandatory sentences. Much of what my honourable friend, friend desires should form part of further government policy and practice. I hope that we can increase minimum sentences, that we can increase maximum sentences and that we can uh, tie to that, as the government have said it will, and I note this from the comments made in the statement following the recent terrorist outrage by the, uh, the right Secretary of State. Uh, well, I will just finish the, my sentence and then happily give way to my right honourable distinguished friend. Uh, uh, the government have said clearly they will tie to that no early release. So the government said, and the, uh, the, uh, the Secretary of State was clear about this in that statement a few uh, days ago, that uh, tied to those three provisions will be the end of early release for certain kinds of prisoners. Uh, so I happily give way to my right honourable friend, but I move to my exciting peroration. I'm grateful to him for giving way, but doesn't he think that whatever scheme is ultimately settled upon, there needs to remain some incentive for someone who's in prison to behave him or herself? Well, I know my friend was preoccupied earlier when I spoke and in urgent meetings, but if he reads uh, the Hansard of my early contribution, he will hear that I am on exactly the same page as him, uh, not for the first time. Because he's absolutely right that parole is considered. But parole has always been considered historically on the, on the basis of both an assessment of risk and worthiness. You know, good behaviour is the term that was once routinely used in respect of parole. So when people have proved through how they are in prison, they no longer pose a risk uh, to the <coughs> public and they deserve uh, to be released early, then they should be. The problem with the current arrangement is the automatic nature of early release. And I resist that per se, not just in respect of terrorist prisoners, by the way, but more widely. Uh, I think the public, as I described, would be outraged if they knew just how many people have been released early, including how many terrorists have been released early. Enough is enough. Now is the time to put an end to that. This is the beginning of it, and I happily support this legislation. 
Nick Thomas Simmons. I, I think it's for the. I've, I've already. I'm grateful, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I've already spoken in favour of my amendment. I think the position I am in is that I have said that I would not wish to press it to a division, but I would like to hear the Minister's response to my suggestion about external scrutiny of our, the de radicalisation programme in our prisons. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, I'd just like to uh, briefly respond to some of the points made in the committee stage just now, as well as of course, moving that clauses 1 to 10 stand part and that schedules 1 and 2 stand part of this bill. Um, perhaps I could start with my right honourable and uh, learned friend, the member for Stone, and the uh, speech he gave concerning his notwithstanding proposed amendment. Um, I would just repeat um, the point I made earlier and that the Shadow Minister made as well, um, that the Government has received categoric advice um, that these proposals are Article 7 compliant. And although, of course, um, there may well be challenges, and of course I can't guarantee what the outcome of litigation might be, we are confident this is compliant. Um, now, I understand that the Honourable Member for Stone um, said, well, you know, nothing less than certainty um, will do in a case of uh, public safety, and I entirely understand that sentiment. Um, but I, I do wonder, and this perhaps is best debated another time, whether his amendment as written will actually have the effect which he intends, because simply by writing a notwithstanding clause into a piece of um, primary legislation, um, I don't think uh, abrogates our obligations under uh, a treaty that we've entered into or would necessarily preclude um, an applicant or a litigant going directly to the European Court of Human Rights, even if we could somehow, they might go straight to Strasbourg, even if we could somehow prevent use of the uh, English and Welsh courts. So um, I don't think the amendment as drafted uh, would actually have the legal effect intended. Um, however, um, the Right Honourable and Learned Gentleman, Member for Stone, uh, has, as always, um, raised some very interesting uh, constitutional questions. I'm sure they will be debated in the other place in due course. And, of course, uh, in the manifesto, we did say we would um, have a think about the operation of the Human Rights Act and some of the issues which the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman referred to during his speech. So I think there will be plenty of opportunities in due course um, to consider uh, at greater length the issues that he raised. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for his undertaking earlier not to move um, this amendment to a vote today, but I think the whole House has certainly heard what he had to say um, and will carefully reflect um, on it. The member for New Forest West uh, gave me, in his words, a prod. And uh, let me confirm, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, that I am duly prodded on the question of uh, longer sentences for serious terrorist offenders and serving more of those sentences in prison. As a number of uh, members have said in this debate, it is our intention to bring forward a counter-terrorism uh, sentencing and release bill in the relatively near future, and it is the Government's intention to define a cohort of the most serious terrorist offenders, and for those serious offenders seek a minimum sentence of 14 years and ensure that all of the sentence handed down by the judge is served in prison, which I think will respond um, to the point that the Honourable Gentleman was making. Of course, I happily give way. I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving way and for those indications about sentencing. Does he agree with me that that review needs to consider all terrorist offences, including those which, although relatively minor, like Section 57 and Section 58 of the Terrorism Act 2000, namely being in possession of materials, might in and of themselves not attract a particularly long sentence. But given that they're responsible for almost half of all terrorist sentences handed down, they need to be considered as part of the review. Does he agree? Well, we are going to consider um, all terrorist offenders as part of this review. Uh, of course, the sentencing provisions I just described um, wouldn't be appropriate for all terror offenders, just the most serious terror offenders. Um, but yes, I can, I, I can uh, give the Honourable and Learned Gentleman uh, an assurance that we will be considering uh, the totality of terror offending. Of course, the um, Streatham offender, um, I think, had committed one of the offences um, that my Honourable Friend um, just described, 
possession of terrorist material. So we do need to be mindful that even where someone commits an offence which on the face of it is at the less serious end of the offending spectrum, nonetheless they can go on um, to do quite serious things subsequently and the government is extremely mindful of that. Two points to be made in respect of what the other one just said. The vast majority of people convicted under terrorist legislation are, are sentenced to, a, to, a, to between one and 20 years. Now, he's talking about the most serious. What does he mean by the most serious? The second thing is a very large number of people are convicted for terrorist-related offences under non-terrorist legislation, hundreds, actually, over uh, the years. Uh, what does he think about them, and will they be included in these considerations? Well, I, I thank the um, right honourable gentleman for his, um, for his question. Um, in relation to the second part, I mean, the terrorist related offenders, um, in fact, actually are um, part of this bill. If we look at, I was going to refer in due course to Schedule 1, um, but in fact, Part 2 of Schedule 1 does, in, in the legislation we're considering today, um, does um, does, of course, cover um, terrorist-related offences under the Counter-Terrorism Act 2008, and Part 2 then lists the various direct offences, which starts with uh, manslaughter, culpable homicide, kidnapping and so forth, which are terrorist-related. So those related offences um, are in the scope of this Bill, and we will carefully um, consider the uh, implications for the Counter-Terrorism Bill uh, that we're going to bring forward in due course. In terms of the um, sort of level of um, the severity um, of offending, as I said to my honourable friend a moment ago, the member for Cheltenham, um, you know, we are going to review all types of offending, and so the whole spectrum will be in scope. But in terms of how we define that most serious cohort, um, the government is currently thinking quite carefully about that definition. I don't want to give him a definition um, today. That will be a matter for the counter-terrorism bill. Um, but we are thinking about that question extremely carefully and obviously we'll be able to debate it fully um, in due course. Um, the uh, shadow minister, the member for Torvine, um, raised questions about a, a review, reviewing the effectiveness of the uh, de-radicalisation agenda. I agree that it's critically important. A number of members raised it during the second reading um, debate. We are setting up a new counter-terrorism programmes and intervention centre um, within the Prisons and Probation Service that will look specifically about this, uh, this de-radicalisation problem, um, which is so important. Um, we do intend to publish um, further research and reports on that in the usual way that will be made available, of course, to members of this House, and I would expect um, full scrutiny of that to take place. And as the uh, Right Honourable Member for South Holland and the Deepings um, said in his speech, uh, we will fully embrace scrutiny of that description, and I would be very surprised – I can't see him in his place – but I'd be very surprised indeed if the Justice Select Committee um, did not look at this area in due course. So I do uh, accept his point that proper and deep uh, scrutiny of this area is needed because this de-radicalisation question um, is so important. So I think he, his, point was, his point was well made. Um, yes. Forgiving way, and he's making some very good points. And, um, in terms of the, those in prison who are um, radicalising others, I wonder if there's any scope to look at additional types of charges that could be laid against those who are actually actively radicalising others whilst they're in prison. I thank the Honourable Lady for her, her important intervention. Radicalisation of a one prisoner by another um, is, of course, a deeply invidious phenomenon, and she's quite right to highlight it. Uh, clearly, um, the normal offences that, that would apply to any member of the public, um, including things like incitement to racial hatred, would apply to prisoners in prison just as much as they apply to anyone else. And I would certainly um, encourage the authorities um, to use uh, those laws where applicable, um, even uh, you know, regardless of whether or not the person doing the inciting, which is a criminal offence in itself, um, is in prison. Just coming on to the points made by the Honourable Member for St Albans, um, rather in the same vein as the Honourable Member for Torvine, um, talking about the need to scrutinise um, the effect of this legislation um, after it has passed. And once again, I, I accept the thrust of what she's saying. Of course, it's important that we keep under review the effect of legislation, in particular when it's passed in a necessarily expeditious fashion 
as this legislation is passing today. Uh, once again, I would expect the Justice Select Committee um, to take an interest in this. Uh, the House will have a chance to take a great interest in this when we come to debate the counter-terrorism bill in a few months' time. I will have a lot more uh, time available to us to debate these matters and indeed to review the operation of this bill, which by then will have been in effect, um, I expect, for a few months. But in terms of an independent review that goes beyond Parliament's committees and indeed this whole House, there is, as the Right Honourable uh, Member for South Holland and the Deepings um, said in his, um, I think, reply to your intervention, we have already Jonathan Hall QC, the independent reviewer of terrorism legislation, who I expect will be conducting independent reviews of exactly the kind the Honourable Member for St Albans has described. Um, that I think, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, covers many of the points that were made uh, in relation to the various um, amendments and new clauses um, that we've debated in committee. Um, in terms of the substance of the bill, just very briefly, um, it's worth just highlighting that um, clause one of the bill um, really uh, specifies the release provisions that we've been talking about, um, the two-thirds release point in relation to prisoners for England and Wales, at which point the parole board's discretion is applied. It also references um, the uh, schedule, uh, schedule one, which um, specifies the kind of offences which are in scope. In part one, it defines the terrorist offences which are in scope, and in part two, it defines the offences which may be determined to have a terrorist connection. Um, clause 2 um, disapplies some historic transitional provisions um, dating back to the Criminal Justice Act of 2003. Those are essentially um, technical amendments to make sure this legislation works in a way that is consistent with the 2003 Act. Um, clauses 3 and 4 um, apply these provisions um, to Scotland. Uh, we are keen to make sure that uh, the public in Scotland are, are protected as much as the public in England and Wales. And in that context, um, I was grateful to the Honourable Member for East Lothian uh, for the supportive remarks um, he made earlier. And I hope I can infer from his remarks um, that our colleagues uh, in, in the Scottish Government in Holyrood um, are supportive of the proposals. He, um, he, the Honourable Gentleman from East Lothian is nodding, um, so I'm, I'm grateful for his confirmation that the Scottish Government um, support these provisions. Clause 5 relates to the setting of licence conditions. Uh, clause 6 makes further consequential amendments relating to transitional cases. Uh, clause 7 makes further consequential amendments which apply to England and Wales. Clause 8 makes transitional provisions in relation to offenders in Scotland. And Clause 9 makes further consequential amendments applying in Scotland again. And Clause 10 finally um, specifies the uh, territorial um, extent and the commencement. It's worth saying that the commencement um, will be uh, upon royal assent, and we're therefore um, hoping that this bill uh, takes effect from the 27th of this month, uh, which is important from the perspective of um, the release of certain dangerous offenders. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I hope that covers uh, the clauses in this bill, and I beg to move they stand part. Yeah. Um, Sir William. Am I right in believing that you wish to withdraw uh, Amendment 3 to Clause 1? As I have already made clear, I am happy to withdraw the amendment with the restrictions and the conditions that I have already imposed regarding the House of Lords. Thank you very much. Is it your pleasure that Amendment 3 to Clause 1 be withdrawn? Aye. Aye. Amendment by leave withdrawn. With the leave of the House, I will put the question on Clauses 1 to 10 and Schedules 1 and 2 together. The question is, the clause 1 to 10 and schedules 1 and 2 stand part of the bill. As many as, as are of that opinion say aye. 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 The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Order. Order.
Order whip to report. I beg to report that the committee has gone through the bill <coughs> and directed me to report the same without amendment. Yeah. 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 So under order of the House of today, we now move directly to the third reading. Minister to move third reading. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. May I thank uh, all members for taking part in this important debate on a bill that I think we have demonstrated comprehensively on all sides of the House was uh, timely and necessary. We have a proud history, Mr Deputy Speaker, of coming together in times of adversity against people who seek to divide us. And it is together that we can make sure that the terrorists who seek to threaten our way of life will never win. Now, I readily acknowledge that we are passing this bill to a very tight timescale, but the appalling attacks we witnessed both at Streatham and at Fishmongers Hall made it plain that the time for action was now. And that is why I welcome the sense of urgency that has been shared on all sides of this House. Now, that has necessarily shortened the length of time available to debate these issues, but I will, of course, continue to engage with members across the House on these matters. And there will indeed be further opportunities to legislate on these issues, both in our forthcoming Counter-Terrorism Sentencing and Release Bill and, more broadly, in the sentencing bill that we will introduce following our sentencing white paper later on this year. We will also review the current maximum penalties and sentencing framework for terrorist offences to ensure that they are sufficient and comprehensive. Our underlying principle is this, that terrorist offenders should no longer be released before the end of their custodial sentence unless the parole board is satisfied that they are no longer a risk to the public. And may I take this opportunity, Mr Deputy Speaker, to thank all the officials, not only those who have assisted us in the box today, but all the team at the Ministry of Justice who have worked at pace and in great detail on uh, complex issues, issues of national importance uh, to a timescale that is perhaps unusual and almost unprecedented. And we do owe them a deep debt of gratitude. And I am honoured to place that formally on the record. For now, passing this bill will take a significant step to ensuring that the British public who we serve are being given the protection that they need by ensuring that terrorist offenders spend longer in prison in all cases and are not automatically released without being fully and properly assessed. I beg to move. The yeah, 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 question yeah, yeah. is that the bill be now read the third time. Nick thomas Simmons. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I do agree with the Secretary of State that it's been a constructive debate in the Chamber on this bill. And as I indicated at the outset, the Opposition supports the idea of parole board involvement and indeed risk assessment for terrorist prisoners across the board. Going forward, clearly there will be an issue of investment in de-radicalisation and indeed proper mechanisms to be able to assess how effective they are. And on those issues, we will be holding the government to account in the months and years ahead. There is also a wider issue with regard to sentencing. As I indicated in my remarks earlier on the bill, this, of course, became an emergency due to the incidents that we've seen in recent months. But there does need to be greater long-term plan, which I hope the Secretary of State will be able to provide to the Department in the years ahead. I would also echo what the Secretary of State said about the officials who obviously had to produce this bill very quickly. I would like to uh, thank him for his work with me on this over the past week and indeed thank the Minister as well and all those honourable and right honourable members who have contributed to the debate today. I should also put on record in hand some of my thanks to Robert Keenan in my own office, who has very quickly had to turn around work on this bill on a very short-term basis from when it was first published. On that basis, I would hope that the third reading will pass without a division. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kenny McCaskill. 
simply echo both the opposition spokesman and the uh, Lord Chancellor. I think we put on record uh, the requirement for unity on this issue, and indeed pay thanks. I'd like to thank the Lord Chancellor and his uh, staff for the manner in which they brought this legislation. Legislation is never easy. Uh, it was particularly difficult with regard to the retrospectivity, but as much information as I think could be provided was provided. And equally, as I think as others have correctly mentioned, put on uh, record our tribute not just to those who have drafted the legislation uh, in the government offices, but indeed those involved here at Parliament, uh, because they must have been working long into the night making sure that information was provided for members. So, with those tributes appropriately, uh, I simply concur with the thanks to all involved. <coughs> The question is that the bill be now read the third time. As many as sort of that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Business of the House motion whip to move formally? To move. The question is as on the order paper. As many as sort of that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Well, Mr Steve Double. Thank you very much, Mr De Well, no one in Scotland can commission an idea. You know, if I went to BBC Scotland and I said, oh, I've got this great idea for a sitcom, I've got this brilliant idea for a drama, you know, no, no, there isn't one person in Scotland that can OK it unless it goes through London. Good morning, and welcome to another edition of Full Scottish. Um, what's happening today? Hello, and welcome to the Full Scottish here on Broadcasting Scotland. Scotland is going to be an independent country. That need, that desire for independence is ever stronger than perhaps it was in 2014. So there's an obligation that we've got to give leadership to that campaign. That's what Nicola Sturgeon as our First Minister has been doing. My feeling about Boris Johnson is he can't be trusted uh, on, on anything. It is now and forever will be known as the Great Cause. I'm old enough to remember going into Europe in 73 and I remember how much of a, a razor's edge that was a balance for. And I think we made it by 53%, if I remember correctly, for going in. And ever since that time, England particularly has been pretty much schizophrenic down the middle about whether it felt British or whether it felt European. And that schism, that crack has remained throughout English society ever since. Scotland means business. Scotland's voice won't be stilled, it won't be silenced, it has to be heard. About the work that's been done by Broadcasting Scotland in giving community activists, yes activists, Scottish activists a platform other than the traditional media outlets. 